and Quiet Hill by John Kirk Morris. We're in for a cold snap, sir. Oh, I didn't notice. Not usually so nippy this side of Christmas. No, I suppose not. Just knock when you're through, sir. I'll be outside. Thank you. Good morning. You want to get mobile? I couldn't find a cab. The rush hour. You know how it is. The police are bringing Dyson from Ireland tomorrow. Yes, I know. But what are you doing about it? Well, it's out of our hands now. Yeah? He's in Crown custody, Cabinet. With a small escort, no handcuffs, no guns. Somebody's crying out to have him abducted. Concentrate on your defence, man. These methods won't bring you anything. There's a name and address on this paper. A bloke called Stroud. You ought to tell him to go north. No. I'm not asking it as a favour. You know what you mean. No, I can't do it. Ask him to prepare the best motor he's got. Now, listen to me, for heaven's sake. You ain't earned your wages, Biaz. Look me in the face. <laughs> Go on, do it, can you? This is the last time, I swear. Yeah, until I whistle it is. Now, before you visit this Stroud, you'd have called in at Fulham. Where do I find the time? Take it out of your annual holiday. Now, shove off before I put my boot up you. All right, all right. You better buck up your ideas or prepare yourself to move into one of these cells. Water! What happens to Dyson? What would you like to happen to him? Be your age. Come on, wouldn't you? Go on. You're losing time. <laughs> Mr. Stride. You old pickle. Uh, I have to speak to you. Take the chair. I'd rather stand, thanks. My card. So you're a solicitor. What did you want with me? Insurance matter? No, this concerns a client of mine. He wishes to hire a car and a driver, yourself, to meet a friend from a boat at Liverpool tomorrow morning. I'm not in a hire business, Mr. Mears. My client assures me you would be. For him, his name is Kavner. This isn't a request for a personal favour. I was instructed to make that clear. Your client has a long memory. I can guess who the friend is, too. Tommy Dyson. <laughs> He'll never get away with it. Yeah. I can pretend ignorance, but at the same time, I don't want to discuss anything outside the bare message I have given you. Tommy's one of the chaps. Kavanagh must know that. Please, Estrada. You're a bit nervous to be in this line of work, Mr. Mears. You have a bad colour, somewhere between green and yellow. Don't make difficulties, Stroud. Just give your assent and I'll go. Don't hurry me. Where do I take Tommy? You'll get instructions by telephone this afternoon. Oh, that's ridiculous. But you'll do it. Yeah, of course I will. Your governor knew that before he asked. Well, that doesn't concern you. You're hardly in a position to feel superior. I dare say you were sucked in like the rest of us from greed or vanity. Find your own way out, will you? I can initiate the next step. It's not a military operation, Mears. We called it coppers and robbers when we were kids. Give my regards to the Law Society. Yeah. Goodbye, then. I know this place, officer. It's where the coppers walk hand in hand, five at a time. Give your jaw a rest, Dyson. Think about the nice breakfast we've laid down for you. Seen Dyson yet? Yeah, he's over there. He's a tick without a hat. Right. We're on a racy sir. Strad. Hello. We'll be there, won't you? I'll see you, Frankie. Where are all the photographers? You don't get your picture taken, Tommy Dyson. You've been naughty. To the right. Don't worry about customs. Those gates over there. Here. You won't forget to write, I hope. Yeah, twice a year. Christmas and your birthday. Morning. You want to go through, do you? That's a home office ID card. You recognise it? No, but I recognise you. 
Your motor's at the end of the room on the left. Thanks, Dad. Pick those feet up, Dyson. There's that car playing. Now, Dyson, get back. Hold it. Tommy, this way. You, you on the gate. Let us back. What's wrong well with you, Dyson? Please, 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 that man. I'll give you... What the hell was that for? Don't stand here, Dyson. Get into the car. Number two gate, there's been a shooting. Get us an ambulance, quick as you like. What do you do that for? You could have just waved it in his face. I to go back. Well, shut up. <laughs> Hold on to your guts, Dyson. Take this shooter for company. Hey? Go on, take it. <laughs> on your way. Oh, oh my God. What now? <laughs> Hey, you, want a lift? Eddie, Eddie, stop! Come in! Oh, this is more like it! Well, what's new, sir? Dyson's been sprung at the dock gate, straight off the boat. Look at this teleprint. Well, Bob Reeves got it, then. You knew him? Well, we were ahead together, sir. He had a wife and child. Yes, a little girl, sir. Joe, I have to go up there. Need a sergeant? Not this trip. Keep by that phone in case I want something. Well, the North West people will see me get to drag us in. It's muck on their doorstep. Now, at a glance, the abduction must have been arranged and starved at this end. Who do we know uses a shotgun? Well, just about everybody now. Quite. Oh, uh, hello, pet. It's Daddy. Will you ask Mummy to come to the phone? Thank you. Lay on a car in about ten minutes, will you? Right. Oh, and ride with me to Heathrow. It's done. Want to borrow a toothbrush? Got my own, thanks. Beryl? Yes, it's me. I have some bad news for you, love. Have a nice trip. Not bad. Bit bumpy. What happened back there? They did the escort in it. They had shooters. Did you know that? Oh, that's current form, Tommy. Maniacs. They could have duffed him, but they shot him full in the kisser. Nice people. Sounds airy. That's right, Carruthers. Show no emotion. Here, where are we going? Where would you like? Oh, straight up, Ed. Don't muck me about. That is straight up. I've got a map in the dash that says we go towards Lincoln. Let's get there. Tired of living, are you? Wrong house, wrong street, Ed. Don't kid yourself. You're expendable. Then why didn't I get mine at the docks? Too public. Bad press for our leader. You're wrong, Ed. I got insurance. We can't buy you much now. The panic's really on. Where did you have in mind? The North East. Well, why there? Well, it's not the smoke, and it isn't Lincoln and a derelict airfield in the middle of winter. Oh, <laughs> they'll love you for this. <laughs> well, then I've got nothing to worry about. So it's Geordie Land? You're the driver. Is there something to drink in here? Flask of tea in the back seat. Oh, charming. <laughs> <laughs> All the ancillary services have been roped in to provide surveillance at ports and airfields. Our primary job is to maintain roadblocks <laughs> on first and second class roads. <clears throat> London are sending us an officer to liaison on this case. It would be pleasant if we could show him something solid by the time he arrives. If you have any questions, please ask them of the public. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. What's up? Roadworks, I hope. It ain't, you know. That's a roadblock. Here, what do we do? Let me think. Got it. That garage over there. Hop across and borrow two buckets of water. Hey? One for each hand. Tuck your trouser bottoms in your socks, scruff yourself up, then you walk with a bucket straight past the police. Hey, I couldn't do it. You've got a better idea. Use some of that Burmesy sparkle. Uh, I left that in Dublin. Hey, leave the gun, Tommy. What gun? I'd say you were compromised enough already. I'll dump it first chance I get. Uh, okay. On your bike. Why do you want the two? Oh, it's a big tank, mate. Fifteen gallon. Well, those caravans are more trouble than they were. Where'd you say you were going? Lake District. And this weather? You want your head red. Well, it's different, isn't it? No, I happen to like the old morning mist. You'll find plenty of that. There we are. Thanks. Here, buy yourself a banana. Right. Dear, oh dear. They're heavy, ain't they? Oh, do you want to... No, that's all right, I can match. You mind you bring them back? Certainly. Where did you say you were going, sir? I didn't, but it's Huddersfield. Oh, I see, sir. And you started from London yesterday. Well, Croydon, I mean, that's not exactly... I know where it is, sir. But you left Manchester at eight this morning. Yeah, I stayed overnight. All right.
right to go through, would you, sir? Thanks. They're making their way separately to London. And Dyson. With Stroud, they probably made for the motorway. Not Eddie. He's too fly. You'll get there, though. Yeah. But you can expect every policeman in England to be on your neck. But I'm in here, Mears. What good would it do them? Captain, I want to go away. No. Only for a few days. I can't stand any more of this constant tension. You'll have to put up with it. Take a tonic. I want to be free. Oh? Someday soon, the police will start digging into my association with you. I couldn't survive an investigation, Captain. So, you want to end in your cards. Surely you sat with your son on for the duration. You palm mirrors. I can smell you from here. Can you think of anywhere in the world where you're 100% safe? But even with... Dyson out of the way. The law has enough to put you away until you're the an old man. man. The fur collar can't weigh a case without witnesses. You'll kill all of them? I don't need to. Hurt one pig and the others squeal. Psychology, Watson. <laughs> yes, well, you first catch your pig. What's that again? Your man isn't home yet, Kavanagh, and there are a million pair of eyes looking for him. You should think hard about that. <laughs> Yeah, would I tell you? Oh, you were marvellous. Hey, chin up. The borough's proud of you. Yeah. Give us a smile, then. What for? I had half a mind to turn myself in at that roadblock. Defeatism. I wouldn't be running. You could pretend, Tommy. Oh, I'm too old. You didn't see that muck up at the dock gates, Ed. There was blood everywhere. The officer never made a sound. You think they'd give me a deal, Ed? Oh, Mr. Plod? Well, that depends on what you had in mind. Whole thing. Books, ledgers, records of transfers. Every penny won and spent in the last eight years. I got the lot, Ed. Film? No, the real thing. Kavanagh, I've only got the copies. Oh, that's playing it near. Everybody needs insurance. Kavanagh might give you a deal. No. He'd have to come after me. I expect that. Can you imagine me putting the frighteners on that one? You're loose now, Tommy. Just think of that. And everything I own locked away in an Irish bank. Well, I got a bit put by. Not just money, Ed. I've got a girl over that. And about time. She's a bit simple, but she's a good kid. Only 19, too. <laughs> Dirty old Tom. I'd marry her tomorrow if I was five years younger. I'd all my teeth. You're not married, are you? Nah. Pair of bachelors from the borough. Got a girl? I'll get my share. What? An ugly geezer like you? Ugly men are very popular now. Oh, then you'll do well. The fella who got shot this morning had a kid, Ed. Change the subject, please. Show me a picture. Skinny little thing with big round eyes and hair in plaits, smiling up at her dad. What kind of people are we, Eddie? Colin! Yes, who is it? Seth Bike, Mrs. Beth. Oh, Seth. I, I, I was wondering if you need me now. Oh. Come in, won't you? Oh, thank you. Sit quiet, Jess. Bring her in, I don't mind. No, she, she'd best bide outside. Sit. Ah, look at the girl. <laughs> Me uh, boots are a mite tacky. Yeah, no matter. Oh, that's better. I must be getting deaf. Would you like a drink, Mr. Pike? Oh, no, thank you. <laughs> Too early in the day for me. How strong-willed of you. I don't indulge until the sun has risen above the horizon. Are you well, Mrs. Gatehouse? That's not a fair question. I must have time to prepare an answer. Do you understand anything about generators? Oh, I don't. Not the first thing. Have you no light? I have oil lamps and things. One sort of gets used to power at the pushing of a switch. Could it do with some kindling? There's some in the shed, I think. Would you like me to have a look? No. No, thank you. It's very nice of you to bother, Mr. Pike, but there's really no need for your concern. There's snow on the way. Here? The sky's busting with it. I can smell it anyway. That's a useful gift. Like water divining in dry countries. <laughs> and are you well, Mr. Pike? Oh, I want for nothing, thank you. Yo, before I forget, I, I have some cream put by. Can I bring you a crockful? 
Mrs. Gatehouse, what, what is it? Do you have to be quite so bloody kind? I hate to appear ill-bred, but I prefer to be by myself right now. I understand. Sorry, but I don't believe you do. If you'd like to, I could take you down to the hotel in Easton. Why? I told you I'm perfectly all right here. I I'm sure you are, Mrs. Gatehouse, but could you stand one of our Derbyshire blizzards by yourself? I'm not alone. I've that wireless and a library of paperback fiction and the best part of five bottles of gin. I wouldn't call that being by oneself. Ah, the... then uh, I'll leave you be. Yeah. Goodbye, Mr. Pike. T take care now. Would you open the windows all the way, please, madam? I'd like to see your passengers, hey, if I may. Hey, hey, half a minute, mister. Hey, hey, he's, he's got them buckets. But I knew practically. Yeah. Wait, I'll get my breath back. Well, let's have it again, slowly. <laughs> that, that fella, he gave me a dollar to fill two buckets with water. And he made off with them. He's bloody laughing me. Which man? You saw him, a little cockney fella in a dark suit. He looked as if he'd slept in it, you know. He was... When was this? Oh, he's a good half hour since. Hey, take a look at this photo, will you? Ah, that's the fella. Damn. Hang on. Hey, hey, what are you doing now? Don't go away. What? That was only plastic. What's this, Ed? I want to get me head down for half an hour. Hmm. It's quiet, isn't it? Yeah. I never did like the country much. Yeah, you remember... Is it all right if I rab it? Yeah, sure, go ahead. What were you going to say? Just thinking of the hop picking. I went a bundle on that. Yeah. We had all our own people, train loads of them. Fat mums with six kids apiece and the parrot in a cage, you remember? Yeah. And the punch-ups with the country kids. <laughs> sure, I remember. Ah, good times, Ed. I lumbered myself down there when I ran away from the army and your old lady put me up. What did I get out of it? The birds are all slags, the blokes were villains. How did you manage to stay out of it? Well, I was putting on motors. I'd rather spend my time up to my elbows in Greece. Oh, that was better than hanging around the warehouse roof waiting for a tickle. What a terrible thief I turned out to be. The worst. I was a pontoon kid. 21 months every time I got weighed off. If I should have stuck to the thieving. It's past, Tommy. Worrying won't bring it back. Everything I did was for devilment till I met the big fella. And it changed. I'm really no better than anybody else. Well, sure, I didn't put the boot in, but I was there when it happened, and I kept stum. What did it matter to me where the lolly came from as long as I was getting my end? Some bookkeeping, Ed. On one side of the page, all those thousands of quid. On the other, sheer bloody terror. Forget it. I can't. It gets worse. After this morning's caper, it can't get better. I want to square it up. You can't. I might. Ed... There's a key at the back of my wallet. Well, you're getting tight in your old age. No, no, listen, will you? The key opens a deposit box in Dublin. There are three envelopes in the box with names on them. If anything should go wrong, I want you to deliver the letters. Here, are you listening? So every word. Go on. One envelope's addressed to the girl. Now, that's for my lawyer over here, and the third one's got no name on it. But inside, it'll tell you where to find those books. You promise, Ed? You can deliver them yourself. Promise. Okay. You're the only one I trust. God knows why. I mean, you're working for him. Yeah, just the once, and I'm not making a very good job of it. Yeah, well, that's it then. I want to stretch my scotches. Yeah. Hey, look at that, would you? It's only snowing. Don't go far. No. You know, I'm not frightened anymore. Fear's just a habit, Tommy. Yeah. I'm glad it was you, Ed. Shut the door. Up the barrow. Who are you? Weaver from Metropolitan, sir. Commander Cook. Indeed I am. Personal ID, please. Uh -huh. Thank you. You made good time. Smooth trip. I left half my stomach over Birmingham. Oh, that's nasty for somebody. You know your man died. Yes, sir. Yeah. Doesn't that frighten you? It terrifies me. They shoot nowadays without thinking. This clumsy imported labor. You found the killer's car, by the way. Anything for me? No. 
Not for us either. They parked it outside St. George's Hall in a no waiting area. A shotgun was lying on the back seat, and two spent cartridges were on the floor. Not a print on any of them. The car was stolen, of course. You know, they treat us with contempt, Weaver. Mm. Any clue on Dyson? Well, take a squint at that wall map. He's somewhere in that red circle. How do you know that, sir? He passed through a roadblock near Stockport at 10 o'clock. Through it? Uh Uh-huh. On foot, carrying two buckets of water. Cheeky beggar. Nice touch, don't you think? Yes, it might be nicer if he'd been picked up. Yeah, naturally. Dyson had a chauffeur, we think. Ah, if you like uh, horror stories, read this weather report. Snow from Monmouth to the Wash by morning. It's already falling in our search area. I'd chuck it in this minute if I didn't know that they were in there somewhere. The driver, whoever he is, likes eccentric manoeuvre. In his place, I would have shot down the M1 and been well out of it. Oh, he expects us to think on those lines. Where's he going? Perhaps he likes mountain scenery. Look, help me, Weaver. Cabela has helped us everywhere, sir. Oh, there's a connection in the Newcastle area. Mm. Or was, until we severed it three months ago. Or some of that group might have survived. Just how tight is this net? Well, after that debacle at Stockport, Dyson would need a tank to crash out. And then you have to go on as you're going, sir. Cold comfort, Weaver. What will you do here? I'd like a desk in communication, sir. And I'd like to look over your shoulder, if that's all right. All I have over my shoulder is dandruff. But you're welcome. <laughs> Tommy? Ah, where's he at? Tommy! Let's be having ya! We've got to be going! Oh, blimey. Tommy! Symphony and sympathies, symphonies, trumpets and bloody great drawings. Radio, the midday news. Following the shooting of a policeman in Liverpool early this morning, police forces throughout the north are cooperating in an all-out effort to apprehend the man who escaped from custody in the incident. The man they wish to interview is Thomas Joseph Dyson. Who was last seen riding an elephant down the motorway. So come to... Who needs you anyway? Brace up, lover. You've done it before. And stop feeling sorry for yourself. What difference can it make now? Stir this, Sam. Come on, get that great rump out of it. You appreciate your comforts, my lass, because tomorrow I'm going to work the belt off you. Ah, just so long as we understand each other. You fancy some light entertainment, do you? I <laughs> thought not. <laughs> Have identified the getaway vehicle. A dark green saloon, registration number B868PPK. The cooperation of all motorists is requested by the police in tracing this car. The public is warned not to approach the driver or his passenger who may be armed, but to get in touch with the nearest police station. And now we return you to the Gary Best request spot. I remember you. Is that absolutely all you can remember? I've entered dozens of vehicles before that one, sir. Registration number was just as I've given it to you. Ah, the plates were dummies. That doesn't matter. The driver could have changed them by now, or he might have transferred to another vehicle. 
I want you to concentrate your mind on picturing this man. Now, close your eyes if you want. Yeah. Dark, close-cropped hair with flexi grey. Clean, shaven, about 35. He was wearing a sort of brown cardigan over a light shirt, no ties. Uh, couldn't estimate his height. Built uh, something like mine, sir. How tall are you? Inch under six foot, sir. All right, go on. How do we speak? Quiet, confident, like London accent. Educated? Hardly. If you met this man in a bar, would you mark him out as a tearaway? No, but I wouldn't pick a fight with him either, sir. Well, that may be something. You said you were suspicious of him. Well, why was that? His attitude. The way he looked. Oh? Well, he was sort of um, cocky without actually saying anything, sir. Like he was laughing to himself. Yes, perhaps he was. Yes, sir. Uh, was there any uh, little feature of this man which stuck in your mind? A, a scar? No, sir. No, nothing like that. It... Hold on a sec, his hands. What about them? It didn't go with the rest of him, sir. He was very tidy, well turned out, if you know what I mean, but his hands were more like a like a labouring man's, uh, calloused, you know. Grubby? Not exactly, more like they had ingrained dirt in them. An engineer's hands? You're a mechanic, sir. Good. Well, that's just the kind of detail I wanted. But why didn't you think of it before? Uh, slipped my mind, sir. Hmm. Oh, excuse me. Oh, please stay, sir. We're almost through. Uh, one last thing. The name on the driver's licence. You're sure it was Harris? Quite, sir. Not Lewis? Or Henry or Parrish? No, sir, I'm absolutely sure of that. Don't feel bad about that bucket, Dodge. I used it once myself to get into the paddock at Adolf Park. <laughs> I'll be away then, sir. Thanks. That license was a forgery. I'd like to transmit some of this stuff to my sergeant in London. Now, he can chew it around with one eye on the files. Something might break. Well, tell him to take his time. Now, how come, sir? I've withdrawn the search cordon. Oh? Three inches of this damn snow fallen in an hour, and it's drifting up on the hills. If my men can't move in it, I'm sure the opposition can't. Did you ever know a townie who could stand to get his feet wet? How long would it take you to uh, reactivate your road watch, sir? No time at all if I put the patrols on standby status. Why? I'd like to recommend that you do. I must have a solid reason, Weaver. Oh, that's something I can't supply, and not in a positive way. But I have an informant on the fringes of the cabiner crew. Uh, he would certainly tell me if Dyson were in circulation again and his probable whereabouts. Well, that is, uh, if he was in the London area or in the south. Uh, would that be enough to convince you, sir? It's pitifully little. However, I can probably rest another 36 hours over local forces to lunchtime Sunday, say. I could almost guarantee accurate information by then. You didn't have it about the abduction, did you? Oh, well, that was set up in a hurry. The method and the execution point to it, sir. And withdrawing surveillance until dawn, that's just common sense. As for your interpretation of the tea leaves, I have to ask higher up. I'm sure they'll listen to you, Commander. Soft soap and flannel. Don't uncross your fingers until I tell you to. Put me on to the CC, will you? Yeah. You cook here. All right, I'll wait. Did you ever consider a career in the diplomatic service, Weaver? I hate to do this to you, Tom. <laughs> it falls on the just and unjust alike. It might as well be Moscow. Look, have a good old dig through the files as far back as you can go. Find out if Dyson had an associate with a background of motor engineering. Or even plain car theft would do. We all have to start somewhere. Uh, roughly Dyson's contemporary, 35 to 40. You've got the picture. I must have hard intelligence by Sunday morning. What's wrong with thee? That, that's only a car, you fool. It'll be Atherton's or Mr. Gatehouse. There, look, it's going past. Are, are you ready for your supper? Come on, go, go on in then. Anybody around? Go away! I'm coming in. I'm 
I'm sorry to, uh... Where are you? Get out. Uh, lady, my uh, car broke down. Here, let me shut the uh, door. Is it all right if I push it into your yard? This isn't a pull-up, you know. Uh, yes, I do know, but there's a storm blowing out here. Look, give me a few minutes to fix it and I'll be off before you can turn around. Well? Do as you wish. Are you all right? <laughs> oh, just celebrating, eh? Would you like me to put the light on? No, leave it, please. I forgot it's not working anyway. In the dark, all caps are grey. Who said that? You did. I ought to get up. <laughs> My legs don't seem to be working. May I help you? No, you meant. <laughs> Who said that? Me Is that a word? Meant? Meant? Meant. <coughs> What was that? A dead marine. Oh, he died in a worthy undertaking. Am I detaining you? I'd like to make sure you're okay. And who wants to know? <coughs> I apologise. No, in a crisis, one's manners are always the first to go. What's the matter? Uh, I feel ill. Uh, it's gone. Sorry, what did you say? Uh, nothing. You don't have a flashlight you could lend me? Somewhere kitchen drawer. Uh, where's that? Uh, through the door, there. Can I help myself? Who's to stop you? Yeah. You had an accident in here? What? There's water all over the floor. I took an impromptu shower. I found it. Good, good. Goody, goody, goody. <laughs> here, I'll, uh, I'll bring this back. Keep it, I've no use for it now. You won't be long, will you? Ten minutes. You mustn't linger. I'm expecting a visitor. Your wine merchant. Sorry. I bet this is a beautiful place in the summer. It's adequate. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, it is beautiful. The perfect place for children. Perfect. I ought to fix myself up with the hotel, sir. It's been done. Oh, thanks very much. I picked it myself. A temperance establishment run by two ancient ladies. There's no lift and hot water's bought by the jugful. You'll love it, Weaver. It sounds charming. I'll take you over myself. For heaven's sake, man, that was a joke. When we senior police officers crack a funny, the whole headquarters fall about laughing. I can't wait to be upgraded, sir. Where are you? In here. Oh. Oh, you found yourself some light then? Yes. What's that you've got there? Ah, oh, it's a carburetor. Can I work on it in here? You said you'd only be ten minutes. Yeah, but the gremlins think different. Sorry again. You, you'll need some newspaper. Yeah, uh, feeling better? I've been sick. Please don't refer to it. Ah. Uh. Thanks. I made tea. Would you like a cup? Very much. Can you tell me your name? Harris. And who are you? Mrs. Gatehouse. How do you do? How do you do? <laughs> you sound like a pair of explorers meeting in the middle of the jungle. <laughs> you uh, live here by yourself? Uh, no. My husband comes up here at weekends... I'm expecting him now. Oh, yeah. Want any uh, help with the tea? I, I can manage. I can manage, thank you. Why don't you sit down? Because... Yes, yes, why don't I? Is there any hot water in the kettle? I think so. I need a small towel. Do you have such a thing, Andy? What for? I'll show you. That, that cupboard. There's one in there. Right. Oh, yeah, this one will do. One of the misfortunes of being a woman is that you can't go into a barber shop and have the towel treatment. What, what are you doing? Uh, playing at doctor. Now, put your head back. Look, 
Oh, I don't... No, all the way, all the way, that's... It. Now, press it all the way round. You don't have to tell me how it feels. It's scalding! No, you only think it is. Now, relax. Soak up the steam. Oh, that feels marvellous. Lucky thing for you, I happened along, wasn't it? How so? Well, me being such a clever doctor and all. Now, this one will numb you. Ooh. There. Oh! Ooh. Thank you. <laughs> right. While you're enjoying that, I'll pour us some tea. I shall, uh, have to impose on you a little longer, Mrs Gatehouse. Huh? Yeah. The trouble isn't the carburetor. It has to be in the fuel pump or the feed lines. I'll have to strip the whole system. That could take me several hours. What am I supposed to say to that? There aren't any choices. I have a car. Yeah. I took the liberty of looking it over. It won't go without a charged-up battery. Besides, I... I have to, uh, I have to wait for this storm to blow itself out. I don't know the roads. In fact, I'm lost. Where are you going? Sheffield. See. Si. Yeah, let me take that. <sighs> Thank you. It was very refreshing. Yeah. Can you put up with an uninvited guest for a few hours? Seems I have to, willy-nilly. I promise I won't get under your feet. Yeah. You ready for that tea now? Yes, please. I'd... I'd be happy if you would stay. I... I don't want to be... Yeah. Yeah, I know. Now, drink it while it's hot. Here's health. I'll vote for that. Oh, my word, that straightens out the lumps. Uh, the working day is always two hours too long. You've noticed that too, have you? I don't envy you, Weaver. No, sir? You're pretty young to be handling an investigation of this size and importance, and you may make your reputation with it. But the sheer slogging graft of it would get me down. When did you last spend a full day with your family? I can't honestly remember. And it's at times like these that you need them most of all. Oh, they understand I have to work eccentric hours. Mm. Don't neglect them, Weaver. There's such a thing as being over-conscientious. A fagged out copper is no good to anybody. I'll remember... After we've nailed this joker. I've seen some of the circulars. From what I've read, your Kavanaugh is something of a wild man. He's an animal, sir. Quite literally. He'll rip a way out of danger with his naked claws. There are no rules for him. Yeah, that's what frightens me. When I started in plain clothes, we had our standover men. The bully boys, razor specialists and the like. They were fairly primitive. Yet they knew when to stop. Normal society would still be there when they were locked up. Can you say the same today? Oh, God. The muckrakers even make heroes of these bastards. I have more faith in the public. In the long term, they won't stand by and see the laws mocked. Where it happened in this case, one witness grew weary of being afraid. If we could put Dyson on the stand, others would follow. And we can do with all the publicity we can get, if it's of the right kind. Oh, the cabiners always cooperate in their own destruction, sir. Explain that for me. Well, how should I put it? Every time Kavanagh suborns a bent policeman or puts the boot in on a terrified shopkeeper, mm -hmm. he builds up resentments in his victims. The longer his career, the greater the resentment he generates. The stronger he is, the more vulnerable he becomes. Yes, he's still controlling organised crime from a remand prison, which suggests he can't be stopped. I say he's rotten ripe, sir. As far as I'm concerned, he's done for. But the boot still goes in. Yes, sir. It's the kick of a dying animal. Ah, all this talk has left a sour taste in my mouth. <laughs> I'm ready for another. How about you, Commander? No, no, I've had my ration. Time for me to put my nose out of doors. This is awful weather, but... It consoles me to think that Dyson and his driver must be rather unhappy about it, too. Those moors can kill a man quick. We should pray that they don't, sir. It's our turn to have some of the luck. You went very long? Oh, it's murder out there. What are you up to? I can't get these sticks to catch. Here, let me have a try. Well, I'm not surprised you can't light them. They're like logs. You should think small with fires. What's happened to your generator? 
The fuel ran out. I forgot to order some more. You'll run in it a bit fine, Mrs Gatehouse, letting the fires go out and no juice for the eaters. Well, don't you care too much? Oh, it's none of my business, is it? You're good with your hands. What do you do for a living? Run a garage, make repair shop. I gather you don't work. I married from the schoolroom, as the saying is. And what does Mr. do? He owns things. Nice. All right. I think we can light up now. That's it. Yeah. How about that? Yeah, move closer. I'd forgotten how beautiful a fire can be. Where do you store your wood? There's some in the kitchen, in a bin by the stove. That's all right, I'll get it. You mustn't pamper me, I'm all right now. Well, of course you are. I'd just like to show thanks when I can. I mean, I might have turned it in by now. My neighbour is only 200 yards away. You must have passed his house on the way up. Well, I didn't see it. Excuse me. Does this neighbour have a phone? He lives in the dark ages before the advent of railways. He lives alone with a collie bitch and his animals. And Seth doesn't believe in gadgetry. Seth? Is that his name? Seth Pike. He's a good neighbour. I don't interfere with him and he returns the compliment. As a matter of fact, he broke the spell this afternoon and called on me. He was worried, he said. He's kind. Can I bring the lamp nearer? What? Uh, oh, so. No, this is a difficult job even with the right tools. Just as well I'm a mechanical genius, isn't it? <laughs> Are you married? No. Have you been? Nah, never got near it. Why do you ask? You seem so self-reliant. A woman might find that challenging. Do you? <laughs> nah, not a fair question. Will you join me in a drink? No, nah, thanks. Not even to be sociable? Sorry. Don't care for it too much. You go ahead if you want. Drinking alone is like inflicting wounds on oneself. It can wait. What will you do in Sheffield? Sheffield? Oh! Oh, I have to buy a lathe. It's going cheap, second hand. Do you have a radio in your car? Oh, sorry, I don't. Oh. I broke mine this afternoon. Yeah, I saw the bits. What did you do? Hit it with hammer? I lost patience with it. I couldn't find the programme I wanted. So you made sure you wouldn't have the problem again? Everything was running down. The house, the power supply, and... And me, Mr Harris. It seemed easier to relax and drift with the stream. Why do we go on living when our instinct tells us it's time to stop? <laughs> do you want to answer to that? Or are you putting your thoughts in order? Look, nothing I say can make a difference. I don't like this kind of talk, Mrs Gatehouse. If you want to do away with yourself, that's a matter between you and yourself. You're my guest. You're supposed to keep me in good humour. Yeah, I'll sing you a song, honey. I didn't bring my piano. Oh, was I rude? No, but you allowed your prejudice to show. Shouldn't you have some food first? This is food, Mr Harris, and it's physic too. Oh, it tastes pretty disgusting, I admit, but then I don't take it for fun. This brew has healing properties. Where's the pain, lady? It's all over me. Feels like a persisting low ache in the flesh and in the head. It's not localised and it won't kill me. The complaint is fairly common, but it doesn't have a name in medical terminology. Would you like me to cook you something? No. And I wish you weren't so damn concerned all the time. I was thinking to myself, I'm hungry. I haven't eaten for 12 hours. You do have food, don't tons, you? Tons, tons of it. Help yourself. No, no, please do make free with everything. Everything except my privacy. I'm going where I don't have to smell the odour of sanctity which you brought in with you. It would gratify me no end to find you gone in the morning. Yeah, sure, and what happens if the snow's drifted? You're a mechanical genius, you said. You'll find a way. I don't have anything on that yet, sir. Oh, Bradley's been beating the bushes. Not a word, either way. Yes, yes, I agree. It might produce results. I'll ask him just as soon as he gets here. Bye, sir. Oh, morning, Commander. Hello, Eva. What's the form? Nobody's... Hello, Eva. What's the form? Nobody's talking. I just had a word with my superintendent. He thinks I might do more good if I went back to town for a few hours. He'd like to speak to you about it. You don't need my permission. And it's odds on nothing is going to break here. 
Since we don't have dog teams or snow plows, we might as well sit here and play cards. Mm. My sergeant isn't getting much rest, poor blighter. I got him to compile a list of all Kavanagh's visitors. Mm-hmm. It didn't take long. There's only one name on it. A solicitor. Can you see what I'm driving at, sir? He's the errand boy. There can't be anybody else. I thought I might go and apply for some cheap legal advice. Ah. I can be back here before evening. Mm-hmm. As you wish. Heaven's sake, don't let the taxpayers know how we're spending their money. What's your governor's number? Ask the switchboard for line 10, sir. Oh, your own line. Another extravagance. Uh, line 10, please. <laughs> we used to carry a pocket full of coppers and rush to the scene on a bicycle. Visitor for you. What's new? Dyson didn't get to Lincoln. Go on. Well, that's it. Dyson and that ace driver you hired have vanished. What the hell does that mean, Mears? They passed through a roadblock at Stockport yesterday morning. I know that. They disappeared into North Derbyshire and haven't surfaced yet. The snow is ten feet deep in places up there. A police cordon may have them boxed in. I don't get it. Started only an hour or two of hard motoring ahead of him when he passed through the roadblock. What was he playing at? He was your choice. Mm. Him and Tommy used to be muckers. Eddie must be getting sharp. You'll have to get mobile meals. I have to find that pair before the Johns do. Yeah. I'll wipe that look off your face. You're still on wages. I, no, I beg you. Shut up. There's a fellow in Manchester named of O'Shea. Fulham's got his telephone number. Now tell O'Shea he's to go on a hunting trip. Tell him where and for what. Give him whatever he thinks the job's worth. Oh, you sweating again, Mears. The system's gone awry. Can't you see that? You're throwing good money after bad. I'm alive and I'm staying that way. How many more? I've got to go down. How many more are there? Go on. Master's waiting. Excuse me. Are you Mr. Leonard Mears? Yes. What do you want? A police, sir. Now, a superintendent would like to speak with you, sir. I can't possibly see him now. Oh, I think you can, sir. Our car's this way. After you, please, sir. Oh, good morning. I'll make you some breakfast. Do you mind? Give you something to drink. Coffee? Thank you. No milk, thank you. Well, there isn't any. You're going to have black? All black. How are you today? Tired, thank you. It's a beautiful morning. Outside it looks like a Christmas card. Sun's quite warm there. Is the road passable? No. I couldn't make five yards in it. I tried at seven this morning. I heard your engine running. I thought you might be gone. Ah, the eggs turned hard. I don't think I can eat anything. Well, I'll leave it in the oven. You might change your mind. What are you staring at? (laughs) The way you're blowing your coffee. It reminds you of somebody, I suppose. Well, not in particular. We used to cool ours in a saucer. I thought only navvies did that. That's right. My father was a labourer. What did yours do? He still does it. He's an estate agent. Well, it's better than grafting. How long can I expect to have your company? That depends. On the weather, I suppose. Right. And it has nothing to do with my preferences? Look, I'd go if I could. You can walk to my neighbour's house. I'm sure he could put you up. All right. I'll go and see him after I've eaten, if that's not going to put you under any strain. My appetite's gone. I'm surprised. You were out for hours in all that lovely fresh air. Do you have nausea, Mr. Harris? I didn't look for a quarrel, Mrs. Gatehouse. Yes, I suppose I did force my way in here, but I hope we could pretend I was welcome. My, but you're sensitive. I'm crying out loud. I know what you're thinking. You're saying to yourself, what's got into the bitch? I'll tell you, Mr. Harris. You unsettled me. In fact, you frightened me. This morning I discovered you told me a string of lies and evasions last night. I can't pretend you're welcome. I don't even want to. How do you know I lied, Mrs. Gatehouse? I waited until you camped down in my living room last night. When I was sure you were sleeping, I went through your car. Women are like that, didn't you know? The first thing I saw was your portable radio. Why did you say you were without one? There was nothing in your car to say who you were. You can see my driver's license if you want. 
Will your license explain the blood-stained clothes in the boot? Or the spade with traces of earth and blood still clinging to it? Or how you came to be here at all? You must have a theory to fit all these things together. I have an idea, Mr... Whoever you are. It appalls me to put it into words. When did you wreck your radio? Not soon enough, I'd say. The police were broadcasting messages about a car like yours from 11 o'clock onwards. No, no, don't come near me. I want some more coffee. No, I swear I won't harm you. There should be two of you. He's dead. He shot himself. I buried him in a wood about five miles from here. He was too scared to go on living. Let me go, please. I, I won't tell anyone. That's not on, Mrs Gatehouse. You're stuck with me for a few more hours. Don't blame me. Blame the weather and your own curiosity. Why didn't you run while you still had a chance? Because it took me so long to piece it together. My brain wasn't working after all the drink I'd had yesterday. I'd simply forgotten about the manhunt in Liverpool. But it came back to me while I waited to come down. What will you do with me? Nothing. Nothing at all. You'll have to stay inside the house, of course. Just carry on as you would normally. But in case you get inspired, I won't turn my back on you. I'll have to see you every moment of the day. Uh, what if I have to go to the bathroom? I'll think of something. Are you a murderer? Look, I drove a car and I buried a friend. That's it. Why don't you open one of those bottles of gin and dose yourself? It'll shorten a day for you. No. If you're going to harm me, I'll be looking into your face as you do it. Oh, it's gone chilly in here. Let's move next door. No. Ladies first. Mr Mears. Thank God. This way, sir. I hope your superiors can give me a good reason for keeping me cooped up here. Pressure of work, sir. The crime wave. All this villainy that the papers are full of, you know how it is. Aye, Bosch. Oh, don't be like that, sir. Come in. Mr Mears, sir. Thank you, Joe. Oh, please come in, Mr Mears. Oh, don't go far away, will you, Sergeant? Sir. Do sit down, Mr Mears. Look, before I do, I'd like to know why I've been... kept waiting? I apologise. That was on my instruction. I had to clear my desk first. I've been north, you see. Oh, please sit, Mr Mears. <sighs> Good. Why? Why did I want to see you? Oh, uh, yes, yes. Well, to be absolutely frank, we want your cooperation, Mr Mears. In fact, we insist on it. We think your services to the police are long overdue. Well, what does that rigmarole mean? Your cabiner's sole contact with the outside world. Apart from a pair of prison officers who bring him tidbits of information for cigarette money, you make frequent visits to an address in Fulham, to a house owned by Kavanagh's former common-law wife, and every time you do, trouble follows. There's absolutely no connection. I'm tired of deferring to you, Mears. Ever since I saw you at the committal proceedings, I sensed you were a wrong one. I can bring you in at a moment's notice on several charges of conspiracy, and I will, if you don't give us a little of the concern you lavish on your client... Oh, God, man, have you no shred of self-respect left? You'll kill me. We raided the Fulham house an hour ago. The chain's broken. I want immunity. You'll have it. What do you want to know? The identity of Dyson's driver and the other men involved in the Liverpool shooting. Well? I know nothing about the men who were hired to abduct Dyson. I, I swear it. I don't believe you. Yet? And Dyson's driver? I can tell you about him. Well, that's something, I suppose. You're prepared to give us a general statement? I'll quote the telephone directory if you wish it. Oh, I'm sorry. Truly sorry. Come in, Sergeant. I want to go out. Where? Just out. I could walk. I know places where the snow won't be too deep. Yeah, let me think about it. You must be enjoying this. I'm not, believe me. Whenever did you have so much power over an individual? I should think it excites you terribly. A pure exercise of control. Only autocrats know that kind of pleasure. Why don't you read? I've skimmed through that junk several times. Those books are my husband's choice. Inside every man of action, a sentimental schoolgirl looks out. I thought you said he just owned things. So he does. But he wants more. We won't be seeing him, will we? Wait and see. Yeah, this snow won't clear. I wouldn't be surprised if there's more on the way. What's this place called? Eastern Steep. The village is three miles the other way. 
Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've got it. I came in a circle. And, uh... Where's the tracks where your fields go? Into an old quarry. This is what they call the end of the line. I thought it was a disused military road somewhere near here. You're several years too late. It reverted to farmland. <sighs> so I'll have to return the way I came. That's what I've been telling you. Do you have a pack of cards? Nope. Chess? Drafts? Spillikins? Sorry. In any case, you'd have to play by yourself. Where did you learn to be so ungracious? In a hard school. You promised you'd approach Pike for a bed. That's before you told me you'd been nosy. Lend me your radio. Sorry. We can't just sit here gawping, for God's sake. Please, can't we go out just for a little while? All right, get your coat. No. Come on, we'll get it. Now, I want your word of honour. You won't make no trouble. Oh, come, Mr Harris. Aren't we a little old for that sort of thing? Say it anyway. No, the, the green coat, please. Thank you. You mustn't be allowed to win every hand. I haven't won a trick all week. Don't push. Come on, come. Is that it? Yes. Get it typed up, Joe, and see Mr Mears signs the copies before he leaves us. Right, sir. Uh, you, you mentioned protection. I can assign an officer to stay with you. Now, who do you think, Joe? Ogden, sir. He can use the experience. Right. Uh, it's 2.30, later than I thought. I can take the train this time. Uh, that's all for the moment, Joe. Well, there's two hours typing in this, sir. I'll be here. Weaver here. Ask Ogden to get over here, will you? The West Central know where he's skulking. Thanks. Uh, can I order you some tea? You'll need it after all that talking. No, thank you. I don't want to rub salt in your cuffs, Mr. Mears, but I'd like to know why you went on taking orders as you did. You didn't even make much money by it. I had. I thought Kavanagh was a romantic character, a sort of condottier. I've had a weakness for heroes since I was a boy. A Robin Hood without a conscience? Perhaps. He had a directness of purpose... One doesn't often meet with today. In his perverted way, he's a, he's a total man. Totally evil, you mean? Stroud. He said that, too. He said it was the source of Kavanagh's fascination. Stroud? The driver? Yeah. Strangely, he seemed to be the only one of Kavanagh's associates who isn't afraid of him. That's remarkable. I look forward to meeting him. And I will. Uh, would you wait outside, please? I have a few telephone calls to make. Yes, yes, of course. And try to put on a brave front, Mr. Mears. You've just escaped the clutches of the devil. I wonder if that's true. Weaver, connect me with Commander Cook, Northern Task Force, please. Please, not so fast. Oh, sorry. We'll rest for a bit. That's some view, isn't it? Oh, don't tell me you respond to nature. Well, why not? We're all part of it. Hey, what's that place over there where the smoke is? The Atherton's. More farmers. My feet have gone dead. Well, bang them about a bit. God. How does the sun get that colour? It looks like a bowl of blood. Oh, it's water in the atmosphere, I think. Yeah. It's going to snow again. You can see I couldn't have left here unless I did it on a skis. Oh, don't justify yourself to me, Mr. Harris. Is that your name? No, but it'll do a turn. Yeah, we ought to turn back. Did you kill that policeman? Come on, give us your hand, it's slippery. Tell me what happened. Tell me how you came to be here. Why do you have to know? To ease my mind. You can lie if you want, but I'm scared. And I daren't go back into that house unless I think I have a chance of coming out alive. No, I don't want your help. Yes, you like. All right. There's no reason why you shouldn't know. It's going to fill the newspapers in a few weeks anyway. I suppose you're going to preview it. Well, it begins and ends with a housebreaker who graduated with big-time extortion. His name is... <laughs> this is good for a laugh. Charles Parnell Kavanagh. Keep close, girl there. Uh... 
Are you told, Mrs. Gatehouse? I brought the cream. Hush, <laughs> will ya? Oh, that's strange, to be sure. Oh, I'll leave it by the door here. <laughs> no doubt she'll fall over it. <laughs> Come on, let's be home, Jess. Hey, look at that. Handsome motor, ain't it? Costs more money than I could afford. <laughs> Ah, and here's her little runabout. Well, I... I'll bless myself. Get back! Now, now that's surely not right. I thought he left the car for a breath of air. When he heard me calling, he must have made up his mind to finish it. Yeah, that's all there is. So I made a hole for him and started east. Oh, I must have taken a wrong turn. But it wouldn't have mattered anyway. And all that clag, I couldn't see over the bonnet. What did you do with his wallet? Oh, it's in the car where he left it. So, it's simple. You hand it over to the police. But you don't have to do it in person. Oh, it's simple like that, it is simple. There's a good reason why I can't. And you won't tell me what that is? No. Even Tommy didn't know. And we were friends for 30 years. Oh. Police aren't in any mood to do a deal with me. With that one, I might as well turn in my cards. Do what? Give up. Take a beating for no reason. Well, what are you thinking now? How does that matter? You're going to trust me a little? What is it? It's Mr. Pike. He must have come calling. Well, can you get rid of him? Why should I? You're the interloper here. Listen, he's ferreting around down here. He might come up with a bright idea. See him off. The best way is to do that to yourself. Come on, or are you afraid only of simple old men? Oh, damn, a blast. Hello, Mr. Pike. Uh, afternoon. <laughs> you haven't met, have you? Mr. Pike, Mr. Harris. I, uh, how are you? Hello there. Mr. Harris brought me some papers from my husband, but he was snowbound, you see. I'll not shift before tomorrow. <laughs> that must have been you. I, I heard driving past late yesterday afternoon. Oh, uh, yeah, I, I expect so. Quiet, love. She's nervous before strangers. <laughs> she won't be nervous of me. Here. There we are. That's better, isn't it? <laughs> I uh, brought that cream I docked of. That was kind of you. Thank you. I parked it by the door. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll be off then. Uh. Yeah, cheerio. Bye-bye. Don't vex me now, Jess. You think it's all the cars? I don't know. Is it important? Eh? Oh, probably not. Uh, by the way, thanks. I wasn't thinking of you. I don't want to see that old man harmed. Here, here's your cream. Oh, snow. Just made it. I want to stay out here and watch it. You'll catch cold. Don't be mean. Isn't it mysterious? I wonder if flakes make a sound when they fall. No, I can't hear them. I think they do. And somewhere there's an instrument sensitive enough to hear them. All right, it's too cold to watch from here. And I do need a very big drink. Weave up. Over here, man. Going my way? Hop in if you are. Thank you, drive up. Damn nice of you to lay on a five-star reception, sir. Hmm. I was on my way home when curiosity overcame common sense. Uh, do you have any goodies in that briefcase? You won't believe how busy we've been. Yeah. Try that for size, sir. Mm hmm. Hey, those are two of the most respected officers in the country. They were, Commander. 
The Metropolitan Commissioner is going to interview them in the morning. We suspected this, didn't we? But not at this level, sir. I thought some operative in communications might have taken a drop. The superintendents don't come cheap. You're not supposed to even think in those terms, Weaver. No. Uh, there's the man with Dyson. Mm -hmm. It's an old photo. We dredged it out of central records. Now look at the date. 1955. Mm, nothing since. No, sir. He was on probation for joyriding. Ah, a motor fiend, eh? Uh, that should be of more interest. Mm -hmm. It's a copy of Stroud's birth certificate on a passport application. Just see what it says under name and profession of father. Good Lord. Hmm. The same, you think? It's odd's answer. Uh, can I have them back, please? Oh, yes, yes. Mears gave us loads of stuff, but the real clincher is still Dyson. Mears thinks, he doesn't know for sure, that Dyson has everything written down somewhere. Uh, even we didn't hope for so much. I wouldn't lay money on finding him. Nor I, sir. We may get a break in the weather. That's something. The Met boys say there's a warm front moving up behind all this cotton wool. They say this little lot won't settle. You'd better prepare yourself for an early call. <sighs> oh, that was fine. Do you eat like this every day? Sometimes I'm too lazy to cook. Do you want coffee? Yeah, later, perhaps. Can I pour you some wine? Oh, yes, just half a glass will do. You know, perhaps... Perhaps I shouldn't say this. Then don't. I was thinking, your old man must be a bit of a chump. I'm the one to say things like that. But why are you up here? I'm in disgrace, Mr. Harris. Harris isn't your name. What is it? Stroud. Eddie Stroud. That sounds real enough. I've been naughty, and my husband has put me aside. But you're not divorced? No. As I said, I'm only on probation. How do you get back in a favour? I sweat it out. Anyway, it was my idea to come up here. I couldn't bear to be under scrutiny. Do you have any children? Not now. But if you had the option, what would you do? I don't have that option. Well, maybe I prefer to be somebody else, have a different set of attitudes, but it's futile speculating. This is the only personality I have, and I'm stuck with it. What do you want? Nothing. No. But I I'm... mean that. I really don't care. The calendar chooses for us. That lovely golden horizon you had at 17 shrinks to the extent of a single room by the time you're 30. I passed 30 four years ago. My outlook narrows by the day. You still have freedom of action, Stroud. You have choices to make. No. No, my future's tied up tighter than a lock nut. The only favour I could do Tommy was to keep him a few yards ahead of the people who were looking for him. In the end, he wouldn't even let me do that for him. You can destroy his murderer. That'd be something. I told you, I can't. This man Kavanagh is like a typhoid carrier. You can't even speak of him without contempt. If you could bring him down at long range, all you'd need to do is put Dyson's wallet in the envelope and post it to the police. You could simply drop from sight. Yeah, maybe. I've got half an idea they know who I am already. Anyway, I'm not going to turn in my own brother, am I? Brother? Yeah. <laughs> Charlie Gavin is my full brother. And I headed a family. Well, that's worth thinking about, wouldn't you say? Another man has been identified in the hunt for the killers of Police Sergeant Robert Reeves. He's been named as Edwin Stroud, a 36-year-old Londoner. He was last seen driving a green saloon car towards the M26 motorway yesterday morning but senior police officers believe he may still be in the North Derbyshire district. Stroud is 5 feet 11 inches tall, has dark greying hair and brown eyes. His companion, Thomas Joseph Dyson, was abducted from police custody in an incident in which Sergeant Reeves... Uh, I knew there was so much. Hey, what, what that can I do now? It, yes! Do, do you fancy I like daffodils? We can't tie the past up in little bundles and chuck them. You approve of Kavanagh's activities? What, does anybody? <laughs> Why'd you go on protecting him? Helen. Why, Stroud? Look, our sort of people don't eat our own, and I like to pay my owings. You're indebted to your brother? All the way. The business I run, he set it up. With dirty money. If you like. But I was glad to get it. Bank managers weren't exactly falling over themselves to capitalise me. Kavanagh, he said, write the cheque and I'll sign it. Just like that. No charge, no interest. No? Isn't your willing help interest on that debt? Maybe. 
You protect those whom you despise and neglect your friends. Your moral ballast seems to have come adrift, Mr. Stroud. I'll make you some coffee. Stroud. What now? I've no right to speak to you like this. Oh, forget it. I'm rather proud of my free-thinking ways. You can rely on me to produce the shocking phrase. I don't mean it. It's a pose. Underneath, I'm as conventional as Christmas pudding. Murder is wrong, and violence, and coercion, all wrong. Wherever you are, the rules have to be bent a little, maybe, but I haven't been there, and I don't intend to go. You look thoughtful. Yeah, this is my lost-in-thought look. Tell me what you think. Oil lamps ought to make a comeback. Why, sir? It's a friendly sort of light they give off. It doesn't mean anything, Mrs Gatehouse, but lamplight suits your looks. Do you hope to sweep me off my feet, Stroud? Not while you go on using my lane like a cosh. Right. That's it, there we are. Do you have a girl? Well, I'm not exactly lonely in that way. Are you ever? You'll be asking me if I dream at night next. All right. Do you dream at night, Mr. Stroud? <laughs> <laughs> Only after cheese. <laughs> My husband didn't love me for six months before we separated, and I've been here for two months. Are you embarrassed? It's none of my business, you know. But you had uh, a light in your eye. It won't do you any good. My husband froze me out because I allowed one of his partners to put his hands on me. I didn't object. But one lapse in 13 years doesn't make me a whore. Of course it does. Are you listening, Strat? Yeah, you're not a whore. Oh, God. Oh, what is it? I'm lonely, damn you. Yeah. It's all right. I won't hurt you. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Not if you're unhappy. I thought I'm done with needing men. Why, why couldn't you be thoroughly rotten and vicious? Not enough practice, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> I have to go. Here, can I have my arm back? Don't be long. I like it. Mr. Atherton! You can't hear in this windlass. Mr. Atherton! I'll have to use your telephone! I'll have another pint of cooking, Bitter. Now, what about you, Commander? I've gone over the legal limits. No more, thanks. Just the Bitter, then, please. Thank you, sir. My wife is probably preparing a hatchet for me, Weaver. She's very canny. When I go into the house wafting malt before me, she gives me that line from Gilbert and Sullivan about the hardness of a policeman's lot. Now, what do your boys think of a life on the force? Oh, the younger one wants to electrocute himself with his stereo equipment, and he has no views. The elder, Alan, well, he's more cagey. He'd consider detective work if he didn't have to put in several years flattening his feet. Excuse me, it's one of the gentlemen, Mr. Cook. I am, dear. What is it? Telephone. Ah, oh, thanks. On the bar? That's right, sir. Uh, well, excuse me, Weaver. I bring that bitter, sir. 36 hours. Hmm? That's how long you've been here. Are you always so self-possessed? Always. <laughs> <laughs> now, you must be frightened of something. Yeah. Stinging nettles and toads. Spiders. Those big ones you see in the bar. Yeah, I know. The ones with the mad red eyes. They flicker before they jump out. Oh, <laughs> don't! I, can't, I can see it now. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing's really changed, has it? What do you mean? You'll go as soon as you can. Hide yourself somewhere and pretend this never happened. Well, I won't. Here, do you want a cigarette? No, thanks. Will you boast about this, Eddie? What for? You can convince your friends that you're a hell of a lad. Nah, if I had those kind of friends, I wouldn't have to. There doesn't have to be a meaning to everything. But I like to think our meeting has one. Well, it's an accident, isn't it? I mean, what can follow? If I travelled light and fast, I might get clear. But I'm going to have one eye over my shoulder for a long time to come. And you haven't decided what kind of life you want for yourself. I want the sort to make me happy again. Relax that busy mind. Be content with now. And put your arm round me. I'll make do with animal warmth. Yeah.
Hey, what's up? Hey, come on. Come on, tell what's up, mate. <laughs> Look, my uncle had an old English sheepdog when I was a little girl. <laughs> it was really old and slow and quite stupid, and it smelt awful. <laughs> <laughs> its name was Eddie. Oh, well, that's charming. <laughs> that's nice. <laughs> Hello, Weaver. Where's, where's Pike? I'm just changing into his Sunday clothes, sir. Did he, uh, did he say he'd do it? A push from you might convince him, sir. Oh, there. I think she's got no more sense than she was born with. Did you uh, come to a decision, Mr. Pike? Um, I'd go up there for you like a shot, gentleman, but you know, I'm, I'm worried about this bitch of mine. I... Can't you take her with you? And see her hurt. Well, she'll be safe with us, Mr. Pike. Uh, but what about afterwards? Uh, uh, say I got myself, well, wounded or summit. Who would care for her then? <clears throat> well, uh, neither of these men has a history of violence, sir. Well, we certainly wouldn't expose you if there was the slightest risk. Uh, but we must have someone in the house to distract their attention while our officers get into position. Uh... Very well. Uh, she likes biscuit with her meals, but, but not too much butcher's meat. It makes her lazy. Uh, have, I, have I time to put a kettle on before I go? Uh, you take all the time you want, Mr Pike. We won't move before they do. Uh, perhaps, perhaps you'll join me, gentlemen. Uh, I'd like that very much, sir. It's quite a fresh morning, uh, I hope you won't think me inhospitable, but I, I, I won't be sorry to see you done here. Oh, that's, uh, that's understandable. I've got nothing against the police, only your men have frightened my ewes. Uh, oh, I'll, I'll be digging them out, I dare say. Oh, I expect we can give you a hand, can't we, Commander? Helen? Hmm? Hey, sleepyhead. <sighs> what is it? Tea. <sighs> Not tea. <laughs> Oh, bless you. Mm. Yeah, oh. Shall I fetch you a saucer? No. Sit by me. Yeah. What time is it? Uh, almost nine. It's a beautiful morning. Warm. So the snow's melting? Yeah, I can be away in a couple of hours. Oh. Yeah, so soon? Well, I daren't hang about. Oh, don't drop your head. Look at me. No. Helen, I want you to come with me. Where? All the way. I don't know where we'll end up, but I'd like to have you alongside. It's madness. No, it isn't. I've, I've thought a lot about it. I think we should stay together. We don't know each other, Eddie. So we'll learn. I can't. I'm sorry. This has nothing to do with how I feel for you, Eddie. There's so much involved that you probably haven't thought of. There's the whiskery old business of class difference. Do you really think that matters? It doesn't, right this minute. Some day, when we fall out, though, I might just feel the want of old friends and the kind of life I'm used to. The kind your husband gives you? Oh, watch out, you're spilling it. Oh. Why don't you just tell him to go to hell? I can't do that until I'm sure. Well, how much convincing do you need? Look, if I caught you playing up, I might give you a backhander, but that'd be the end of it. I wouldn't kick you out and let you rot until I decided to act like God Almighty and allow you back. And if you did cheat, it was because I'd let you down. You can't judge without facts, Eddie. I have all the information I need. Helen, I want to look after you. Do you? So think about it, eh? And drink your tea before it freezes over. Here. Let me open the window for you. Here. Outside. Looks like one of those posters for a Swiss winter holiday. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I never worked out how those fellas stayed upright on skis. <laughs> you think they... What is it? No touring in the Alps for me, love. Eddie, what's wrong? Mr. Plod. About 50 of them. Please. Well, it's not the Bulgarian Navy. What are you going to do? I'll go down fighting. With a gun in each hand and a dirty great dagger in my teeth. Come and get me, you bastards! I'll say and I'll fall in a crossfire using bad language to the last. <laughs> Oh, it's bloody silly. Come on, cheer up. Look, you better put some clothes on. Your nightly might give the John's ideas. It's over then? 
Well, that's up to you, love. I'll make us some bacon sandwiches. Oh, Eddie. Oh, Eddie, nothing. No, no, no. I, I really didn't expect to win this one anyway. Don't be long. Well, I best get it over the call is going over the top, don't I? We'll be within call, Mr. Pike. If you shout, we'll run up at the double. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you can make an excuse, you might try to get the lady, uh, Mrs. Gatehouse, to join you outside. Oh, she's in no danger. I had the feeling she were quite bally with this child fella. Mm-hmm. Stranger things have happened at sea. Aye. Yeah, ju- just catch all the Jess, would you? She's right. going to fret herself on it. I'll be back directly, you fool. Behave yourself. Oh, it's a lovely morning for a gentle stroll. Game old character, isn't he, sir? Yes, and I thank God for it. I think it's time we took up our positions. I'm scared, Eddie. No, you're not. You look good. Sit down. I've almost done. Will there be any shooting? Not unless you do it. No, I'm not armed. I wouldn't know which end the bullet comes out of. Go on, eat. I can't. Not in a good love. My bacon sandwiches are famous. I'm sure they are. Hey, 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 come on. This is your lucky day. Bad interfering Eddie gets lugged away by the Bow Street runners. Ed, I might transport me. I've always wanted to see Australia. <laughs> you idiot. <laughs> yeah, that's better. Give us your hand. Write to me. I always write too much. There's no such thing. I'll expect 20 pages a day. How, how long will you be away? Oh, a couple, I dare say. Yes. Well, they don't dish out weeks at a time, love. Well, that gives us a chance to make up our minds. How can you be sure that in two years you'll feel the same as you do this minute? I know. Oh, how, how can I be sure that I won't change the moment you walk out of the door? Well, if you do, you can write and tell me about it. There's something else you can do for me, Alan. Hmm? Tommy's wallet. I dropped it down the back of the bookcase. Tomorrow you'll dust there, won't you? And give yourself a surprise. Very well. It's easier coming from you. (laughs) Funny. My appetite's just left me. My mother always told me not to waste food. Hey, do you hear something? No. What is it? (laughs) It's Mr Pike in his best suit. Scouting for the cavalry. I suppose he put them onto me. He's got his share of sand, all right. How could he know? Oh, it's when we came back from our walk yesterday. He was closing your barn door, remember? Yes. Well, he must have poked his head in and seen my car. It had your number place on it. Sorry. Well, that's him. You better let him in, love. Eddie? No, no, no. no. It's all right. Go on. Oh, good morning. It's all right, Mr. Pike. I know why you're here. Won't you come in, please? Wipe your feet. I already did. I didn't ask to see you, Weaver. Where's my lawyer? He has a singing lesson. He sent me in his place. We have nothing in common. No? I'm a businessman. A furniture wholesaler. The innocent victim of police malevolence. (laughs) I hope your sense of humour is strong enough to see you through the next 30 years or so. Manure, as the saying is. Tommy Dyson's dead. No relation to Bomber Dyson, is he? I had a Bomber Dyson who used to work for me umping dressing tables. No, this Dyson was an old friend of your brother. Brother? I got no brother. All right, we'll give you one gratis. Eddie Stroud. Never heard of him. We picked him up in Derbyshire, where he spent the weekend with a newfound lady friend. (laughs) Some people have all the luck, don't they? Dyson didn't. He shot himself. And that's one more to hang on your conscience. Ah, give yourself a break, Weaver. I don't need one. Stroud was a night careless with Tommy's effects. He dropped his wallet where he hoped his lady friend wouldn't find it. There was a key in the wallet. And that key led to another all the way to a trunk full of ledgers in Ireland. You knew about those books, didn't you, Kavanagh? You don't have to tell me what's the punchline. You think of one. You have 30 years to make it good. Shove off. I want to. But I thought to get that in first. 
When the game's running against you, Kavanagh, you should be the first to know. So many men through your hands. Hungry ones, greedy ones. Mags, we rat. Yes, men without stature, the slightly soiled. You can't build a house with rotten materials, Kavanagh. What makes you so special? I'm not, but I'm walking out of here. Cruel, isn't it? Unquiet Hill, the cast was as follows. Stroud, John Chalice, Helen Gatehouse, Caroline John, Cook, Geoffrey Matthews, Weaver, John Sampson, Kavanagh, Brian Haynes, Mears, Hayden Jones, Dyson, David Valor, Seth Pike, Anthony Hall, Bradley, Nigel Anthony, Police Patrolman, Nigel Graham, Frankie and Garage Attendant, William Edel. The radio newsreader was Martin Munkester. Unquiet Hill was written by John Kirk Morris and the production was by Jerry Jones. Saturday Night Theatre. We present the last production in the Flora Robson Festival. The villagers of Denzil St. David in Norfolk will not forget that night in February 1947. With the waters higher than for a hundred years and the increasing danger of the great dike collapsing, many were leaving their homes for the safety of Norwich, 15 miles away. Many others were beginning to trickle up to the high ground where stood the convent of Our Lady of Reims, a French nursing order. Bonaventure. The play by Charlotte Hastings, adapted for radio by Peggy Wells, stars Flora Robson as Sister Mary Bonaventure. The wind and rain beating upon the grey walls of the convent of Our Lady of Reims could be heard inside the great hall, where the fading daylight shone through the stained glass windows of the great room, calm and somberly beautiful in the dim light. They're getting out boats and sandbags in the village, Phillips. They say the great dike may come down. Brett, for heaven's sake, stop talking. You're on duty in 19 and three-quarter minutes precisely. And do something about your hair. If Sister Mary Bonaventure sees you with it falling out of your cap like that... She won't be stuffy. She's got a sense of humour. You know, until I came to the convent, I thought all nuns were very calm and detached. I didn't expect them to laugh and be approachable like other people. I suppose it's because this is a nursing order. They're not out of touch with the world. There's not sufficient discipline here. Sometimes I'm really surprised at Sister Mary's attitude to the patients. A qualified woman with her authority. After all, she is matron. Now, when I was at the Memorial Hospital... <gasps> in, uh... All right, all right, you told us. Bless us. At this rate, you'll be mummified before you're 30. The prospect need not affect you. I'm leaving at the end of this month. But how silly. This is a grand place to train. Mary's a wonderful teacher and the food's superb. I don't like the lax atmosphere. Oh, and I object to that horrible Willie prowling about. Willie's all right. If you don't show your aversion. Poor thing, couldn't help being born. Ah, here's Sister Josephine with your supper. You'll have to be quick. I'm starving, Sister. And here you are, then. But what you want, young lady, are some hairpins. Which particular film star are you copying? <laughs> it was so windy. I've been to look at the water. Sister, what will happen if the great dike doesn't hold? Well, all the villagers will be homeless and crowding up here on the high ground. And where we shall put them and how we shall feed them, goodness only knows. Food's no problem to you. You're a genius. Look, Phillips, mushroom omelette and a heavenly savoury sauce. Honestly, if I stay here long enough, I shall get fat. Ah, uh, ah, uh, no. Wait a moment. Wait? But why, sister? Well, no blessing, child. <gasps> oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Dear Lord, thank you for my most excellent supper and for making Sister Josephine such a divine cook. Now, no, no, no. Let's have a little reverence. Benedictus. 
benedictus benedicat per Jesum Christum Dominum Nostrum, Amen. Now, save it every mouthful in the good Lord's name. My word, this wind and rain. A pity the poor souls on the road tonight. I think we should keep the place extra warm just in case. I must speak to Sister Agnes. Sister Agnes, is Willie around? Good. Would you ask him to bring some logs into the hall? I'm going to keep a good fire in. I as well be prepared. You're expecting trouble then, sister. You concentrate on your supper. Nurse Phillips. Sister, what is it? Just look at that newspaper. Have I not begged you girls to keep all the old newspapers and not to crumple them like that? You must have thousands stored. Aye, and a thousand and one uses for them. Never discard a newspaper, never throw away a piece of string. History might have been altered many times if a piece of string or an old newspaper had been lying handy. Sister Agnes, say you want a day's vlog, sister? Ah, good boy, Willie. Will you mend the fire, please? We're rather shivery. Ah, surely. <coughs> floods be out. Tis always cold when floods be out. Definitely. Are they out? Not yet. But you'll be here and later, right enough. What's happening, Willie? What are the people doing? <laughs> Bobbing about with lanterns, they are. Like as many ants. And the boats. <laughs> they're going too. Some they're making for Norwich. But they won't get there, they won't. Waters be terrible strong once they're out. <laughs> smash a little boat in a minute, they will. Smash her into nothing. Now, now, Willie, <laughs> Willie. Have we seen Sister Mary, please? She promised I some sweet as she did. Out of the big brass box in her room. I've been polishing her. Are you sure you haven't taken a few sweets already? Why would I do that, Nurse Phillips? Why not? Because tis in the wise book that sister reads. Keep thy hands from picking and stealing. <laughs> have my hands been picking and stealing, sister? I'm quite certain they have, uh, Willie. But Nurse Phillips, she said they've been picking and stealing. Don't be quiet. And keep them away from my apron. They're filthy. They may be filthy, but they got no sin on them. Leastways, I can't see none. Can you see sin on my hand, sister? Tell her you can't see oh, no oh, sin on my hand. Don't no, listen to me, Willie. She's down on me, she is. Why? Nothing of the kind. I never hurt her. I never hurt the littlest crawling thing. If I saw anyone hurting anything, Nurse Phillips, I'd crush him. So I would. I, I, I crush him and I, oh, I get crush away him from me. Get away. <laughs> Forget the words again, Willie. Uh, I, I, I lost them, sister. They're in your head. Think now, think carefully. To everything... To everything... Mm, uh, there is to everything a, a season. Season. And a time. Mm. Uh, and a, a time to every purpose. And, uh, 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 and under the heavens, a time to plant, a time to... Uh, <laughs> I lost it, sister, I lost it. What comes I, after planting? A, a, a time to... Yeah. yeah. A time to, to pluck up that which is to be planted. Yeah, though, that was the hard part. A, a time to you kill, the rest. and a time to heal. Go on. A time to break down, and a time to build up. I, 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 sorry, Sister Mary. Good boy, Willie. Sister, my hands clean the sin. There's fire dirt there, and, and, and that's metal polish. And, and I, I mean, are, are they... Yes, Willie. Proper clean. Proper clean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, could I uh, have the sweetest on the big brass box with the eagle on the top? Very hey, well, you know where they are. Uh, yes, sister. <laughs> I have asked you all to use gentleness and tact with that poor mind. I'm afraid tact is not Nurse Phillips' speciality. I told him his hands were filthy, which of course they were. I see you finished your supper, Nurse Brent. Will you go on duty now, please? Read the notes I've left about Mrs. Thomas. Read them carefully. We shall need your help. Yes, sister. 
Uh, one moment, nurse. Your hair is very soft and pretty, but while you are on duty, I think you should roll it back more neatly. Yes, sister. Thank you, sister. Nurse Phillips, I want you to remember you can always calm Willie with words, any words with colour in them, or even a verse. If you'll forgive my speaking bluntly, sister, I don't think he should be allowed so much freedom. He's so quickly roused. And with that mentality and his muscular strength, he could quite easily be very dangerous. That's for us to judge. He's probably better employed up here than at liberty in the village. But it's a question of... In this case, of tolerance. Tolerance undermines discipline. If you'll forgive my speaking bluntly in turn, nurse, I don't think you appreciate the borderline between discipline and severity. I... Uh... I'm sorry you're leaving us. You're an excellent nurse, and I'm sure you'll make your way in the profession. Only... If you could just realize humanity isn't ruled in straight lines, I think perhaps you would be happier. Thank you, sister. Will you excuse me? Run along, then. Nurse Phillips. Yes, sister. I don't mean to preach, you know. No, sister. There, Sister Josephine, goes the potential matron of a state institution. Mm. She'll run it most efficiently. With discipline. Discipline. Uh, it's a pity she's not staying. You wear them all down in time. Not at all. They merely come round to our way of thinking. <laughs> Look, I've brought down that tapestry we found in the old cupboard. Such a pity. I'm afraid it's past repairing. Sister Agnes will tackle it. Now sit you down by the fire. You've had no sleep for nearly two nights. Even you can't go on forever. You promised me to sit there for a quarter of an hour, oh. and then I'll take a bowl of hot onion soup to your room. That'll put heart into you. Your onion soup would put heart into a graven image. Good evening, Sister Mary. Ah, oh. oh, good, good evening, evening doctor. doctor. Uh, tell me, doctor, uh -huh. as a medical man, would you consider half an hour's rest a mortal sin? <laughs> I certainly should not. Then try convincing Sister Mary. That'll keep you busy. Well, that means you haven't been to bed since I left, Sister Mary. I've had all the rest I need. Ah, you've such a Spartan idea of your own needs. You can't go on giving yourself like this. I insist you rest. But, Doctor... No, that's an order, Matron. Yes, Doctor. Thank you. But aren't you making rather a late visit? I'm staying here ready. That dyke can't possibly hold. Apparently, we coped with the same thing 60 years ago. We can do it again now. <laughs> what you mean, sister, is that you'll cope and we shall follow. <laughs> well, I'm going to have a look at Mrs. Thomas. Very well, Doctor. Oh, good evening, Reverend Mother. I'm surprised to hear you feel so late, Doctor. I felt I must be on the spot in case the dyke comes down, Reverend Mother. Oh, Reverend Mother. No, don't get up, sister. I know you're off duty. I just wanted to check with you that we're ready for all emergencies. Yes, Reverend Mother. We've managed to clear those two large wards. We can put the men in one and the women and children in the other when they arrive. Good. They'll have to camp out for a little until we can get properly organised and they can keep control themselves. Sister Agnes is ready at the switchboard for messages. Uh, by the way, Willie's mother has come up. Their cottage is already gone, I'm afraid. Oh. She'll be very helpful. I expect you can find beds for them both? Yes, of course. You look tired. Very tired. I've been watching you for some weeks. When this weather clears, would you care to go into retreat for a little while? No, I, I would not. I'm sorry. If you wish to send me away... How long have you been here? Six years? Nearly seven. We've never had our hospital run so efficiently. No, I don't want to lose you. You're tired, and for the moment the world seems stronger than the spirit. It will pass. I'm sure it will pass. Thank you, Reverend Mother. If you want to rest later, it can be arranged. If you're happier working, as I think you are, the work is certainly to hand. Reverend Mother. Yes, Sister Josephine. Uh, Reverend Mother, there's a man wanting to speak to you. Uh, they're travelling from London by car, he and two women and a driver. They're cut off by the flood water. Will you bring them in, Sister? Uh, yes, Reverend Mother. Be ready with your onion soup. Yes, Reverend Mother. <laughs> you see, Sister Mary, no need to look out for work. Would you be so good as to give Sister Josephine a little assistance? Yes, Reverend Mother. Sister. Yes, Reverend Mother. We need you badly. Don't be too kind to me. I find a few things harder to fight than vanity. Would you be pleased to come this way? Good evening, madam. Good evening. Come in. 
You must be nearly drowned. I'm sorry to arrive like this, madam. But we're traveling to Norwich from London, and I'm afraid the car is waterlogged. Oh, we should have many people coming here to the high ground tonight. Uh, come to the fire. But I thought you had others with you. Yes. Two ladies. Ask them to come in. Come in, Miss Pierce. Good evening, madam. Good evening. Come in, both of you. Thank you. Oh, your friend, she looks positively exhausted. Are you ill, my dear? No, I'm not ill. Thank you. If I might sit by your fire... But certainly. Let me take your wet coat. Leave it, please. We're very grateful to you, madam. I hope we're not um, disorganizing things. Oh, not at all. One of our sisters is getting you something hot. Are you sure your friend uh, Madam, is... uh, could I have a word with you in private, if you please? I assure you we are quite private here. I think I ought to speak to you quite alone, madam, if you don't mind. Oh, very well. Will you come with me? Thank you. Oh, I'm going to take off my shoes and stockings. They're wet through. I should take yours off, too. You'll get a chill, Miss Kahn. That would be very inconvenient, wouldn't it? Think how the calendar would be thrown out. Oh, please, it won't help. In fact, the whole thing is very humorous, Pierce. A convent of all places. The holy woman is going to get an unpleasant shock in a few minutes. Your coat is soaked. Let me take it off. Take your hands off me, Pierce. I've told you that before. Don't be difficult, Miss Kahn. It's my privilege to be what I can while I can. And get away from me, please. There's plenty of space here. Get away, please. Mm, very well. I'll sit over by the table. I'm sorry to keep you waiting. You must be very chilled. I can recommend this very excellent soup. Oh, some of us think our cook has missed her vocation. It looks and smells wonderful. <laughs> it tastes better. Will your friend come to the table, or would she like it there by the fire? I'll take it to her. Uh, no, no, sit down and drink yours while it's nice and hot. Here you are, my dear. Why, that wet coat, you poor child. Do let me take your coat. Thank you. That's right. And your shoes, they're wet through. Won't you take them off? All right. Let me take them off for you. No, get up. Get up at once. But why? Well, get off your knees in front of me. Now, steady. Take a grip on yourself. Oh, leave me alone. Leave me alone. I beg your pardon, sister. She, she's a little upset. She must be ill. Well, she's not ill. Just, just take no notice. There must be something terribly wrong. She is She's neither ill nor insane. Believe me, sister, the best way you can help is to be normal. If you assure me... It is the only thing. Very well. My dear, won't you at least come back to the fire? Very well. And have some hot soup to warm you. Here you are. Thank you. That's better. Thank you for humoring me. Now, I'll see if I can find you both some slippers. You're very good, sister, but don't bother. As soon as we can, we must be on our way to Norwich. I'm afraid you won't get to Norwich tonight. It wouldn't be safe to try. Oh. The great dike may give way at any time, unless the men achieve a miracle of engineering. Then we might be here for some time. Some days, perhaps. Mm. You are right about the soup. My compliments to your cook. For what they were. Oh, she'd be delighted. Nothing pleases her more than to have her work appreciated. Life must be very calm and pleasant here. Yes. Out of the world and away from temptation. I believe that is the popular conception. How does it really work? In work. No doubt you're filled with a sense of spiritual well-being. But are you happy? Are you? Oh, God. Oh, won't you tell me what is wrong? Mr. Mary! Sister oh, Mary! Something's happened. Sister! Oh, excuse me. Sister, the big dike is gone. They just sent word. They're leaving the village. I got to ring oh, the great bell. Oh, Reverend you? Mother says to ring the warning bell. Willie, mm -hmm. come. I got to ring him loud and clear to warn the people. The floods be out! The floods be out! The floods be out! Can I do anything? No, we're prepared. Yes? Sister Agnes? Yes. Ring through to Norwich and let them know. What? Well, we all know what to do. Thank you. Miss Pierce, we can't get away tonight. We shall have to telephone. There's no outside communication. Oh? 
Reverend Mother, Sister Agnes has just told me the wires are down. We all know what we have to do, Sister. Sister, Sister Mary, can you come? The dyke's gone. They're bringing in the casualties. Of... Sarah! <laughs> now, now, oh, Miss Khan. Sarah Khan? Yes, that's my name. Does it mean anything to you? Think, Sister. Sarah Khan. You'll have to know, Sister. I'm afraid it will distress you. If she's to know, I'd like to tell her myself. No, no, come with us. There's a good girl. Be quiet. Sister Mary, my name is Sarah Khan. Three weeks ago, I was tried and convicted for the murder of my brother. We've just come back from London from hearing the appeal. It has been dismissed. Come in. Uh, shall I put this armchair opposite the other one, madam? Uh, no. Here, please, officer, by the desk. Yes, madam. Officer. Yes, madam. Please call me sister. I have specially asked for this office and the bedroom adjoining to be put at your disposal. Because I want to be in touch with Miss Conn, I may be able to bring her a little comfort. The Reverend Mother gave me to understand that. Is there anything I ought to know? You do realize, don't you, that Miss Khan mustn't be left. Either Miss Pierce or myself must be with her day and night. Yes, officer. You will have no objection to my being here when I'm off duty. Certainly not. Does anyone else come in here during the day? Dr. Jeffries. Oh. We'll take Miss Khan into the bedroom when he comes. You see, it's rather unfortunate. He was chief witness for the prosecution. I see. Anyway, I'm hoping it won't be more than a few days particularly if the telephones are repaired. Now, if you'll excuse me, sister. Officer. Oh, oh come yes, and sir. box your ears, Willie. Now, I will. Oh, dear. What's Willie done now, Martha? Oh, that boy of mine's got about himself since he come to work here, sister. I still think to the pity they wouldn't take him in the army. Well, I'm sure he'll make himself very useful at this difficult time. Ah, their bedroom's near about straight, sister. Willie's put up another bed for Miss Pierce. Oh, just a and moment, Martha, please. Will you come back in a moment? Oh, I, I'm sorry, sister. I, uh, I'll be, be in the bedroom, keeping an eye on that boy of mine. What is your opinion of the verdict, officer? The jury were only out for 15 minutes. I'm not asking you as an official. I'd rather you didn't ask me at all. You see, there are some you feel are the type for it, and others... Well, it's not so easy to believe... When all is said and done, only Almighty God ever knows the truth. He and one other, sister. One other? The prisoner. Ah. Excuse me, sister. It's all right, Martha. Oh, uh, thank you, sister. Martha, you were Miss Khan's housekeeper, weren't you? Ah, surely. Right from the time she come to the village to do them big wall paintings for the church. We were at the Grape House, the big cottage over to Denville, St. David. Mr. Fenning's old place, yes, I know. Mm, took a good lease of it, she did, along with the old barn next door. Willie fixed that up for her like it were a proper painting place. And did you get on with her? You never found her difficult? Nay, she's an artist, of course. Up like the rocket and down like the stick. But leave her be, and she mind her own business, and yours too. Sweet as any bird. Uh, we were fine till Mr. Jason come along. Mr. Jason? That was her brother? Yes. Well, we'd been settled about a month, and he walked in on us at breakfast one morning, all smiles and as cool as you please. Ah, vicious bad he was, and no mistake. I'd have said his death were a proper blessing if it hadn't been for poor Miss Carn. So you think she was responsible? Oh, I never said that, sister. And what's more, I never said it in court, neither. But by the time that lawyer gentleman had done asking me questions, you'd have thought I'd seen her do it with me own eyes and standing up there to tell him so. Sister, 
That were a terrible moment. Giving evidence? Nay. When the judge put on that little black cap and spoke them words. Do you know the words, sister? Yes, Martha, I do. Oh, I never looked up, sister. I never looked up till I knew they'd taken her away. You were called for the crown, Martha. You had to answer their questions. Uh, the lawyer gentleman said only to tell them what they asked and no more. Well, there was some things they never asked, so I never told them. Maybe there was something you should have told them. Oh, I don't suppose it were important. Just some funny words I overheard her say one night when he'd been rowing her worse than usual. Yes. She said... I should have thought that royal affair in Florida would have been a lesson to you. Oh, hmm, that's what she said. Sounded like he'd been playing round in higher circles than usual. Sister, I fixed them casters. Now then, big ears, don't stand idle. Get and fill that stove for sister. We can take another turn later. If you like, Pierce. That's Miss Sarah. Now, Willie. <laughs> Miss Sarah, <laughs> I'm not glad I papa missed you when you're coming back to the great house. Oh, now, Willie. Willie, you haven't had any sweets this morning. Get the brass box. Yes, sister. <laughs> I could just do one right now. One of them big green ones that tastes like cinnamon. <laughs> There's the dust I've been picking out. Willie. Would you like one too, Miss Sarah? Sister wouldn't mind. No, thank you. Take a little lump, Willie, and go with Martha. Yes, sister. Goodbye, Miss Sarah. I see you when I make up the stove. <laughs> Look. <laughs> I get two, three sweets when they stuck, see? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm that sorry, Miss Herrat. He just doesn't understand. Come on now, Willie, will you? Come on. I, I got three that time. Come I on, know. Willie. Are these your rooms? This one and the one through there? Yes, Miss Khan. And you've given them up to us. It's very comforting. With the warmth. And the flowers. I'm glad you like it. Spacious, too. One can move around. Whom do I know here besides Martha and Willie? Dr. Jeffries. Oh. Does he use this room? Occasionally. But if you'd rather... Oh, don't worry. I can go into the bedroom. Not having visitors for a couple of months has made me rather unsociable, hasn't it, Pierce? You could have had visitors. And flowers. No, thank you. The wrong atmosphere for both. Ah, oh, sister, have you got those slides with... Oh. oh, sorry, I, I, I didn't expect you... To see me here? Well, now you have. Don't be uncomfortable about it. I, uh, I would have come to see you at the... at Norwich. Only I told you I didn't want anyone. Oh, don't worry, there's no ill feeling. You did your best for me at the time. Is there anything else I can do? Uh, whoever your church committee gets to finish off my murals, for God's sake, don't let them daub those angels on the left with gold leaf. It will ruin everything. Right. Now, Pierce, I, I'd rather be in the bedroom. Yes, Miss Cowan. So, uh, you knew her before? Uh -huh. uh, I'm on the uh, church committee. When they decided to restore those murals on the south wall, I recommended Sarah Cowan because I'd seen and admired her work. It's good, then? Oh, first rate. She'd a picture in the academy the year before last. What was the subject? Well, uh, rather unfortunate in the light of later events. Death of Lucretia Borgia. So it was poison? Yes, it was. I don't know the details. Uh, then I shouldn't bother to find out, sister. But I... Have you by any chance those slides we made for tests? Uh, yes, Doctor. In uh -huh. the cupboard. Ah, thanks. Martha seems very concerned about Miss Kahn, Doctor. Just why are you so persistent? Because I want to know, and you're the one person who can tell me. What good can it do if you do know? If I'm ignorant of the facts, I may be tactless with every word I say. True enough. Very well. Where shall I begin? At the beginning. Well, uh, have you ever heard of, of David Kingham? Kingham? Um, 
Wait a minute. The right-hand politician, isn't he quite a coming man? Not now. He was so prominent in this case and fought for her so desperately that it's bound to have prejudiced his position. But why was he dragged into it? He and Sarrett were to have been married. Oh. He was away on a government mission for six months, and she wanted to finish the murals in our church before he returned. The trouble began when her brother Jason turned up out of the blue and settled at the grape house. If ever there was a rotten, corrupt swine, it was Jason Kahn. He was a confirmed alcoholic. Poor man. Poor. Sarah kept him for years. Well, some weeks after he arrived, he collapsed suddenly, and no wonder. A stroke? Yes, I'd warned him, but he was seldom sober enough to listen. He recovered his mental powers slowly, but he was partially paralyzed. Just punishment enough. Except that Sarah took the strain. Could he have been put in an institution? An inebriate home, oh, yes. But these things take time. And one day, Sarah called me into the dining room and asked me frankly just how long he would live. Martha was in the room at the time. She remembers the conversation. The tragic thing is that these people drag on for years. Or, as I told her, die quietly in their sleep. She said she was desperate. Her work was suffering and that she'd written to Kingham, postponing her marriage. But why do that? Well, she rightly felt she couldn't saddle him with the responsibility of Jason. Of course, Kingham would have helped her, but she's very proud. So I've been told. Well, I promised I would try and arrange to get him into an institution, but I warned her such a life might affect Jason's sanity. I remember so well what she said. Yes? She said, while he's well, he's on my hands. And while he's ill, he's on my conscience. A terrible responsibility for the poor girl. I was able to ease her nights for her. We kept him under drugs. It was the only way to bring relief to either of them. No night nurse? No, not necessarily. The day nurse left at six. At eight, Sarah gave him the drug. One tablet each night. No need for details. It was a narcotic, of course. One of the barbiturates put up in tablet form. Three weeks' supply was ordered at a time. That is, 21 tablets packed singly in a small glass vial. Where did they come from? Every three weeks, I collected these 21 tablets from Abel Harmer, the village chemist. We checked the number into the vial, sealed it, and I delivered it to Sarah personally. I warned her not to give more than one tablet in 24 hours. I begin to understand. At the end of November, I went to Norwich for three weeks' vacation. I delivered the usual file the day I left. Twenty-one tablets? Yes. Four days later, Dr. Giles, my locum, telephoned me to say Jason had been found dead that morning. Will it shock you if I admit my first reaction was one of overwhelming relief? I think I might have felt the same. Until Giles told me that from the evidence of vomiting and so on, he suspected an overdose of the drug. So he checked the tablets in the file. Now listen carefully, I no, no, wait a minute. Uh, have you got something? Ah, yes. Yes, this box of sweets will do. Uh, here it is, sister. Uh, 10, uh, 12, uh, 18, 21. 21 tablets. Now, one a night for four nights. How many left? Four from 21, 17. There were 17 tablets left in the fire. But I don't see. Neither Giles nor I could understand it either. So I took it on myself to get those 17 tablets analysed. And they found? Fifteen were correct. The remaining two were harmless aspirin. The police found a half-empty bottle of aspirin in Sarah's room. And Jason had had three sleeping tablets that night instead of one. Exactly. Now do you see why I don't want to be reminded of it all? But couldn't Jason have taken them himself, um... Suicide and arrange things? He was paralyzed. Oh, yes, of course. And as I told you, Martha had been in and out of the room that time that Sarah spoke to me. At the inquest, they got that damning conversation out of her practically word for word. But this doesn't make sense. Miss Khan's a highly intelligent woman. She would have known you'd suspect an overdose and analyze the fire. Sister, if you had no medical knowledge and gave someone an overdose of a narcotic... How would you expect them to die? Oh, I don't know. I suppose quietly in their sleep. Mm -hmm. And I told her he might die that way. Yes, you did. I'd forgotten that. The prosecution didn't, I assure you. In fact, the defense wanted her to admit to a mercy killing, but she flatly refused. Mm -hmm. 
Well, now you must forgive me if I push off. Oh, very well, Doctor. I shall be around somewhere if you want me. Dr. Jeffries has gone now. Bess has an idea she'd like to explore your bookcase. It's a bit dull for her. You played cards at first, but it's rather poor. Do have whatever you want. Those on the top shelf are mostly textbooks, but there's some fiction lower down. Mm. Thank you, sister. Miss Kahn, will you tell me something and forgive me for asking? Ah, surely. <laughs> Why wouldn't you let counsel plead a mercy killing? I'll answer you as I answered him. Because although I had often wished Jason dead, I had never felt called upon to do anything about it. Sufficient? Completely. Thank you. Good. Isn't this the tapestry you had in the hall? Yes, it's very old. We discovered it hidden away some weeks ago. Sister Agnes was going to try and repair it, but... I'm afraid it's beyond her. If she's a good needlewoman, I don't see why. The design is lost. Well, how do you mean? Uh, may I take it to the window? Yes. Oh, I see. The pattern doesn't occur. Oh, what a pity. Oh, it's magnificently done. Look at the exquisite stitches. A reverend mother wanted it restored for the chapel, but we couldn't do it unless Sister Agnes had something to work from. What we need is an artist. You mean? Mm. Oh, no, sister. There isn't time. Would it take so long? No, sister. You see? A piece of plain canvas to back the missing strip with the design outlined, even roughly. I'd need materials. Colors. Oh, I'm sure we could supply most of them. Oh, no, sister. I can't. Besides. It would have to be on a proper frame. We might even have that. Sister Agnes teaches needlework. And think what we'd have to remember you by. Remember me? That would be wonderful. Every time anyone looked at it, and on the chapel wall of all places, what would they say? See that embroidery? Do you know who designed it? Sarat Khan, the murderer. The artist. Because it might be there for generations. And only the beauty would be remembered. Have you something I can measure with? Will this steel tape do? <laughs> Thank you. Now, we'll have to allow here and there for overlap. Mm -hmm. Say, ooh, two feet. No, 18 inches would do. Oh. And here again, two feet, three. Have you a pencil and paper, sister? Here you are. I've brought some coffee for Miss Carl and Miss Pierce. Thank you, Sister Josephine. Uh, it's good of you, Sister. Thank you. Uh, may we have it in the bedroom? Certainly. We'll spread the tapestry on the beds. It'll be easier. If you want to help me, Pierce, I'll be grateful. Yes, Miss Carr. If we get that far, I might even let you mix the colours, Pierce. Drink this coffee up while it's hot now. Thank you so much, Sister. I wondered why that tapestry was brought up here from the hall. Sit down, Sister Josephine. Mm -hmm. I need your help. Oh, well, that's a reversal of normal procedure, I must say. I've been talking to Miss Kahn. Poor desolate soul. Nothing of the kind. Oh? She's a brilliant, sensitive woman. And from the moment I saw her, something passed between us. It was as if her tragedy, her agony of mind, entered into me. Oh, no, that was only because... Because I know she is no more guilty of this crime than I am myself. You can't possibly do anything. Don't, sister. I must. It's as if I were... Driven from within. But, but you're at such a disadvantage. I begin with one great advantage. A complete conviction of her innocence. Oh, what could you do against the whole process of the law? I want every possible detail of the trial. Somewhere there's a link. A little flaw. That's why I need you. Me? Those piles of newspaper you're always hoarding. Oh. Find me every scrap dated ah, January, particularly the local but, but paper. But I may have used them at three weeks ago. Go and look, Sister Josephine. Very well. It's a blessing I'm methodical. It won't take a second, provided they're there. The cupboard's just outside. But don't break your heart if they're not there. Uh. Oh, uh, Sister Agnes, could we lay hands on some of the old school materials? Uh, no, poster paints for preference. Oh, good. Yes, urgently. 
Miss Kahn is going to do the design for your tapestry. Yes, I have a list. I knew you'd help. Oh, that would be wonderful. And have we a tapestry frame? Well, Willie can mend it. He's an excellent carpenter. Thank you, sister. There's organization for you. Two bundles. Oh. Here, now, you take the London one and I'll take the local. This is wonderful, Sister Josephine. Now, December, December, January. Here we are. First, seven. No, no, nothing here. January the 14th. This is it. Let's have a look. The case against Sarah Khan. Trial of noted artist opens at Assizes. Where's the local paper for January the 21st? We must have that. The summing up's bound to be practically verbatim. Uh, oh, it's not here, I'm afraid. It must be. It has to be. Why should that particular issue be lost or destroyed? Think, Sister Josephine, think. January, now, what happened here in January? Uh, I did all the cupboards, the linen cupboards uh, for the new year. Uh, we did your cupboard, that one there. Quickly. Now... Now, what have we got lying on the shelves? Uh, now, it's a local paper right enough. Though I don't remember using it here. You see, December, October previous, and December. Oh, it's not here. Oh. Then we must think again. Sister Mary, this parcel. Look at the paper oh. on it. January the 21st. Oh. Sister Josephine, what should I do without you? Bless your busy heart. Unwrap it quickly. Going to be a party in the big hall tonight, Miss Sarah. <laughs> Reverend Mother said so for us and the refugees. <laughs> Will it... Give me a dance like that time in the church hall when you're doing them big pictures. I'm sorry, Willie, but I won't be coming. Give me that paintbrush, will you? Oh. Thank you. Well, not coming? Well, Ted Newlands is fixing the wireless gramophone for real music. That's oh. enough, boy. You go along and help Newlands. Right smart with his hands, that Ted is, Miss Sarah. He was saying he might even get the telephone wires mended soon, <laughs> maybe tomorrow. Telephone? Downstairs, Willie, and jump to it. All right, then, since you be so sharp. Willie! <laughs> yes, sister? Will you take a message to Sister Josephine for me? Listen carefully now. Say I would like one of her special caramel custards, the ones with the cream on top, for Mrs. Grimes. Can you remember? Caramel custards with cream on top. Ah, surely. I know. Proper tasty. Thank you, Willie. You're very helpful. Uh, proper tasty, there you are. I'm sorry, Miss Khan. I'll tell him he's not to come up here again. And he's the one person who's at ease with me. Might sharpen that pencil, would you please? Hmm? What's this about the telephone? Just talk, I shouldn't wonder. If, by the grace of God and the genius of Ted Newlands, it is fixed, I suppose you'll get through to the governor. Miss Khan, you do realize this situation must end soon. We've already been here 24 hours. Yes, I realize. Uh, by the way, not too fine a point for this canvas, please. This do? Hmm, admirably. Thank you very much. Your work on the tapestry certainly does grow. I find things do when one is pressed for time. Not so pressed you can't take a little exercise. You've been working solidly all day. We might go up to the top of the tower again and have a look at the floods before it gets dark. I wonder you're not afraid I'll jump off. I'll have to risk that, won't I? Very well, then, if I must. Oh, sister, can you let me have a length of gauze? It's uh, only for my bag. Certainly, Doctor. I've got some in the cupboard. They're short of it in surgery. Fortunately, we've got a good stock of this gauze. You can have as much as you like. What? Oh, uh, thank you, sister. 
I was just admiring the work on that tapestry. Miss Khan has a great feeling for colour. Yes. Let's hope this doesn't remain like the murals, unfinished. I have a feeling they may both be finished. Oh? Huh? Sister, surely you're not still trying to convince yourself. Perhaps something is trying to convince me. How much gauze do you want to hear? Mm, oh, a little more, if you can spare it. Yes, just like that. Thank you. You think I'm still taking too personal an interest? I do think it's a pity to cause yourself so much mental distress. What causes me real distress of mind is the way everyone is accepting the situation. Sister, has it occurred to you that instead of developing these... Well, these fantastic ideas, you might be of some practical if use? If only I could. There you are. I'll just roll this piece up. Uh, I'll do that while you put the other away. Very well. I, uh... I suppose Sarah hasn't mentioned David Kingham to you. Uh, no. Since the uh, verdict, she's refused to see him or even write. Why? She maintains she's ruined things for him, socially, politically, and in every way. Oh, I can understand how she feels, especially if she loves him. It's ridiculous. Stubborn to the point of madness. Sister Sarah will listen to you. Will you try and persuade her to see him before attitude is causing them both unnecessary suffering. It's a very delicate and personal matter. I can't promise. You must leave it to me. Gladly. But do your best. For God's sake. You feel very deeply about this case, don't you? If only I hadn't taken that damn vacation in Norwich. If only I'd been on the spot instead of Giles. Excuse me. Mr. Bonaventure? Yes, he's here. One moment. Doctor, it's for you. Oh. Uh, hello? Yes, Vicky? What? Oh, all right, I'll come. Uh, they want me to look at the Grimes baby. I'll come. No, no, no. I'll ring down if I need you. Uh, doctor, if you hadn't been in Norwich when Jason died, would there have been a post-mortem? No. No, I would have signed a death certificate in any circumstances. Oh, oh. leaving me. I'm sorry, sorry, Doctor. Sorry. Didn't see you. Oh, well, well, he's energetic tonight. Yes, he's been called up to the Grimes' baby. And I see you're still going through the records of the trial. They're all together in this clip. The evidence is so damning it frightens me. How did Jason take those two extra tablets? Well, could they not have been put in his food? No, that was established from the first... Sarah has never denied giving him the usual dose at eight o'clock. Remember, he couldn't have reached the fire himself. And Sarah was alone with him all that night. Aye. Listen to this. This is the counsel for the defense. Members of the jury, you are asked by the prosecution to accept the fact that this woman deliberately and with malice or forethought administered an overdose of tablets. Yet the accused neglects the simple precaution of acquainting herself with the symptoms of such an overdose. You are asked to believe this extraordinary oversight on the part of an extraordinary intelligent woman. I submit to you that the idea is preposterous. Well, there's the man of sense. Now this cutting. This is the prosecution. My learned friend has pointed out what he calls an extraordinary oversight on the part of an intelligent woman. The prosecution is concerned with plain facts, and the plain facts are these. Sarat Khan had every reason to desire her brother's death. She had the means to hand, and from the time the undoubtedly fatal dose was administered at eight o'clock, no one visited the house until the arrival of Martha Pentridge next morning. <sighs> Another man of sense. And you think you're going to beat them both? The impossible takes a wee while longer, Mr... What's it going to do to you if you fail? I daren't fail. Never in my whole religious life have I needed a sign from heaven more desperately than I do now. I daren't fail. And I can't waste precious time. Night Sister is waiting for her reports. I must put the cuttings away in this drawer. I ought not to have left them on my desk. My word, there's a gale up on that tower. <laughs> I didn't realize we were at such a height. Not been up there for years. What's the view like these days? A waste of waters. 
Nothing else for miles. It looks very desolate and yet very beautiful. Worst floods in living memory, I should think. Aye, so they say. Well, I can't stand here, Blethers. Oh, neither can I. I must go and find night, sister. I'll go down to tea now, Miss Pierce. Right, Mr. Melling. Then you might like to go off till 10.30. Why not look in at the party? I might. Do you good. Newlands will be there, too. Oh, isn't their organisation incredible? Masses of people packed in, supplies stacked everywhere, the hospital full, and yet they arrange a party and allow the nurses to join in. It's the woman behind it all I find so incredible. Mm. Oh, shout when you come back. Right. Yeah, I like the music. I was always fond of a good tune. Yes, I, I'd like a walk. Oh. Yes, Miss Khan. In here, Brent. Phillips, you shouldn't. We oughtn't to be here. We've got to give Willie the slip. But this is Sister Mary's room. That doesn't make it sacred. It's certainly comfortable. I thought they had to forswear physical ease. Ah, uh-huh. so there you, Venus Phillips. <laughs> yeah. Open that door at once and stop following me everywhere, will you? Nurse Phillips, why do you hate me so much? I don't hate you. But you do. Every time I smash speed, every time you pass me, I know you do. And Sister Mary, she say, tis wrong to hate people. Sister Mary, I might have known. Open that door at once. No. No. Get away from me. Get away! Brent! Brent, don't leave me! Come back! I only want to be friends. Honest. I, I wouldn't hurt eh? I wouldn't hurt anyone. Oh, take your filthy hands off me! That's in the book Sister Reads. Something about if thy neighbour hate thee. But I don't hate you. You can't get the simplest thing right. There ain't no need to be frightened. I'm <sighs> strong right enough, but I'm gentle. I, I'm real gentle. Oh, stop it! Stop it, do you hear? No, don't eat. Don't <laughs> struggle. No, I, I'm going to give you a lovely kiss. <laughs> You hard witted beast! <laughs> Willie! Better go downstairs, Willie. Really. Well, but, 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 sister, I, I don't mean no harm. I know, Willie. Really. I'll see to it. Go along downstairs. Oh, but, you were like you said. I, I, I wanted to be friends, sister. Yes, all uh, right. Uh, Run along uh, now. I, I only wanted to be friends. I'm very sorry, Nurse Phillips. You're not hurt, are you? My God, he's got no right to be here. He'll injure someone, and when he does, it'll be your fault. Miss Khan, come back. You'll trade on your habit, standing there so calm and saintly. You're nothing but a fiend. How dare you? How dare you? Now, Miss Khan, if you please. Come along now, come along to the bedroom. How dare you? How dare you? Let me help you up, nurse. Touch me. Now, please go up to your room and wait there till I come. I'll do nothing of the sort. I'll... You are under my authority, nurse. You will do exactly as I say. Very well. But first, I'm going to see Reverend Mother. It's time she knew about you and your fine ideas. Sister Mary. Yes, Miss Khan. Come in. I want to say I'm sorry. So very sorry. You mustn't blame Nurse Phillips. She was badly frightened. I'm used to Willie, and I forget that other people are not. But to speak to you like that... Don't distress yourself. Perhaps you would like to try and rest until after supper and then go on with your work. Yes, Sister Mary. Poor, unhappy child. No, I cannot let her go like that. Sister Mary, I just heard a very hurried and almost incredible account of events here. I should like to ask if this is correct. I have never found Nurse Phillips untruthful, Reverend Mother. She has been sent to her room. Until she leaves, it might be advisable to give her only light duties. And perhaps Willie should not be allowed so much freedom. For a little while, at any rate. I feel that is a pity. So do I, sister. But this is a dreadful thing altogether and is going to reflect on all of us. I now have to speak against my personal inclinations... I want you to understand and bear with me. 
Yes, Reverend Mother. Sister, you asked me to let you be in contact with Miss Kahn. Against my better judgment, I allowed it. But you were asked by myself and the warders not to raise unreasonable hopes. I assure you, I have not mentioned anything to her. You have raised your own hopes and allowed yourself to be carried away by personal emotion. Isn't that true? I suppose it is. Hasn't it occurred to you that matters reach a stage when they are in other and greater hands than ours? Reverend Mother, can you possibly reconcile the fact that any god of any creed... Please. I repeat, of any creed, could permit such a cruel and terrible matter as this? Everything possible has been done in scrupulous fairness. I cannot agree. So you place yourself above the highest legal wisdom. Which is secular in approach and reasoning. I see. You feel you are in some manner blessed in your reasoning? I wouldn't presume so far as that. I only know that never in my whole life have I been filled with such strong, such complete conviction. Then you must destroy it. How? I can only suggest by faith and prayer. Remember, the whole foundation of our training is to accept. Blindly? We enter this life to do the work of God. We learn to subdue our bodies by labor and submit our wills to higher direction. I cannot think we should also subdue our intelligence. Even intelligence cannot always recognize divine intention. I will not believe this is divine intention. If it should be, then I have no use for such a doctor. Sister Mary, you cannot make that kind of bargain. Let me see those newspaper reports of the trial. So she told you that? I know about them. Where are they? In this drawer. Why are you so proud and obstinate? You are privileged to handle many lives, but you're not permitted to pass judgment. Here are the cuttings. So you think Miss Kahn was responsible? I think there is nothing we can do to save Miss Kahn. But I know I must try to save you from yourself. Take the cuttings and drop them into the stove. Oh, no! It's her life! Reverend Mother, her life may be in them. It is the best way, sister. Please, I beg of you, don't ask me. As your spiritual superior, I order you. Oh, I can't. Oh, I can't. I can't. We have heard a great deal about discipline, sister. But ours is a discipline of the spirit. Very well, then. I must burn them myself. Oh. Try to forgive me, Sister Mary. Sister Bonaventure? Yes? He's here. Yes, certainly. Newlands wants you downstairs, officer. Uh, thank you, sister. Uh, I won't be long, Miss Pierce. I'll be here, Mr. Melling. How are you getting on, sir? What a lot you've done on that tapestry since yesterday. Sister Agnes is getting most enthusiastic about starting the embroidery. I should like to see it completed, sister. I've not finished my part yet. You will. How quick and sure your strokes are. It must be wonderful to be creative. Sometimes it's hell. Things just won't work out. And sometimes everything goes perfectly, and you feel your God. The newspaper report said you sketched every day throughout the trial. Mm, I must have drawn everything in sight. The judge, counsel, even the ushers. The trouble was, they all kept getting the same face. Whose? Jason's. Was he so much in your mind? I couldn't help thinking how he'd have enjoyed the situation. He could draw too, you know. The facile, showy way. He couldn't be bothered to learn properly. Poor devil. Made such a mess of his life. Things might have been so different. He made your life intensely unhappy, yet you have this... this depth of pity for him. People can't help the way they're made, can they? Poor Jason had some grim interludes. Such as the royal case in Florida. Who on earth told you that? No one knew. Martha overheard you talking. The words stuck in her mind. Martha? 
Would it distress you to tell me? No. About eight years ago, I was working on a commission in Florida. Jason followed me, as usual. He got mixed up with a girl called Bee Royal. Ah. Oh. When he let her down, as he always let everyone down, she gassed herself. Was there trouble afterwards? Jason didn't even appear at the inquest. She wrote him a pathetic, raving letter. But she also sent one to the coroner, saying she made no charges against anyone, but that the person concerned would be haunted by his conscience for the rest of his life. She didn't know Jason. I wouldn't have known much about it myself, but she sent me a letter too. Why you? She seemed to think we were of one blood and therefore one character. Actually, I only met her twice. A man of his temperament, Jason knew how to be discreet. Oh, let's talk about something else, shall we? What are you making? A christening robe for the Grimes's baby. Poor Mrs. Grimes is so bewildered at having a boy that she hasn't the slightest idea what to call him. <laughs> Any suggestions? Personally, I prefer plain names. John or Charles would be nice. What's your choice? I, uh, rather like David. You've been asked to approach me, haven't you? Yes. And how do you feel about it? I'm divided between my desire to help you and my equally strong opinion that it's your own personal business. Oh, I wish I'd had you to talk to in the beginning. Talk to me now, Sarah. Why won't you see David Kingham or write to him? Oh, haven't I done enough? His career is spoilt. Probably the rest of his life affected just because he knew me. I'm sure he doesn't see it in that way. If you met just once... No, I, I couldn't bear it. If you must torment yourself, need you do it to him also? Well, he'll forget. Men do. Yes, they do. But women go on remembering. I hope he won't forget everything. I suppose everyone imagines her own love affair to be the most wonderful thing that ever happened. I know mine was. We were so mentally complete. Our minds struck sparks. Mm. I've lived it over and over again since. Particularly the little idiotic things. You know. I know. Uh, Miss Pierce, mm -hmm. I'd like a word with you over here, please. Ah, now, officer, we can't have you making overtures to Miss Pierce while you're on duty. Is there much more to do, Miss Kahn? Uh, not very much. Uh, why do you ask? Now, Miss Kahn... Why do you ask? I thought you'd like to finish, if you could. You've been very cooperative so far. For God's sake, come to the point. Newland has made some sort of connection with the telephone wires. We contacted a nearby house and finally nodded. I've spoken to the governor. They're sending out a police launch. I should say maybe another three hours. Thank you, officer. Uh, could you and Miss Pierce give me a few minutes to assist her? Quite alone. We'll go out of hearing. I'm afraid we can't go out of sight. Now come along into the other room, Miss Pierce. All right. Well, it had to come, of course. We knew that. Sarah. Would you let me be with you? You can do that without leaving here. Yes, if you wish it. I've been lucky to get this peaceful interval. I've had vastly different surroundings. I, I, I've, I've completed a piece of work which I think is good. I've known you. Believe me, that means a great deal. Thank you. I'll ask Pierce to let you know. Then if you want to pray or anything... Oh, God! I Oh, my child. My dear child. Hold on to me, that's right. There's something the chaplain reads, isn't there? I would only see him once. But he did tell me. And the words were like a roll of drums. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life, saith the Lord. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall... Go oh, on. Yet shall he live. And he that liveth and believeth in me 
shall never die. It is like a roll of drums. I've never been religious. You mean you've never troubled about the accepted form? Mm, and I don't want them now. If this has to happen, why can't they just be businesslike and get it over? It is thought we need intercession. Dear Sister Mary, what is it? I would give anything to help you at this moment. But how can I when I'm full of doubts as yourself? You could make a pretense. You could offer prayers and platitudes. Instead, you give me this complete honesty. Oh, sir. Do you know what I've been afraid of all along? Of losing the only thing left to me. My personal self-respect. My pride. Is that wrong? No. To go to pieces at the last moment. Disintegrate. The others are scared of that too. Melling, Pierce, even the governor. Well, they don't mention it, but each knows it's in the other's mind. Sir, you have so much courage. Don't be afraid anymore. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Since I've known and talked to you, I don't think I shall be afraid. Only... <laughs> Only stay with me till we leave. Please. I will. Oh, I must get on. Your hands are shaking. You can't possibly work. Officer. Yes, sister? Uh, Miss Kern would like to finish her painting. With your permission, I'm going to ask Dr. Jeffries to give her a sedative. Uh, would you like me to go and find him? If you would be so kind. Right, sister. I expect he's in his room. How do you feel now, Miss Kahn? What you and I need, Pierce, is a large brandy and soda. We'll go into the bedroom, shall we? Very well. Oh, I had to come. Is it right what they say? Do you mean, is she going back, Sister I... Josephine? Well, when? Well, they think in perhaps three hours. I'm sorry to fetch you down like this, Doctor. That's all right, Billy. I'm really surprised she hasn't broken down before. Has she broken down? No, she has more courage than we have. And in her own way, more faith. Oh, we, what we ought to do is put her right out for 24 hours. But she insists on finishing that confounded painting. Damn, I'm out of Fina Barbiton. Got any in your cupboard, sister? Yes, Doctor. Bring it in to me, will you please? Yes, Doctor. Fancy carrying an empty bottle around with him. Here, put this full one in his bag. Right. I'll take the other in to him. Goodness, the clutter the man carries about with him. It's a good thing I don't carry the tools of my trade. A fine sight I'd look with a couple of saucepans and my iron-bottomed frying pan. Oh, there's gauze mixed up with bottles and instruments. You just can't resist tidying people up, can you? <laughs> this gauze has got paint on it. It must have come off the desk when I took it out of the bag. I'd better cut off the end. Oh, mercy. Look what's fallen out of it. That's a cutting from the newspaper. Quickly. Put everything back into the bag. Wait. Uh, give me a newspaper. A any newspaper. Hurry. Hurry. That's it. Now, we'll put this back in the gauze in place of the other cutting. That's it. And now close the bag, sister. But, but what was it doing in his bag? I don't know. Wait a minute. He asked me for that gauze yesterday. The cuttings were on my desk when he folded it. Aye. Uh, he caught that one up and put it in the bag by accident. I suppose so. And yet, I had all the cuttings in a spring clip. I remember, I was at the cupboard. I turned round and he was standing here with the file in his hand, fiddling with the clip. He could have taken it off. Not by chance. He'd need to do more than fiddle. Then he must have meant to take it. What, well, perhaps it's not one of yours. Yes. Look, there's the mark of the clip. Sister Josephine, just what does this mean? It means they didn't want you to study that one too closely. Which one is it? Uh, it's the report of his cross-examination. All my cuttings were burnt, or so I thought. There was nothing I could do but resign myself. 
And now, by some utterly unlooked-for incident, this is returned to me. Now, do you think you should hurry yourself all over again? It, it might be coincidence. Perhaps I've been working in the wrong direction. Perhaps this is an indication of the right one. But why should he bother to take one when, when the whole lot went into the stove together? He didn't know that would happen. It was Nurse Phillips who told the Reverend Mother about the cuttings. Who said she did? Why, no one. But she must have done. But when did she ever see them? They weren't in the desk last night. You put them in the drawer before Phillips came in. Yes. Who else knew besides you and me? The doctor. But surely he's done everything to help Sarat. Yes. And you've forgotten, haven't you, when it all happened, he was in Norwich. Aye, there's no getting over that. I want to think. Let me read this through thoroughly. No, I'll put it under the blotter till he goes. There. You know, sister, I may be wrong, but I feel as though... I've given her a grain and a half, sister. You'll let her have a warm drink in about an hour? Yes, doctor. What reason would he have for telling the Reverend Mother about the cuttings? Could it have been Willie? Willie? Oh, no, the poor lad. He couldn't read a newspaper well enough to know what it meant. All he worries about in here is whether the sweetness are sticky enough to give him two or three in one. Sister Josephine. What is it, sister? Quickly. I must read the cutting again. Sister Josephine. I must have been very stupid. Why, how nice and tidy the hall looks. We are nearly straight again, thanks to you, officer, and Mr. Newland. It's the least we can do for you, madam. Especially in the circumstances. By the way, the governor will be communicating with you, but when I spoke to him, he mentioned the question of any payment or, or donation. No, officer. It is our work to help you. Your people will be here any moment? Yes. The doctor's coming with us, just as a precaution. I think you were wise to suggest it. It was Sister Mary's idea. Oh. And she also suggested we might wait here in the hall for the last half hour. Easier to get out. The last moments may be awkward. The water's still pretty high. I think we shall get into that lodge without a ducking, officer. I've told them to try round where the main gate would be. Then we can more or less step down from the cloisters. I hope you're right. Good evening, Reverend Mother. Good evening, Doctor. Oh, please, uh, please, uh, Reverend Mother. If it's not important, Martha, I should prefer you to wait. Well, you see, tis that awkward about Miss Carr. Yes. Tis Willie. He knows she's going and he's got some flowers for her. And nothing will suit him but to give them himself. Come here, Willie. Yes, Mum? Your mother tells me those flowers are for Miss Khan. For Miss Sarah, Mum. Yeah, but they won't let me give them. Oh, here she is with Sister Mary. Miss Sarah, may I, Reverend Mother? All right, Willie. <sighs> Miss Sarrett, I thought you'd like these snowdrops. Uh, I've been growing an in kitchen window box, but Sister Josephine said I could pick them. Oh, uh, Willie. Mm. Uh, no, they got no smell, Miss Sarrett. Only just fresh and clean like. Miss... Miss Khan's very pleased. But we've got things to do. Say goodbye now, there's a good lad. Oh, goodbye, Miss Sarrett. That'll be strange at the grape house without you sitting painting them big pictures. Willie? Yeah, Miss Sarah? Won't you shake hands with me? Oh, they, they, they're not very clean, Miss. Oh. <laughs> oh, thank you. Goodbye, Willie. G goodbye, Miss Sarah. That's right, that's right. God be with you, my child. Now, come along, Willie. Perhaps we should... Not a very good conversational effort, gentlemen. But thank you for trying. You know, now that that design is finished, I feel strange with no brush and pencil. Uh, cigarette? Uh, not now, thanks. Well, I must go on with my sewing. Miss Pierce, in the sideboard drawer, you'll find a pack of cards. The night nurses keep them there for slack intervals. Yes, sister. Uh... Oh, here they are. That's right. Give them to Miss Kahn. The night nurses think I don't know and I don't say anything because they'd only have to find another hiding place. It wouldn't surprise me to hear you'd taken a hand with them. 
Would it surprise you to know I used to play a very good hand at bridge? Not in the least. <laughs> Knave, queen, king. Didn't someone once say, all the human passions on bits of pasteboard? One doesn't imagine human passions quite so flat and abstract. No, considering the havoc they make of our lives. You know, we come in contact with much that is strange and disturbing. I myself was once shown most vividly just how far jealousy and frustration could go. Tell us about it. Don't you think we might talk about something, well, less... The weather, the floods, the politics? No, I'd like to listen to Sister. It's the oldest story in the world. The love of a man for a woman. A good woman, I hope. At the worst, a weak one. Through the influence of another man, she died. And the first man, who must have loved her dearly, allowed his grief and bitterness to drive him beyond normal control. He killed himself. He killed the other man. And then the law killed him, legally. Well, 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 how just and merciful. It's certainly an old story. We've heard it often enough, haven't we, Miss Pierce? Yes, Mr. Mary. It has an unusual ending. You see, the law didn't know. You mean he got away with it? He must have been very clever. He'd planned so carefully, detail by detail. I think he'd forgotten everything but his obsession for revenge. Uh, Miss Khan, what about three-handed whist? Don't sidetrack, officer. I want to hear the end. Probably a criminal lunatic asylum. If his guilt could be proved. Why couldn't it? The law can prove anything. I learned that at the assizes. Now, please, Miss Khan. Sister, what makes you think this man so, so safe? Obviously. He has the finest possible defense. And what would that be? A perfect alibi. No. A perfect alibi means perfect innocence. I see you are a purist, officer. Dr. Jeffries should have said, unshakable, not perfect. Ah. Huh. The murderer was some miles away when the crime was committed. Oh, impossible. A mine may be exploded from a distance. Murder by remote control. Was this man by any chance a scientist? A specialist in his own profession. Sister. Oh, officer, how about going up to the tower, having a look out? I could do it with a breath of air. Good idea, sir. Uh, Miss Khan, would you care... Oh! <coughs> the scissors. Oh, you cut your hand. Oh, it's only a scratch. Have you some plaster in your case, Doctor? Yes, yes, of course. Mm, it's a nasty deep cut. Yeah, let me see. Oh, no, no, nothing very much. I'll just cover it with surgical tape. What a lot of things in your bag, Doctor. Uh, please keep still, sister. Isn't this the plaster? Oh, chemist sealing tape. Abel Harmer. That's the chemist in the village, isn't it? The one who made up the prescription for Miss Khan's brother? Yes. Uh, keep your hand still, sister. I think you told me you collected the tablets once every three weeks, checked them with Harmer, and took them to Miss Khan. You're not being very kind or tactful to mention it, are you? Uh, pass me the scissors, please. If you mean on my account. I'm past caring. Why do you ask, sister? Because I know how careful one must be with drugs. A five-grain barbiturate tablet may bear a fatal resemblance to a five-grain tablet of aspirin. Thank you, Doctor. That's comfortable. I use the word fatal advisedly. Oh, officer, I do think we should ask sister to stop this discussion, or as a medical man, I can't answer for Miss Khan's reactions. My reaction at the moment is avid curiosity. I wish you'd been a little more curious about that last file of tablets. It is just possible that one, the fourth, may have been a fraction larger than the others. Oh, why should that fourth tablet have been larger? Because I think it contained the equivalent of three ordinary ones. Sister, you're talking absolute nonsense. In other words, the necessary overdose could have been put into one tablet. You see? Two or three in one, like Willie's Sweets. The tablets were packed singly in a glass file. According to its position, the overdose would be given on a certain day during 21 days. 21 days during which the person who had prepared that overdose could be any distance away. Officer, for heaven's sake. Sarat, who first brought you down to Denzel St. David? The murals for the church. Dr. Jeffrey. Who prescribed those tablets and delivered them to you? Dr. Jeff, who actually suggested those tablets should be analysed? Doctor... I won't stand by and listen to this. Sister, one moment. Are you making definite accusations against Dr. Jeffries? I'm asking you to place certain information in the proper quarter for consideration. But, officer... Please, sir. 
Sister, will you be specific? I would like to suggest Dr. Jeffries brought Miss Khan to this village, knowing her brother would follow. Jason's high blood pressure and lack of self-control would make it easy for anyone with medical knowledge to induce a stroke. I myself am not altogether ignorant of certain drugs. I warn you to be careful. I further suggest Dr. Jeffries collected that file of tablets, emptied it, and refilled it so that the last two tablets were aspirins and the fourth the prepared one. He then resealed the file with Harmer's tape, delivered it, and went to Norwich, knowing exactly when the prepared tablets would be given. By me? By you. Oh, God! This is purely supposition, sister. But you better make out a statement in writing, and I'll take it with me. I will. Meanwhile, Miss Kahn is entitled to see her solicitor at once. But this whole thing, it's fantastic. I'm inclined to agree, sir. But in a capital charge, the merest indication of doubt must be properly investigated. You do see that? Yes, of course, of course. Uh, I'll talk to the governor. He'll quite understand Sister Mary has allowed the emotional circumstances to carry her away. I think it only fair to warn you that I'm not entirely relying on supposition or emotional circumstances. I did ask you to be specific. Officer, are you seriously going to listen to this wild story? Having gone so far, sir, we'd best get it clear, don't you think? But in fairness to Miss Carr, In I fairness th to yourself. Yes, sister? You may know I made a collection of cuttings about the trial. They were burnt. Afterwards, by chance, I found one. I knew it for one of mine because of the clip marks. It must have been taken from my file deliberately. Here it is, officer. Hmm. The report of Dr. Jeffrey's evidence. Where did you find it? In Dr. Jeffrey's bag. If you look, you'll find a cutting I substituted, wrapped up in some gauze. It's cut in the middle of two columns and makes no sense at all. Well, let's see, shall we? Uh, do you mind, sir? If you want to, but she just said she put it there. Here's the gauze. You're quite right, sister. Here is a cutting. But that doesn't prove much, does it? Not by itself. You might take out that little roll of sealing tape with Harmer's name on it. Here we are. That doesn't prove anything either. Uh, why do you suppose the cutting was taken from your file, sister? So that I shouldn't study the biographical details too closely and note two significant facts. Well... First that about eight years ago, Dr. Jeffries visited America. <laughs> What's so strange about America? There's a state there called Florida. Officer, will you ask Miss Kahn what that conveys to her? Well, Miss Kahn. My brother... brother. About eight years ago, my brother was responsible for the death of a girl there. What was her name? She called herself B. Royal. You knew her, I think, Doctor. But I've never heard of her. I've not the least idea what you're talking about. The second fact in the cutting told me you were once very prominent in your profession, that you are the author of a standard textbook on congenital diseases. I don't see what bearing my literary achievements has I to do. I felt that a man of your former distinction might be mentioned in some book of reference. Sister. Miss Pierce. Yes? Would you fetch that book from the sideboard, please, and give it to Mr. Melling? Uh, That's the one. Thank you, Miss Pierce. You will find an entry under Dr. Jeffrey's name, officer. The place is marked. Please read anything relevant. Ah, uh, Jeffrey. Leslie Jordan Jeffreys, M.D., F.R.C., P.F.R.C.S., Cambridge and London. Born 1900... But this is ridiculous. It's a preposterous idea. Damn it, there isn't a sound argument in the whole thing. Dragging me in on the strength of some guesswork about tablets, which can't be proved medically... A cutting which doesn't mean a thing, and the fact that eight years ago in America, some hysterical redhead killed herself. How did you know she had red hair? Why, well, we, we, you just said so. I didn't mention it. I didn't know. Give me that book. 1934. Married Beatrice Royal. Dr. Jeffries, was Beatrice Royal your wife? Yes. Yes, until your damn brother came into our life. I must warn you, sir. Don't say any more. B had been restless for some years. I, I was absorbed in my work. I didn't realize she... She took a holiday alone in America. Look here, sir. I didn't know she used her maiden name there. She wrote me a bitter letter about you both. When I received it, 
She'd been dead some time. I went out there and checked. I watched you two. I've watched and planned for eight years. I was always too ambitious. I should have been content to let Jason suffer, knowing I could let him linger or snuff him out just as I wished. Oh, don't, please. You were responsible for your own part, Sarat. That day you appealed to me. Those damaging remarks you made with Martha passing in and out. <laughs> I remember wondering just how soon it would be all around the village. And then I saw the whole thing vividly, because while you talked, you were turning an ordinary bottle of aspirin over and over in your hand. But why me? Wasn't it sufficient that Jason should suffer? No, oh, men don't suffer like women do. I wanted another woman to suffer the torments she must have suffered before she died. Died alone. Oh, don't. Oh. Doctor, but now, thanks to Sister Mary, just shows what can be done with a little lack and a lot of faith. Or is it the other way round? I did warn you not to say so much, Doctor. I'm not sorry. The main thing is that Jason's dead. And if your theology is correct, Sister, in everlasting torment. Eternity is a long time, and I hope he burns through every endless second. The mercy of God is also eternal. And his compassion equally endless. Perhaps. Because after all, Sarat, you won't hang. And neither shall I! Here, come back. Oh. Locked. The other side. I'll have to break it down. You can't. It's solid. Use the garden door. Miss Pierce, get Newland. Yes. He may be going up to the tower. Can you see anything, officer? He's on the long gallery. Yes, he's making for the tower. Oh! He's going to throw himself off. No! No. No. Sarat. Come to me. Oh, sister. Sister. Magnificat anima mea, Adon. Et exaltabit spiritus mens in Deus. In Bonaventure by Charlotte Hastings, Flora Robson starred as Sister Mary Bonaventure, with Monica Gray as Sarat Khan and Michael Spice as Dr. Jeffries. The Mother Superior was Dorothy Holmes Gore, Sister Josephine, Frida Dowie, Willie, Anthony Hall, Martha, Gladys Spencer, Melling, Dennis McCarthy, Miss Pierce, Diana Olson, Nurse Phillips, Maureen Beck, Nurse Brent, Jan Edwards. The radio adaptation was by Peggy Wells and the production by Graham Gold. This was the last play in the Flora Robson Festival in which Dame Flora has been starring in some of her favorite roles. Flora Robson is now appearing in The Importance of Being Earnest at the Haymarket Theatre, London. The time now is 17 and a half minutes to five. At a quarter to five, it'll be time for home this afternoon. Meanwhile, some music played by Julian Bream. We present now a special transcribed Christmas message from the President of the United States to the American people. My fellow countrymen, all over our country and in many other parts of the world, Men, women, and children are preparing to celebrate the birthday of Christ. Never before in our lives has a Christmas seemed so important. I'm not thinking of turkey dinners and stacks of gifts. I mean the quiet, reverent celebration of faith, hope, and love born in a manger in Bethlehem. Across all the continents of this world, peace-loving people today feel apprehension and loneliness and fear. Many have forgotten the humble surroundings of the nativity and how from a straw-littered stable shone a light which for nearly 20 centuries has given men strength, comfort, and peace, peace of mind. At this Christmas time, we should renew our faith in God. 
we celebrate the hour in which God came to man, it is fitting that we should turn to him. Many of us are fortunate enough to celebrate Christmas at our own fireside. But there are many others who are away from their homes and loved ones on this day. Thousands of our boys are on the cold and dreary battlefield of Korea. But all of us at home, at war, wherever we may be, are within reach of God's love and power. We can all pray. All of us should pray. We should ask the fulfillment of God's will. We should ask for courage, for wisdom, for the quietness of soul which comes alone to them who place their lives in his hands. We should pray for a peace which is based on righteousness. The nation already is in the midst of a crusade of prayer. On the last Sunday of the old year, there will be special services devoted to a revival of faith in God. I call upon all of you to enlist in this common cause. I call upon you no matter what your spiritual allegiance may be. We're all joined in the fight against the tyranny of communism. Communism is godless. Democracy is the foundation of faith. Faith in oneself, faith in one's neighbors, faith in God. Democracy's most powerful weapon is not a gun, a tank, or a bomb. It is faith, faith in the brotherhood and dignity of man under God. Let us pray at this Christmas time for the wisdom, the humility, and the courage to carry on in this faith. Ladies and gentlemen, you have just heard President Truman's Christmas message to the American people. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. In answer to many thousands of requests from its listeners, the National Broadcasting Company is happy to bring you Adventures in Time and Space, transcribed in future tense. Dimension X. This is the story of Riesling, the singer of the spaceways. You've probably sung his songs in school, in English, French, or German. The language doesn't matter, but it was an earth tongue. But the real story of Riesling is not found in the footnotes of a scholar's critique or a publisher's biography. It is in the memories of the old-time spacemen, the pioneers who pushed the thundering old-fashioned rockets to the far, strange ports that are our commonplace heritage. These men know the true story of Riesling. The arching sky is calling spacemen back to their trade. All oh, hands stand by free, falling and the lights below us fade. Out ride the sons of terror, Far drives the thundering jet, up leaps the race of Earthmen, out far and onward yet. When I first met Riesling, he was hustling drinks in the Twin Moons Bar at Drywater, Mars. He'd won a guitar off a Chinese barkeep at Luna City by cheating at one thumb, and he made his whiskey by singing in the bar and passing the hat. Listen to her, Hudson. Don't she strum pretty? Like a 16-year-old uh, gal. Uh, say, how much did you collect on that last song? Three dollars, Marshal, and a slug. Al grabbed it from a bill. You don't trust me no more. Funny, never did have no luck with hound dogs nor Martian barking. Hey, Riesling, look over there by the bar. There's an Institute Four Striper giving him the eye. Know him? <laughs> Captain Hicks off the goshawk. Are you sure giving you the once-over? Maybe he's got a job. <laughs> <laughs> they don't make never no mind to me. I've been blacklisted. Hicks logged me for making up a song on watch. Right fine song, too. Now, hold it. Here comes the brass arm. Uh, Riesling, uh... I've been looking for you. I've been right here, Skipper. You saw to that. I need a jet man on the goshawk. Interesting. Real interesting. Well? I got news for you, Skipper. You blacklisted me, remember? Well, you kept your nose clean. 
and uh, we need an experienced man. Been a little changing down aft in the course hook, ain't this, Skipper? How'd you know that? You got that new atomic pile drive. Last three of them tea kettles blew somewhere in the asteroids. Look, it's double pay, but if you're scared... Scared? Listen, fella. For double pay, I'd jump off the top of the Harriman Tower if you allowed me rubber heels for the landing. All right, then. You show up tonight to sign the book. Sober. Got no choice, Skipper. Money and me is total strangers. We lift at 11.30 Mars time. Sober, you understand, Riesling? <laughs> you taking the job? Well, that goshawk is one stinking old tub. Her engine's got more bugs than a beagle dog in spring. And that new drive is about as safe as a pretty gal in the Ozarks. But I reckon she'll do for one more trip. Welcome home, Riesling. Hi, Jimmy Legs. Meet my friend Hertzman. He's signing on as a waffle. Wiper. This is Jimmy Legs Casey. <laughs> He's bosun. Can't hold his liquor no more than a sieve, poor boy. Hey, Mr. Casey. Riesling, you uh, sober enough to sign the book? Drunk or sober, I'll make my mark. Stand aside. Uh, three X's. <laughs> Took me a middle name. <laughs> yeah, you two lay below. And Hertzman. Aye, right, sir. Get him sobered up before the skipper makes rounds. Jimmy Legs, I'm sober as a hanging judge. Yeah? Well, you can leave that bottle here. What bottle? The one in your back pocket. Oh, glass buttons, maybe, huh? <laughs> Give it here. Jimmy Legs, I swear I'm going to write a song about you. Go ahead, threaten me. Now, get below. We raise ship in 30 minutes. Riesling, what the devil are you doing up here on the bridge without permission? Figured I'd take a little stroll. Riesling, get below no, before no, no, I hold have... Hold on, Skipper. You'll have that gold bridge just crawling up your arm. I'm up here on business. Well? That number two jet ain't fit. Cadmium dampers are warped. Why tell me? Tell the chief engineer. I did. He says they'll hold. Well? He's wrong. He's wrong. He's got a Harriman Institute degree in power electronics. And some drunk space rat says he's wrong. Skipper, I was damping jets when that shirt tail tad wore pins for buttons. I've got no time for you, Riesling. Casey, sound take off. Aye, sir. I'm telling you, Skipper, that number two jet's gonna blow. Dampers warm crooked like a turtle's back. Riesling, drag your dead head out of here. Get below. Go ahead from control tower, Captain. All right, Casey. Fire one and four. <laughs> blast for three watches before going into free flight. Riesling and I had the second watch. Damping was done by hand in those days with a multiplying vernier and a danger peeper. And as long as the peeper ticked off slow and steady, we knew the ship was safe for a while. Hey, Riesling, you better stow that guitar. If Jimmy Legs catches it, he'll blow a gasket. Don't worry, I could damp this tea kettle in my sleep. How's number two? Uh, all right, so far. Did you ever hear that song about Hicks, the one that got me blacklisted? Oh, the skipper is the father of his crew. A gentle guiding light to me and you. But on Mars he likes his women if they walk or if they're swimming or if they've got six arms instead of two. <laughs> hey, the, the second verse is better. Now the skipper likes his liquor by the quart. Yes, he'd go from Mars to Venus for a snort. He'll drink rocket fuel and... Well, hi, Skip. Didn't see you come in. You were too busy, eh? Who's watching the gauge? I got an eye on it. Don't you fret none. Riesling, I'm going to fix it so you can't get a berth on a rocket-powered pogo stick. Report to Casey under arrest. I don't rightly think I will. You what? You kind of forget, Skipper. According to space code, you can't remove a jetman till the end of the watch, right? Now look, you corn-fed space lawyer. Now, I... is that a rule or ain't it? Riesling, your ship is over at 2300. And I'll see you ride the rest of the way in slop locker. Maybe. Maybe. In the meantime, you clear out of my power room. 
I gotta make me up a third verse for my song. I got it. Power room. Damp number two appoint. Number two, all right. Hey, let me have that mic. Jimmy Legs, is that force dry boil up there? Give me that, Casey. Riesling? I've taken just about enough from you. And I've got a little news for you, Skipper. Number two jet is bulging like a fat lady in a satin skirt. Listen, you clown. That's Skipper, a... I think I'm going to junk my song and start over. I could do much better this on you. This is the last time, Riesling. Damp number two, a point. Well, uh, sure. Look out, Hurt. I'll take it. You watch the gauge. Now. I need to hear. She's bucking a little. Riesling, hit the emergency. Ah, she won't get him. It's that four. There go the lights. Riesling, Riesling. Stay down behind the bath. I've got to take a look. It's radioactive. Look out. I've got a piece of hot stuff under the two. What's going on down there? Shut up, Jimmy Lee. She's tight now. What happened? Number two blew your lunk-headed space rat. You all right? A little sunburn. Uh, the lights are gone. Uh, what's the matter with the emergency circuits? Riesling. Jimmy Legs, get some lights down here. It's dark. Get the emergency light on. They're on, Riesling. They went on after the blast. The lights are on. What are you talking about? Jimmy Legs. Jimmy Legs, turn on the lights. It's dark. Turn on the lights. That blue radioactive glow from the jets was the last thing Riesling ever saw. His optic nerve was burned out in an instant. He was in sick bay on the rest of the trip, and on the swing back, we set Riesling down at dry water Mars. Look out for the cable, Riesling. Thanks, Richard. Hey, Riesling. That you, Jimmy Legs? Hold up a minute, will you? Oh, uh, Riesling. Jimmy man. Legs, I promised I'd write a song about you, didn't I? Okay. Sure, Riesling, sure. Can't seem to sing like I used to. Uh, look, Riesling, uh, the men up on the bridge feel kind of bad about this. Yeah? Why didn't they think of that when Riesling told them that damper was shot? Now, Hertzman, that's all over. Sure, sure, that's all forgotten. Riesling, let's, let's get out of the Twin Moons before I vomit. Now, no, hold it, hold it. The skipper feels pretty bad about the whole thing, Riesling. Kind of late for that, Jimmy Leakes. Feeling sorry, don't hold no corn. The boys passed the hat. The skipper kicked in half a month's pay. Did he now? Then on principle, I suppose I ought to tell him to stuff it back up the jets. But you can't buy no drinking whiskey on principle. I'll take it. Here you are. Well, I'll get it. I'll be seeing you recently. Sure, Jimmy Lee. Sure. Come on, Hertzman. Let's get that drink. That was all. Just another space bum who didn't have the good sense to finish before his luck ran out. Well, Riesling holed up at the Twin Moons till his money was gone. Then he hooked a ride on a crawler over to Marsopolis. It was a boom town then, with an industrial district mushrooming between the Lesser and Grand Canals. I ran into Riesling about two months later, playing his guitar on a jetty that ran out into the canal. He had a dirty rag tied over his eyes, with a jetman's knot, and his hat was on the wharf beside him. Riesling! Who's that? Wait a minute. Hertzman. Yeah, how have you been? Passable. Gee, is this a Venusian dime? No, it's a slug. <laughs> I figured. Well, how's it going? Singing again? Some. Work in saloons, mostly. But I've been thinking some funny songs, Hertzman. The words come out different than they used to. Come on along the canal with me. Sure. Uh, here, take my arm. I know the way. That's a funny thing, Hertzman. I figure I know it better than other folks. Look back there, t towards the city. What do you see? Factory towers. Ah, smell them from here. 
But it don't seem that way to me. I remember them old buildings, old before Bible times on earth, thin and graceful like the fairy palaces my Grammy used to tell about down home in the hills. They've torn them down now, or else blocked them up with cinder bricks. Hertzman, when I stand out out here on the canal, I can see it the way it used to be. The water, ice blue with the stars shining up out of it. Way off there, the city with the towers sweeping up like a bird of flying off a tree. I can see it. It's the dirtiest stinkhole in the system. Not always. Depends on how you see it. Bone tie the race that raised the towers. Forgotten are the lords. Long ago. Why don't you go home, Riesling? Home? Earth. I've been thinking about that, Hertzman. When I was a youngster down in the Ozarks, I used to climb a big old oak tree my daddy had in the dooryard. You could see the hills for miles, green and cool. I've been thinking about that. Why don't you go back then? I couldn't see them hills no more now. I couldn't stand to see black when I knew they was lying all around me, cool and green in the sun. I couldn't stand that. Yeah. Well, let's get back to town, Hertzman. Today I made three and a half dollars, Marsh, and I'm all set to drink it down before dawn. Come on! I lost track of Riesling after that. I shipped out on a slow freight of the Condor class for Luna, and he hitchhiked a ride to Venusburg on an ore ship in a triplanet run. So he beat around the system, Venusburg to Layport to Drywater to New Shanghai and back. Any spaceport was his home, and no skipper had refused to lift the extra mass of Riesling and his battered guitar. He made up his songs, sitting out watches down in the power rooms with old shipmates, while the monotonous beat of the jet shook the hull plates. Hear the jet. Hear the jet. Hear them snarl at your back when you're stretched on the rack. Hear the jet. Feel the pain in your ship. Feel the strain in your grip. Hear the jet. Feel her rise, feel her drive. Strand steel come alive on her jet. On her jet. Little by little, his songs began to travel along the spaceways ahead of him. Raw spaceman songs with titles like Since the Pusher Met My Cousin and The Space Suit Built for Two. But more and more, we began to hear a different kind of song. Strange, sad songs. The ones you find printed in the centennial editions. Dark star passing. Death song of a woods coat. And then, finally, The Green Hills of Earth. It grew for 20 years, that song. They say it started way back when Riesling was down in the labor camps on Venus, singing for the indentured man. Now, if someone will kindly pass a bottle. Oh, it is not much, Riesling. Here, it'll do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what is that stuff? Tequila. <laughs> you cannot make him good here on Venus. What do you use? Carac bush. Oh, home it is... Oh, it is different. Where are you from, son? Tasco, Mexico. It's a long way from here. See, si, a long way. <laughs> How'd you come to sign on? The man comes out to the village from the city in the shining automobile. Very big. He says there is work. You sign the paper for ten years and you work. Yeah, work. There is work here, all right. Ten stinking hours in the jungle with machete. I tell you, when I get home to Earth, 
Will you do, son? Ah, what is the use? We aren't getting home. You know how many men die out there in the swamp today? Ten men, ten! What is the use? My mother, she's dead. My father don't care. A girl? Oh, she, she says she wait. I, I don't know. Sure, son. You, uh, you sing some more, Easton. We drink, you sing. Maybe a new song, son. We ride in the molds of Venus. We regurgitated breath. Foul are her flooded jungles, a crawling with unclean death. Let the. What is the matter? Finish the song, Leslie. I uh, can't. Can't yet. It just don't come. I'll finish it when I go home. That's it. When I go home to the hills. Now pass that bottle. The dawn whistle don't blow for four hours. That's where the Green Hill started. And I was there when it was finished. It was 20 years after that. And there wasn't a man flying or on the beach hadn't heard of Riesling and his songs. He was getting old now for a spaceman. He was a familiar figure through the whole system. Tall, gaunt, and with that dirty bandage tied across his blind eyes. I was chief jetman then on the old Falcon. We were cradled at Venus Ellis Isle, scheduled for a direct jump to Great Lakes, Illinois, on Earth. I was checking in Dunnage when Riesling felt his way up the gangway and came through the lock. Riesling! Who's that? Mike Hertzman! 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 Well, what are you doing on this old hog? I figured I'd ride her back to Earth. Earth? Are you going home, Riesling? I thought you were never going to make that run. I've been hankering to set foot in the Ozarks again. How about those hills? I've been singing about him so long now, Hertz, when I, I got to finish the song. I got to set foot in the dooryard and hear the wind through that oak tree. About the last thing I'll be doing, I got to get home before it... Riesling, there's a new company policy in effect, You see, huh? Hertzman, I'm getting just a little old. But Riesling, listen. No more deadhead rides. The new code book is in force. Oh, I seen code books come and go. Well, the skipper's one of them youngsters fresh out of Harriman Institute cadet training. He's liable to throw the book at you. At me? I've been around space as long as Halley's Comet and Brewster's Ridge. I'm going back to Earth, the cool green hills of Earth. I'm going home. All secure, Hertzman. What are you doing here? That's Riesling, Captain. Riesling, huh? I'm dragging it back to Earth, Captain. Not in this ship. Hertzman have his man removed. Funny thing, Captain, I, I sprained my shoulder sudden. Look, Skipper, you're a youngster. You're, you're pretty new out here. I'm going home. You don't know what that means to an old man, going home. I can't take you. It's against the Harriman Code. Oh, now look, Skipper. You can slide me by to the distressed spaceman's clause in that code book. Distressed spaceman, my eye. You've been bumming around the system for 30 years. Skipper, you make me do something I've never done for no one before. I'm an old man. An old blind man, and I want to go home. I ain't never crawled in front of a four-striper in my life, but... You gotta let me drag home. The law says a man's got a trip coming to him. You can stretch for a poor old blind man, now can't you? You got it, Skipper. All right, you old space rat. But keep out of the way. I run an efficient ship, and I don't want any trouble. No, no, sir, no trouble. I'll just lay down to the power room. I kind of like to be near the jets when they blast off for Earth. <laughs> Sit down, Riesling. Take a load off your feet. Thanks, Mick. Stand by for lift. Stand by. Best seat in the system. Power room and an old hawk glass ship. Power room, fire three. I see. Yeah, the cool green hills of Earth. You're still singing that, Riesling? Oh, some. I changed her a little. Gonna finish her now, Mac. Going home to finish her. Yeah. Have you seen those new... Uh, Automatic dampers, Riesling. Don't have to do nothing but sit and watch. Hey, where, where's the peeper? Turned off. She's all automatic. And you have it soft nowadays. When I was twisting her tail, you had to stay awake. 
You got an old hand damping plates on? All but the links. I unship them, they cover up the dials. You might need them. No, the automatics handle everything. Well, you're finally going home, recently, huh? Won't seem the same out past the moon. I've been waiting for this a long time, Mac. Gonna be good to get home, I reckon. The Argent sky is calling spacemen back. <laughs> Mac! Hey, Mac, you all right? I, I, I got the emergency. The hand dampers, where are the links? Mac, Mac, you gotta be on the wall here something. <laughs> Power room, what's the alarm? Emergency squad coming in. Stay out, the place is hot. Radiation blast. Stay behind the baffle. I got the link shift. I, I can hand damper now. What's going on in there? I'm still in jet three. Is this McDougal? McDougal is dead. This is Riesling on watch. Riesling, get out of there. You'll kill yourself. Don't worry, Skipper. I know this power room like it's inside of my shirt. Somebody's got a damper. Riesling, I'm sending in a crew. No, 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 no use. The whole room will be hot for an hour and the other jets won't hold. Skipper, throw on the recording tape. What? Throw on the recording tape. I want to get something down. Tape's on, Riesling. Stop it, Riesling. The radiation will burn you down. Yeah, I reckon. Yeah, pretty sharp sunburn. Pick me out of here with the dogs and bury me in a lead shield coffin. Oh. Okay, Skipper. She's clean. Uh, radiation's getting brighter. I can almost see. Bright and rosy like the sun. Like the sun over the hills down home. I got my song figured right now. Here it comes. We pray for one last landing on the globe that gave us birth. Let us rest our eyes on the fleecy skies of the cool green hills of earth. I can see him now. The hills. My son. I can see the sun. That's the way he died. Riesling, the blind singer of the spaceways, singing of the home he never reached. The cool green hills of Earth. Next week, we bring you another story many of you have requested that we repeat. It's the strange tale of man's first visit to another planet and why he decides that Mars is heaven. <laughs> Be with us at this same time next week for another adventure into the unknown world of Dimension X. This program was transcribed. Now Dynamic Tallulah Bankhead brings you the big show on NBC. This is ChestertonRadio.com. International Silver Company presents The Silver Theater. Starring James Stewart and Jane Bryan in Misty Mountain, directed by Conrad Nagel. Brought to you on behalf of two of the greatest names in silverware, International Sterling, world-famous solid silver, and 1847, Rogers Brothers, America's finest silver plate. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Conrad Nagel welcoming you to the 17th of a new series of Silver Theater Dramatic Productions. Among the many brilliant stars to be presented in future weeks are Loretta Young, Andrea Leeds, John Garfield, Lee Tracy, Shirley Ross, and others. Today and next Sunday, we're proud to present Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer's talented James Stewart, and the gifted young Warner Brothers actress, Jane Bryan, in Misty Mountain, an original drama by Grover Jones and True Boardman. And now the lights are being dimmed and the silver curtain is rising on the first act of Misty Mountain, 
starring James Stewart as Rusty Lane and Jane Bryan as Mary Lou Masters. Standard Airways, flight 9, Albuquerque to Los Angeles, leaving from gate number 2. All passengers aboard, please. Flight 9 now leaving. Did you make any changes in the flight plan, Rusty? Uh, just one. We go over Rex City at 8,000 instead of 10,000. That way we ought to miss that headwind. Passenger all aboard? Come on, let's go. All right. Boy, young man, uh, are you the pilot of this plane? Yes, ma'am. You go ahead, Elmer, and get this started. Right. <laughs> well, you see, this is my first trip by plane, Captain, and, uh, well, it won't be too bumpy, will it? Oh, well, I don't think so, ma'am. The weather looks very good, and if I see any bumps up in the sky there, I'll just fly around them. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoy the trip, madam. Thank you. All passengers fasten safety, though. All set, Elmer? All set. Good. Uh, Lane in standard flight nine calling the tower. We are ready to taxi for takeoff. Towers are lane in flight nine. Go ahead. Taxi to north runway. Take off northeast to southwest. Wind is southwest 12. Okay. Did you test the radio, Elmer, both day and night frequency? Yeah. You know, you should have been with me today. I, you know where I went? I went out to an Indian reservation. Indian reservation? Yeah. And for what? Honest, you're the get around in this guy. Did you ever take an hour off and just do nothing? Give that curiosity of yours a rest. Oh, well, I... Where's those motor sound swells since the overhaul of it? Yeah. Uh, calling the tower, Lane and Flight 9. We are ready for takeoff. Okay, Flight 9. No traffic in area. That's all. Clearing Flight 9 from Albuquerque. Go ahead. Okay. You see, uh, Elmer, about those Indians, they've got this ceremony. It's something to do with the rain. It's a new version of the Lamb of Walk, only uh, you have a rattlesnake for a partner. A rattlesnake? Wheels up. Wheels up. Did you say rattlesnake? Yeah, yeah. I said rattlesnake. Thanks. I'll sit that one out. Switch to the beam, Elmer. Right. Wow. How's that? Off the ground exactly on schedule. You know, you're going to be two minutes late someday, and the sky's going to fall in or something. You're the on time in Well, thing. how else can you run an airline? Now, with everything on schedule, we can just settle down to a nice, pleasant flight. Calm and uneventful. Except, of course, for Misty Mom. Elmer, you're a mind reader. But know? look, Rusty... Some of these days, talking to that gal's going to get you in Dutch. You know the rules about communicating with private individuals on the plane's equipment. Now, uh, will you stop worrying? In the first place, I talked to that girl on Misty Mountain on the emergency transmitter, and the ground station is tuned to our regular equipment. And in the and second place... And in the place... second place, you're just plain balmy. Balmy? What do you mean, balmy? A beautiful girl's voice comes out of nowhere. A girl I've never seen, and she talks to me not once, but a hundred times. And, I don't know, she gets to be sort of a landmark on the flight. Now, talk to her. What do you mean? Of course I'll talk to her. And what about Helen Marshall? Just because she's in Honolulu, you needn't... Now, nah, that's nothing to do with Helen. Well, maybe I'm wrong. But when a guy's practically engaged to the daughter of the boss and then takes a chance of losing her... Losing her? Now, look. Now, Helen's my girl. She may even get married. Huh? Mary Lou, on the other hand, is just a voice. A voice out of nowhere. And as far as I'm concerned, that's all she'll ever be. Hey, we're off the beam. You know that. We're off the beam? If anybody's off beam, it's a guy called Rusty Lane. And I'm not talking about airplanes. Well, there she is, Elmer. Good old Misty Mom. Now, Rusty. Now, we better report. Show that switch. Ah, uh, Lane in Standard Airways, Flight 9, calling Las Vegas. Go ahead. Las Vegas to Flight 9. Go ahead. Ah, uh, Flight 9 over Misty Mountain at 9,000, climbing at 456, estimate Barlow at 7,000 at 517. Go ahead. Okay, Flight 9. Now, I'm going to switch the receiver over to night frequency. Ah, uh, rest. You heard me. Now, what's, what's her call letter again? W6RX. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, no, thanks, Bob. Uh, Standard Airways, Flight 9, calling W6RX2. Come in, please. Calling W6RX2. Come in. Hooray, she's not there. Now, let's forget W6RX2, back to Flight 9. Hello, Rusty. Hello, Elmer. How are you up there today? Go ahead, Flight 9. Hello, Mary Lou. All right, Elmer, now say hello. Oh, hello. Uh, don't mind him, Mary Lou. He's just his sunny disposition. Well, now, what's new on Misty Mount? How's Mother McCree, huh? Did you have her pups yet? Go on, now, tell us the news. Come in. <laughs> yes, Mother McCree did have her pups. Six of them. And, Rusty, they are the cutest things you ever saw. There's nothing else new down here, though. Say, Rusty, where are you up there anyway? I'm looking out the window and I can't see. Oh, 
There you are. The plane just came over the top of the peak. You know, it looks as if it was made of gold with a sunset on the wings like that. How fast are you going? Go ahead. Uh, well, we've got about ground speed of 180, I guess. But now, Mary, Mary Lou, now look, there are a lot of questions I want to ask you. Now, where are you down there? Now, tell me where your house is. Are you ahead of the plane or behind, or left or right? You know, I checked with the post office department, and there isn't, there isn't a town on Misty Mountain, not even a village. So where do you live down there? Now, tell me. Come in. <laughs> are, you, are you sure I'm here at all? Maybe I'm just a voice with no girl to go with it. Oh, no, you're not. Hey, I, I bet I can even describe you. Now, let's see, you're, uh... And you've got... You're uh, six feet three, you've got a pug nose, three warts on your chin, bow legs, and you wear a wig. And anyway, who cares? Uh, that was Elmer. I just threw him out of the airplane. He doesn't approve of my talking to you. <laughs> he says, I'll get fired and you'll lose your license if we're caught at it. But now go on. Now tell me about you. Who are you? Now what are you doing on Missy Mountain? You'll never know. I- I'm signing off now, Rusty. 73 is for the day. Give my love to the angels up there. Good night, Rusty. Night, Elmer. W6RX2 signing clear. All right, but Mary Lou. Mary Lou. Mary Lou. Mary Lou. Now, uh, shut up, shut up. Uh, so she's just a voice. Uh, uh, Elmer, wh- what do you suppose she does look like? What do you care? Helen's your girl. Well, sure she is. Well, that just doesn't stop a guy from being curious, does it? Oh, is that what you call it? Now, pipe down. Sure, sure. Mary Lou, Mary Lou. <laughs> Mary Lou. <laughs> Rusty, in case you're interested, we have a rove, as the grammar books say, and the passengers are out. Come on. Okay. What are you going to do tonight, Rusty? No, I don't know. Well, there's a movie in town all about pilots and airplanes. I thought we might go learn something about how it's done. Hey, you know, that's not a bad idea. You know, wouldn't it be something if real flying was like it is in the movies? You know, I can just see you, the determined hero driving his ship through a blinding storm, ceiling zero, visibility zero. Brain zero. Yeah, yeah. There he is. Rusty. Hey, it's her, Rusty. Your girl, Helen. Helen? Well, she's in Honolulu. Rusty. Oh, Rusty, darling. Well, stupid, aren't you going to kiss me? Oh, well, yeah, sure. Hello, Helen. How are you? Hello, Mr. Marshall. Hello, Lane. Hello, Sloan. Oh, darling, we came back ahead of time yesterday on the clipper. Dad had business here, so I came back with him. Yes, and I have to be getting at that business. Incidentally, Lane, I have some plans for you that I think you'll find interesting. But I'll let Helen tell you about them herself. Oh, well, thanks, Mr. Marshall. Thanks. <laughs> See you both later. Yeah, me too. Well, Helen, what is this about plans? Oh, well, not now. First, you're taking me to dinner and later to a dance down at the beach club. And then, if you've been very attentive, perhaps I'll tell you what Dad has in mind. <laughs> Are you sure you won't be too cold out here, Helen? There's a wind blows in off that ocean. No, I'm not cold. At least I wouldn't have to be. What? Oh. Yeah, that's... Well, how's that? Man? Well, for a man I've come 2,500 miles to see, you're anything but demonstrative, darling. Well, Helen, I, I, I know. I, I'm just surprised, that's all. I, it's swell to have you back. Is it, Rusty? You're my girl, aren't you? How long have you been saying just that, Rusty? Oh, I don't know, I'm... Three years, I guess. It's nearly five. Is it? Is it five? Years? Rusty. Yeah. Do you want to know Dad's idea? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. You know, Standard's been planning to start regular service across the Atlantic for two years. Well, you're going east to be in charge of establishing terminal bases for the line. What, me? Mm-hmm. Well, Helen, that's swell. Oh, I'm... yes. <laughs> Beginning next week, you stop being just an ordinary pilot, and you become an executive. Oh, there's no limit to what it can mean, Rusty. Probably even a vice president in a year or so. Of course you are. Well, Helen, wait a minute. What's that about me not being a pilot any longer? Why, of course you do. Well, uh, you still fly some, of course. Mapping routes and things like that. But you won't do just humdrum flying. Oh, I won't do humdrum flying, huh? Well, darling, aren't you happy about it? Well, yeah, sure. I I guess I am. But, but, Helen, I... 
There's just something I want you to understand. You, you needn't say it, Rusty. I do understand. You do understand? Oh, of course, my dear. I always promised myself that the man I'd marry would be one who loved me so much that he, he just couldn't find words to tell me so. Oh, you, you promised yourself that, huh? Yes. And, and darling, this was really selfish of me, fixing this all up with Dad. Yeah? Well, you see... I wanted you to be an executive so that I could, I could see, see, see something think of you. If you think I intend to share my husband with a lady in the moon, you're mistaken. I want you down on the ground with me. You do, huh? Oh, yes, Rusty. Well, uh, there, there's an old custom when people get engaged that... Uh... Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> Why, Rusty, darling, aren't you glad? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Sure, I'm glad. The curtain has just fallen on Act One of Misty Mountain with James Stewart and Jane Bryan. We'll continue with Act Two in just a few seconds. And if the men in our audience will listen very carefully during those few seconds, I think we may be able to help them solve an important problem. All right, John Conti. You know how much store your wife sets by those little extra courtesies you show her. How delighted she is at any unexpected thoughtfulness. And you know, too, how often you've wanted to bring home some little token of your affection. And, well, you've been undecided on just what to choose. Well, next time, why not take home a lovely piece of silverware? Fine silverware is always a welcome gift to a woman. And more than ever welcome when it helps to build a service not yet entirely adequate for her entertaining needs. Or, if you know that the silverware your wife has is not really very good silverware, why not choose a special occasion and give the silver theater set, in 1847 Rogers Brothers' most sensational silver plate pattern, First Love. She'll be thrilled to read the distinguished name of 1847 Rogers Brothers on every lovely piece. Thrilled, too, to see the sterling-like detail of that beautiful First Love pattern. And you, on your side, will be surprised... To learn that you can get this gorgeous 62-piece silver plate service for only $59.75. A saving of more than $14 over open stock price. Let your silverware dealer show you this 1847 Rogers Brothers service tomorrow. And tell you what easy, convenient payment terms can be arranged. For here is a gift to be enjoyed every day for years to come. The gift of America's finest silver plate, 1847 Rogers Brothers. Once again, the lights are being dimmed and the silver curtain is rising on the concluding act of part one of Misty Mountain. Captain Rusty Lane, engaged now to Helen Marshall, daughter of the president of Standard Airways, is making his last flight but one as a regular transport pilot. High over the mountains of northern Arizona, he discusses the future with his anything but enthusiastic co-pilot, Elmer Sloan. A fine business. You sitting in an office pushing buttons while other guys fly the ships. Well, somebody's got to do the groundwork. Then somebody else ought to do it. Not the best pilot that ever pulled out of a tailspin. Oh, no, Elmer, you're vast. The trouble with you... Rick, Center weather station calling off planes and area. Gathering storm, vicinity, misty mountain. Ceiling, 400 overcast. Visibility, 2 miles. Temperature, 36. Dew point, 35. Moderate range. Wind, southeast 12. Barometer, 30, 08. That's all. Storm over Misty Mountain. How well we'll climb up through it and go an instant. Why? But why? We could go around it and still. Well, why should we go around it? And on the other hand, why shouldn't we? What reason has a guy got for flying over Misty Mountain who's engaged to the president's daughter and has an office all waiting for him with his name on the door? Now, shut up. Now, push that switch over to night frequency. You gonna call Mary Lou? Just never mind the questions. I gave an order. Well, you don't have to get sore about it. There. Lane and Standard Flight 8 calling. W6RX2, W6RX2, come in. W6RX2 to flight eight. Hello, Rusty. How are you today? And how are you, Elmer? Come in. Well, you're certainly conversational up there. Isn't there any news? Go ahead. Uh, no, that's not much news. The weather report says it looks like bad weather down there. Is it raining? Well, how's Mother McCree and the pups? Go, go on. No, it's not raining yet, but I think it's going to. Jack was saying he hoped it would. Jack, who's Jack? Probably her husband. Oh, incidentally, uh, Rusty, you sound kind of funny today. What's wrong? 
Oh, and I'm, I'm using my new condenser. Am I coming in clearer? Never mind about condensers. We just want... Uh, who's Jack? And what's more, who are you and where do you live down there? And I want to know these things. Now, tell me, what's the use of being so secret about it? Now, come in. I guess I'd better sign off now. Oh, oh, Rusty, if you get a dog for Christmas and you don't know where it came from, maybe it'll be one of the pups. I'll send a care of the airline. How about it? Uh, Mary, listen, I want to tell you something. You see, this is this is my next to the last trip over. After my flight back day after tomorrow, I'm going to New York on a big job, so... If we miss you or anything on the next trip, well, this is so long, see? And now, will you tell me something about yourself? Now, go ahead. What's the matter? Mary Lou? Mary Lou? She signed off. Oh, wait. Calling W6RX2. W6RX2. Come in. She's gone. That's funny. I guess her transmitter just went off. Sure. Mm-hmm. All right. Will you quit humming that tune? Okay, but why should I? A voice out of nowhere and she can stay there. That's what you said. So why should you get sore? Of all the guys. You see, Lane, there's an unusually heavy shipment of mail, so I'm going to have to send one ship through without passengers today. Now, I can't have Collins go, but I thought you might be particularly anxious to get back to Miss Marshall. What's that? Well, of course, we've heard the news. Congratulations. Oh, thanks. Well, what will it be? Mail today or passengers tomorrow? Well, I guess you're right. I'd better get it over with. That is, I'll, I'll go today. Good. Of course, Sloan will be with you and your regular stewardess. So it's goodbye, Lane, and good luck in the new job. We'll try to keep the line running here without you, but it won't be very easy. Stewardess to a bunch of mailbags. Why didn't we take our regular run? Lucky couldn't wait another day to get back to his Helen. Well, now, isn't that too the bad? The stewardess quarters are in the cabin, Miss Wexler, and not in the cockpit. Do you mind? Well, excuse me, Captain Lane. I'm sorry. For a guy that's supposed to be spilling over with happiness, you've sure been doing a great imitation of a sore head. Well, it gets my goat. What does? Not knowing. Not knowing what? Let's forget it. Okay, Rusty, sure. After all, it's your life, and if you want to stop flying, that's your business. Besides, Helen's a swell girl. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Turn on the beam. Good weather. Guess that storm over Misty Mountain is all blown away. Yeah, yeah, sure it has. We've got clear weather all the way from now on. to Las Vegas over a misty mountain at 10,000 climbing at 545 estimate Las Vegas 704 Burbank 912 go ahead okay flight 9 weather and traffic ahead unchanged okay I'm gonna throw that switch the night frequency you heard me you mean you're going to stop calling flight 9 W6RX2 calling flight 9 Rusty is that you up there come in please no it's Mary Lou she's calling us something's wrong hello Lane, Lane, Standard Flight 9, calling back W6RX2. Hello, Mary Lou, what's wrong? Come in. Rusty, please, I need help. Quickly, help me. Hey. Just above the Timberline is a force patrol landing field. You can land there, but you must hurry. Please, Rusty, I, I can't explain now. Oh, hurry, please help me. Mary Lou, Mary Lou, calling W6RX2. Elmer, she's gone, and we got to get down there. You're crazy, you're carrying mail. It'd mean your job. Rusty, you can't do it. I can't do it. Well, I'm going to do it. Now, try and spot that field. We're going down. The wings off. You see that field? Is that it there? Right. Point? But Rusty, look at it. You can't land this ship there. If that's a landing field, I'll... wheels down. Oh, wheels down. Hey, what happened? Why the forced landing? Are we in any trouble? Well, never mind. You get back in that cabin and fasten your safety belt. Yeah, but I'm not. You heard me. Get back there. Crazy things, Rusty, but this tops him. Now, never mind. As soon as we're stopped, you head her into the wind and keep the motors running while I'm gone. You still don't know where she lives. I spotted a house just a second ago. It looks like a forest ranger station. It must be the place. And anyway, 
I'll find out. And remember, whatever happens, you and Millie stay and guard this mail. You understand? Hello. Hello, hello. Mary Lou, was anyone here? Hello. All right, all right. Open up here. Well, all right, land sakes. Wait a minute. Now, what do you all want? Are you aiming for to wreck the place? Lie down, dog. Hey, what? Are you Mary Lou? Who? Mary Lou. Didn't you just call for help? Say, mister, you ain't catched, are you? Now, look. Now, some girl radioed me up on that plane that she was in trouble and needed a girl named Mary Lou. Well, it all sounds right crazy to me. Oh, wait. Look. Is there anybody else living in this mountain? Another girl. Nary a soul. But surely... Be you, quiet, you, you must know... What'd you call that dog? Oh, why, you... Uh... Now, now, let me in here. No, you can't. Go on, go on, be quiet, Mother McCree. Go back to your pup. I see, a ham radio transmitter. So you never heard of Mary Lou, huh? Oh, Rusty. Hey, what's the idea of the Hillbilly Act? Well, come on, answer me. Well, I, I was scared. I didn't really think you'd come down here. I, I tried to call you again and tell you not to, but look, you can see the transmitter's still on, but... Well, wait a minute. You mean nothing's wrong? Mm-mm. Well, what are you doing here alone? Well, my brother's the forest ranger at the station, and I visit him summers. He, he's out and out at the observation post on the peak. Oh, so you brought a transport plane down full of mail in the worst field in nine stages for a laugh, huh? Oh, that wasn't why, Rusty. Well, then why'd you do it? Well, I... Well, you said this was your last trip. I'm like you. I was curious. I... I wanted to see what you looked like. Oh, you wanted to see what I looked like? Oh, look, that's crazy. Look, do you realize what you've done? Mm-hmm. I may even lose my license. At least I'll be fired. <laughs> Well, Rusty, I, it's my fault. Can't you tell them that? I mean, wouldn't they understand? I mean, if you told them that I was lonely and, and you were a voice out of the sky and I thought I'd never see what you looked like and I told a little lie to get you down here. And... Oh, I'm sorry, Rusty. Honest, I am. Well, quit <laughs> crying about it. Yeah. Well, I said quit it. Now, what, do I have to shake some sense into you? I guess somebody ought to. I... Oh, Rusty. Well, I... Hey... Hey, Mary Lou. Hey, you know, you look just like I thought you did. Do I, Rusty? Yeah. Well, this is amazing. Your eyes and your hair and your lips. Why, you're... Mary Lou. Rusty. Rusty, you... you well, did... Why did I do that? Kiss you. I ought to choke you. Look, I have to get out of here. Well, wait, Rusty, will you come back or write to me? Never mind Just about that. The... Never mind about that. I got a mail plane oh, waiting. Oh, wait a minute. I'm coming to see you off. Rusty, what was it? Was Mary Lou? Oh, you're Mary. Yes. And you're Elmer. Say, what is all Now, this? never mind all the questions. Let's get going, Elmer. We've got to make up for lost time. Come on. Come on, Mother McCray, come on, get out of here. Get out of that plane now. Come on. Willie, get that dog out of here. Will I? Come on, dog. Oh, wait a minute, I'll help you. Mother McCray, now, come on, get up. Give it to me. I've got it. Hold the door open. Come on, Elmer. Now, let's get started. What was it all about, Rusty? Why did you... Now, just never mind. Now, there, that dog's on the ground, finally. Okay, now, let's go. Well, let's have it. Don't just sit there looking like something that blew out of a volcano. Why did she do that? Well, she was curious. Curious. So she hauled the plane down on the side of a mountain. Well, who wasn't curious? Boy, she was all right for looks, though, wasn't she? Crazy little quarter wit. I got a mind to... T- I think, as a matter of fact, I will tell her. Here, push that switch. You're going to talk to her again? Say, I'm going to talk to her. Yeah. Flight 9, calling W6RXT2. Calling W6RX2, and come in, quick. Oh, W6RX2, back to Flight 9. Hello, Rusty. Elma, come back for me. Rusty, it's Millie. Millie! That dog! When I took it out of the plane, the girl got in and slammed the door. She's up there with you now. Hey, Rusty, can a guy be drunk without having had anything to drink? Look, just never mind. Fly this airplane for a minute. Uh, Hello, Rusty. Look, I... What are you doing here? Well, I came along to help. To help? Mm Mm-hmm. You said you were in serious trouble, and it's really all my fault, so I came along to fix it. I'll explain everything to your boss. Oh, you came along to fix it. Well, now, that's... Oh, that's wonderful. Look, I'm an hour late with a ship full of mail. 
I made an unscheduled landing on a, an unmarked field because I broke regulations talking to a private party on a plane transmitter, and now I'm going to land in Burbank with an unregistered passenger and without my stewardess. Help me. Look, you're going to send me to Leavenworth. And here's another happy little thought, Mr. Ex-Vice President-to-be. There'll be a reception committee waiting for you at Burbank, and the whole committee's name is Helen Marshall. Yes, my boy, I'd say it was definitely going to be a happy landing. Hey, this is Conrad Nagel again, ladies and gentlemen. We hope you've so thoroughly enjoyed this first episode of Misty Mama Mountain, starring James Stewart and James Bryan, that you look forward eagerly to next Sunday night when you can hear its thrilling climax. And there's another thought we'd like you to carry away from the Silver Theater tonight. A thought that goes back to the days of our colonial forefathers, many of whom were silversmiths of remarkable skill. If you've ever seen any early American silver, you'll remember it as simple and yet extraordinarily beautiful. And I think it's interesting to know that many of the most exquisite solid silver patterns created today, international sterling patterns, adhere to many of the same principles of faultless design and painstaking artistry, which characterized the silver fashion by colonial craftsmen. Because of modern improved methods of silversmithing, today's solid silver is within the reach of nearly everyone. For instance, just listen to how easily you yourself can start a solid silver service. Ladies and gentlemen, you can get one of International Sterling's lovely me-to-you sets, a place setting for one person, six lustrous pieces of genuine silver for only $16.75. Your silverware dealer can show you one of these sets tomorrow, so be sure to visit him and see it. He'll be glad to explain the budget payment plan for larger complete services while you're there, and you'll be glad to learn how easily you can own solid silver as beautiful as any the world has ever created. International Sterling Silver. James Stewart will soon be seen with Joan Crawford in the metro golden Mayor production, Ice Follies of 1939. And Jane Bryan's forthcoming Warner Brothers picture is Hero for a Day. Next week, Silver Theater presents James Stewart and Jane Bryan in the second and concluding episode of Misty Mountain by Grover Jones and Drew Borton. Conrad Nagel will direct, and of course, there will be more original music scored and conducted by Felix Mills. In the meantime, if you want solid silver, you want international sterling. If you want silver plate, you want 1847 Rogers Brothers, both proudly created by International Silver Company. All incidents and characters in today's drama were entirely fictitious. Silver Theater originates at Columbia Square in Hollywood. John Conti speaking. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Chesterton Radio, your home for podcasts of works by G.K. Chesterton, plus drama, comedy, mystery, science fiction, big bands, and much more. The soundtrack to your Chesterton day at chestertonradio.com. International Silver Company presents The Silver Theater. Starring James Stewart and Jane Bryan in Misty Mountain, directed by Conrad Nagel. Brought to you in behalf of two of the greatest names in silverware, International Sterling, world-famous solid silver, and 1847 Rogers Brothers, America's finest silver plate. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Conrad Nagel, welcoming you to the 18th of the new series of Silver Theatre Dramatic Productions. Before the curtain rises on today's concluding episode of Misty Mountain, I want to take just a moment in which to tell you that next Sunday we shall welcome lovely Loretta Young to our Silver Theatre, and that stories are already being chosen for such splendid performers as Andrea Leeds, John Garfield, Lee Tracy, Shirley Ross, and many others who are to appear on our stage in the very near future. Now the lights are being dimmed and the silver curtain is rising on the second and concluding episode of Misty Mountain, an original drama by Grover Jones and True Boardman, starring James Stewart 
as Rusty Lane and Jane Bryan as Mary Lou Masters, with John Gibson as Rusty's co-pilot, Elmer Sloan. Plane in standard flight nine to Burbank Tower. Flight nine over Newhall at 524 at 4500 descending. Estimate Burbank at 529. Go ahead. Okay, flight nine. Come on in. No additional traffic in area. Field is clear. Bozeman 3010. Wind southeast 12. Land northwest to southeast. Okay. Hey, they still haven't said anything about us being late. Don't worry, they will. Rusty, when are we going to tell them? The truth. What we're going to tell him. I'm going right straight to Mr. Marshall. This is an airline. You can't run it on a bunch of lies. But what about your big new job? Vice president and all that. And Helen Marshall. She'll be plenty sore if she finds you've been talking by radio all the time to some other girl. She might even break off the engagement. Well, Helen will just have to get over it, that's all. Well, maybe you're right. Telling the truth will be kind of tough on Mary Lou, that's all. What are you talking about, tough on Mary Lou? Well, after all, this plane's carrying mail, Rusty. And when Mary Lou radioed up for help and got you to go down on the mountain to help her, well, maybe it was just a gag to her. She wanted to see what you looked like. But it wouldn't be a joke to the government to lay in the mails and all that. Hey, I never thought of that. We can't let that kid get in bad over this. Here, take the controls. Oh, hello, Rusty. Hey, Mary Lou, now look. Hey, what's the word? You've been crying. No, no, I haven't. I'm... I, I'm just scared. I didn't mean to get you into trouble. Honest, Rusty. Now, just never mind that. Now, we'll be landed in a minute. And I want you to act just like you were a passenger. You understand? Get out of the plane, go to the airport lunch room. I'll come there and meet you later. Yeah, but Rusty, I want to explain to your boss and make him understand that this was all my fault. That you only made that landing on Misty Mountain because... Because I lied. Because now, I... Now, the reason doesn't matter. I broke regulations. Every time I talked to you on the radio, I was breaking them. Then why did you do it, Rusty? Why? Well, because... Because why? I just because I haven't got any good sense about some things. That's all. Like uh, when you kissed me. There was no sense to that either, was no. there? No. Now look. Now we're almost over the field. Oh, Rusty, I'm scared. G- can't we just keep on flying and not land at all? Well, don't talk nonsense. Now remember to keep quiet. Now fasten your safety belt. We're going down. Well, all right, Rusty. I hope everything. Yeah. Oh, sir, Rusty, the tower just gave us the go ahead. Okay, I'll take her. Wheels down. Wheels down. Can't we keep on flying and not land at all? A little dope. What'd you say? Hmm? Nothing, nothing. Maybe I'm wrong. Mary Lou. All right, well, we Mary quit singing Lou. that song. Okay, okay. Well, what's the score? Do we tell or what? I'm doing the talking to Marshall himself. I don't know how, but I'm going to find some way to leave Mary Lou out of it. Well, you keep her out of the way and see she doesn't talk. Okay, Mr. Galahad of the Airways. But for a guy who's engaged to another gal, you're sure taking a lot of chances to keep that kid in the clear. Now, shut up. Come on, let's get it over with. Oh, Rusty, Elmer. Hello, Mary Lou. Oh, Rusty, what's going to happen? Now, never mind. Just remember what I told you, Mary Lou. Keep quiet. Hello, Rusty, Elmer. Hello, George. Hi. A little late, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. Here's the manifest in that mail. Thanks. Oh, uh, you're carrying a passenger. I didn't know. Yeah, yeah. Come on, Elmer. Passenger's this way, miss. Oh, uh, thank you. Rusty, I'll bet we could get away with it. Yeah. Now, Mary Lou, you and Elmer go into the lunchroom. I'll check in and meet you there. All right. Come on, Elmer. I'm coming. See you later, Brother Galahad. That is, I hope I will. Elmer, why is Rusty so long? If he's just filing reports oh, like you said, he'll... So you did arrive. Hey, Helen. I phoned a half hour ago. They said flight nine was delayed. Uh, yes, we, we got sort of held up. Oh. Oh, uh, this is uh, Mary Lou, Helen. Miss Marshall, Miss... Uh, Miss Masters. Oh, how do you do? Uh, how do you do? Oh, where's Rusty, Elmer? Do you know? Yeah, in your father's office. In your father's office? But, Elmer, you told me Rusty was... Oh, then you know Rusty, too, Miss Masters. Yeah, she just met him once. You'll find him in there now, I think, Helen. Oh, fine. Well, thank you. I'll see you again, Miss Masters. Elmer, you lied to me. You said everything was all right, but if Rusty's in the boss's office... Okay, so I lied to you. But Rusty wants it that way. But what will they do to him? Ground him, I guess. Take away his license. Oh, but Elmer, they can't ground Rusty. Why, flying is his whole life. We've got to stop them. We've got to go in there now and tell the truth. No, you don't, Mary Lou. You see, Rusty wants to tell this in his own way. So that it keeps you in the clear. You mean he's... 
He's taking a chance of losing his license because of me? That's about it, I guess. Oh, Elmer. Then he... I mean, th- th- but he But look, Mary Lou, there's something else that you don't understand. Elmer. Elmer, even if I can't talk to Mr. Marshall, there's another way I can help Rusty. That steward is. I'll phone my brother. You know, he's the forest ranger on Misty Mountain, and he can drive it to the station so she can back- get back here sooner. Oh, where's the phone? A uh, uh, phone uh, right through the archway there. Hey, wait, have you got some money? I'm all right. Wait for me. Yes, miss. Something I can do for you? Mr. Marshall's office. Can you tell me where it is? Mr. Marshall? Why, yes. That door over there. But unless you've got an appointment... Well, thank you. Oh, well, Miss Masters. Where are they? I've got to see your father, Miss Marshall. He, he must understand that it wasn't Rusty's fault. Well, what wasn't Rusty? Oh, so it wasn't his fault. Well, I suppose you explain all this to me, Miss Masters. If it concerns my father, he'll usually listen to me more quickly than to someone else. Oh, will you help? You see... Rusty would never have made that emergency landing if I hadn't lied to him. The emergency... Oh, well, yes, of course. Uh, you've known Rusty for a long time, then. Oh, no, I've never seen him till today. It was just by radio. By radio? Is by a hand transmitter. You see, I've got one up at my brother's place on Misty Mountain. I'm alone a lot, and, well, I, I just got in the habit of talking to Rusty every time he flew over. Oh, I see. And then when Rusty said it was his last trip over the mountain and that he was leaving to go east on a big job, well... Well, it was crazy, I guess, but he'd always been just a, a voice up in the sky, and I wanted him to be more than that. I had to see him just once anyway. Oh, no, So I radioed him that I was in danger and needed help, and he landed. Of course, of course, when he found out why I'd done it, he was awfully mad. That is, except for a moment or so, and, and he rushed back to the plane to take off again, but I knew it would help him if I came and told the truth. So I came along. I had to. You understand that, don't you? Yes. Yes, I do understand, Miss Masters. And I want you to know that I appreciate what you've done. You appreciate? Yes. You see, I wouldn't want that... And furthermore, I want... Oh, hello, Helen, dear. Hello. Oh, Mary Lou. What... Oh, hello, Rusty, darling. Oh, uh, Dad, uh, this is Miss Masters. Uh, an acquaintance of Rusty's. How do you do, Miss Masters? Oh, how do well, you... Helen, all our worry about Rusty was unnecessary. He's been telling me why he was delayed. Oh, yes? What was the reason? Well, I thought he'd gotten a distress signal from some forest ranger station, so he made an emergency landing. Turned out to be a mistake. But then on the takeoff, the stewardess somehow was left behind. Well, it all sounds almost unbelievable, doesn't it, Miss Masters? Why, uh... uh look, Mr. Marshall... Now, let's I... not discuss it further. Right now, there are other things to consider. Oh, yes. Have you told Rusty the news, Dad? Well, I thought you'd want to. <laughs> of course, you know about these two, Miss Masters. Why, I... Now, look, I think we... Your executive appointment, Rusty. Dad says it can be official now. From now on, you'll spend your working days on the ground. Yes, Lane. We start to work on the transatlantic service at once. In fact, we leave for New York in about three days. We? Yes. You, Helen, myself, and whatever co-pilot you wish to select... Uh, we'll go in my private ship. Oh, and incidentally, Rusty, Dad says that we can be married just as soon as we arrive in New York. After all, I see no purpose in further delay. Oh, dear Dad. That's what he says now, but you've no idea what a time I had to get him even to agree to our engagement, Miss Masters. Yes, I... I can imagine. Well, if, if you'll all excuse me, I, I'd better be going. Oh, so soon. I have to be getting home, and it's quite a ways. I'm so happy to have met you all. And good luck on your trip to New York. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Miss Masters. Goodbye. Goodbye. Mary Lou. Hey, wait a minute. Well, what's got into that young man? Oh, it's nothing at all, Dad. He'll be back. And soon. I'm sure of it. my train. Thank you for coming to the station with me, but you needn't have bothered. Now, look, Mary Lou, for the 40th time, what did you and Helen say to each other? Now, why this sudden rush home? <laughs> why not? The whole thing was just a lark, and now it's ended. What was a lark? Well, all of it. Talking to you up there in the sky, and getting you to come down to Misty Mountain, and then riding out here in the plane. <laughs> I've never had such fun. Fun? And now that everything's straightened out, I'm, I'm glad for you, Rusty. You'll be happy in your new job and all. You know, you know, there's some people that, well, that just belong in the sky and others that should be on the ground. (laughs) 
joke is I had you all wrong. I thought you were one of the up in the sky ones. You did, huh? <laughs> but I'm cured of talking to airplanes from now on. I guess I'll have to stick to Boris. Boris? Well, who's Boris? Oh, he's a fellow in Russia. I pick him up on 34 meters about 10 in the morning. <laughs> he doesn't speak any English, and I don't speak any Russian. We have a swell time not understanding each other. Boris! Well, my train's leaving. Oh, Mary Lou, wait just a minute. Won't you please? Goodbye, Rusty. It's been fun being crazy for a while. Goodbye, Rusty. Good luck. Mary Lou. Mary Lou. Mary Lou! Ladies and gentlemen, before we continue with the rest of tonight's entertainment, may I say just a few words about the entertaining you do? It so often happens, you know, that a man's business success depends a lot on his wife's success as a hostess. And the more important your husband's position, the more social obligations for you. More dinners, buffet suppers, occasions when your silverware is sparklingly on parade. And naturally, you'll be a more poised and gracious hostess if you know that silverware is beautiful and correct. So may I suggest international sterling silver? International sterling is solid silver through and through. Its patterns exquisite in every detail and radiant with a mellow luster that is given to sterling silver only by silversmiths devoted to their craft. What's more, you can own this lovely solid silver far more easily than you imagine. And here's a man to prove it to you. John Conti. Ladies and gentlemen, you can now get a place setting for one person, six lustrous pieces of solid silver created in International Sterling's exquisite enchantress pattern for only $16.75. Visit your silverware dealer tomorrow, Monday, and talk with him about it. See the other beautiful international sterling patterns while you're there, and learn firsthand how very easily indeed you too can own silver that's a lifetime treasure. Solid silver by International Sterling. <laughs> Once again, the lights are being dimmed and the silver curtain is rising on the concluding act of Misty Mountain, starring James Stewart and Jane Bryan. Two days have passed since Mary Lou went off to rejoin her brother Jack in the lonely forest ranger station on Misty Mountain. And meanwhile, Rusty is the center of intensive activity preparatory to leaving the West Coast for New York. But a change has come over Rusty. A change he can't understand himself. Rusty boy, will you please get Mary Lou off your mind? You're engaged, remember? To Helen Marshall. And you're taking her to a banquet in half an hour. You gotta get ready. I'm not going. But you gotta go, Rusty. The whole party's a send-off for you and Helen. You can't get out of it. All right, all right. I heard you, and I'll go. I, I'm an executive now. I gotta go. That's where big business is done, over a banquet table. Sure, sure, I'll go. Captain Lane has very definite plans for the route, haven't you, dear? What is that? I said you have the new route across the Atlantic all laid out. You're just looking for the right flyer to try it out. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. A flyer. That's what I need. One of those up in the sky ones, not an on-the-grounder like me. That kind wouldn't do, would it? Well, Rusty, darling, what on earth are you talking about? How about a statement for the press before you leave, Captain Lane? Is it true you and Miss Marshall are getting married as soon as you reach New York? Sure. Sure, it's true. Why shouldn't I marry? We're engaged, aren't we? Now, Lane and Marshall Spatial. We're ready to take off. Okay, Lane. Field is clear. No traffic in area. Take off north to south. Wind south 22. And here's a special weather report. Storm area is still holding in the vicinity of Rex City and moving southward toward Barlow and Misty Mountain. That's all. Go ahead. Okay. Wait a minute, Rusty. What? Sure you want to do it through a storm and all? What are you talking about? You. You're not the Rusty Lane I've flown with 300 times. Something's happened. I don't know what, 
Or maybe I do, but it's none of my business, and I don't care either for myself. But Helen and Mr. Marshall are back there in the cabin. They've got a right to be piloted by a guy who still hasn't cracked up somehow inside himself. How'd you like to shut up? Don't do it, Rusty. You're not yourself. You know you're not. Please, Rusty. I said to shut up. We're taking off. Keep your hands off these controls. I'll pilot this plane, and I'll do it alone. Your play. I put the red jack on the black queen. Oh, I'm I'm sorry, Jack. I look, let's not play anymore, huh? Hmm? Hmm? Okay. Oh, now look here, sis. I didn't ball you off for that plane business in the stowaway act. Only now that it's all over, you gotta snap out of it. For your own sake. I know. You're right, and I have, Jack. I'm I'm, I'm just upset tonight somehow. Maybe it's the storm, and maybe I'm Oh, sure, sis, I know. Hey, look, sis. If this lame fellow's done anything to make you unhappy, well, I'm... Oh, but he hasn't. As a matter of fact, he was grand to me. He's... He's just engaged to someone else, that's all. Uh, I see. I'm sorry, kid. Oh, Jack, it is so crazy. A man I only saw once in my oh, life. Oh, that doesn't make any difference, Mary Lou. We can't decide things like that. <laughs> they sort of get decided for us. Yes, I, I guess they do. Oh, and Jack. Mm-hmm. Wait. Well, what's the idea of locking the radio room? Well, you keep this key, will you? And don't give it back to me. <laughs> okay, sis. You're the doctor. Why shouldn't it be? The weather's getting worse all the time, and we're losing the beam. Well, suppose That's, we uh... are. A flat without the beam. Well, shut up and leave me alone, will you? Now, look, Rusty, don't get sore, but we're mushing and losing altitude. Look at that altimeter, 8,600. Well, I can't go any higher. We're icing up. We'll have to go under the weather. Go under the weather? We're still in the mountains, and you knew it. And San Carlo Ridge is nearly 10,000, and in this weather we could crash into it before we saw it. Hey, hey, the beam, it's gone completely now. All right, let it go. Rusty, you can't talk like that in a storm like this. It... Now, let any, any way it's clear in here, you see? Rusty, Watch it's look clear. out there ahead, the ridge. Now, Rusty, bang, bang, bang. Hold on. Oh, well, it's one way to see a mountain. Look, Rusty, you got to get back on course. You've got to. I can't. I've tried to get on course. I can't. Well, then where are we? I don't know. I don't know. I'm lost, Elmer. Do you get that? Do you get that? 200 flights on this run, and Rusty Lane's lost. I'm lost. I must. That's funny. What are you going to do? Do I don't know. I don't know. I just keep flying. So we get somewhere or nowhere. I... Who cares? I wish she could Who see cares? you now. Oh, Helen? Oh, she was... No, no, not Helen. Mary Lou. The girl who thought you really belonged up in the sky. The girl who broke her heart when she found out you weren't going to stay there. The girl down there somewhere on Misty Mountain who right Elmer. now is... Elmer. Elmer, that's it. That emergency transmitter, switch it on. What do you mean? Mary Lou? She won't be listening. I Why said should she... switch it on. Hurry. Okay, okay. Lane. Lane calling W6RX2. W6RX2. Mary Lou, come in, please, and hurry. Hurry. W6RX2, come in. Mary Lou. I thought you'd gone to bed. I did, but I... I... Just couldn't sleep. Oh, Jack, oh, I... Oh, now look here, sis. You've got to quit this after all. I, I, I know it's crazy, just like all the rest of it, but, Jack, I'm not feeling sorry for myself or anything like that. It, it, it's something else, something I, I can't describe. I don't know. I... But I do know. Jack. Jack, the key. 
The keys? To the radio room. Give it to oh, me. Oh, but, Mary, you said no, you I don't wouldn't... care what I said. Look, please give me that key. W6RX2. 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 Come in. Come in. you got to give up, Rusty. There's not enough gas to keep on like this. Better go down again and take a chance on finding a landing. You can't. I know what I'm doing. Maybe I didn't before, but I know now. Plane calling W6RX2. Calling W6RX2. Come in, Mary Lou. Come in, please. I tell you, if she was there, she'd have answered long ago. You're going bats if you keep it up. W6RX2. Rusty Lane calling W6RX2. Come in. Will you quit it, Rusty? I tell you, she... W6RX2 calling Rusty Lane. W6RX2 calling Rusty Lane. I'm standing by. Come in. Mary Lou, Mary Lou, we're up here somewhere in the storm. I think I'm north of Misty Mountain near San Carlo Ridge, but I've got to make sure. Now, I think you can guide us on our course again. Do you understand? Come in. Yes, Rusty, but how can I? It's storming here, too, and I can't see a thing. Go ahead. You're not going to see. You're going to hear us. Now, I'm going to turn south and try and find Misty Mountain. Now, you've got to let me know when I'm overhead. So listen for us, and when you hear our motor, call back. Come in. All right, Rusty, I understand. Come in. All right, Mary Lou, I'm standing by. I'm turning south. Jack! Jack, do you hear him? No, she's not yet. He may have been a long ways off the course. Have him keep coming. W6RX2 calling Rusty Lane. Calling Rusty Lane. Come in. Go ahead, W6RX2. We still can't hear you playing, Rusty. But don't don't be afraid, darling. You can't be. Because you do belong up there. I, I lied when I said you didn't. You're an up in the sky man, Rusty. The sky can't beat you. I know it can't. Hey, Mary Lou. Just listen. I, I'm going to turn off for a moment so I can hear you. But stand by, Rusty. Have him turn southeast and be right over here. Rusty! Rusty, now you're northwest of us. Turn southeast! Southeast, Rusty! Now, Rusty, you're overhead. I can hear you. Turn east and you're on your course. Yes, what does he say? Hey, do not so I can talk back to you. Throw the switch. Is this what's wrong with you? I can't. I, I can't let him call back. What is there for him to say? He's on his course and says he can have all the Oh, yes, sis, but listen. W6RX2 to Rusty Lane. Goodbye, Rusty. Goodbye and happy landing. W6RX2 signing clear. <laughs> Coming with me? Uh, hey, what is this? <laughs> Seems to me only a couple of days ago you were through with radio for life. Well, this doesn't count. I'm talking to Boris. Who? Oh, 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 that fellow in Russia. Oh, oh, thanks. I won't have some. W6RX2 calling UX24Y. Calling UX24Y in Moscow. Calling UX24Y. Come in. Boris, Boris, is that you? Come in. Yeah, sure, it's Boris. Oh, sure, it's, uh, look, uh, I lost my accent. Come in. <laughs> Rusty, Rusty, where, where are you? Go ahead. Now, never mind that. Now, listen. Standard Airways is going to start its transatlantic service without Rusty Lane, and Helen Marshall has sailed to Europe to find herself a count. Now, what I want you to tell me is this. What's a guy called Rusty Lane who belongs in the sky going to do? Now, come in. Well, I don't know, Rusty. What is he going to do? Well, he's going to land on Misty Mountain and kidnap a gal named Mary Lou, and if she won't promise to marry him at Las Vegas this afternoon, he's going to throw her overboard <laughs> without a parachute. Well, how about it? Oh, yeah, I forgot. I love you. Come in. <laughs> and I love you, Rusty. I do love you. That's all I want to know. I'll be right down. Conrad 
Brad Nagel again, ladies and gentlemen. I know you're all eager to have our stars, James Stewart and Jane Bryan, come back and say a personal word, and they will be back in just a moment. First, however, I'd like to ask you to take a quick look back with me to a day 91 years ago in a little tree-shaded town of Connecticut where three brothers were creating silver plate of surpassing beauty and craftsmanship. Those three brothers were founders of the house of 1847 Rogers Brothers. 91 years ago, their name was little known outside their own small New England town. Today, 1847 Rogers Brothers is the most important name in American silver plate. Many of you have cherished this silver plate in your homes for years and need no words of mine to convince you of its beauty and quality. To those of you who are not familiar with 1847 Rogers Brothers silver plate, here is a man with a special invitation for you. John Conti. It's an invitation from your silverware dealer, ladies and gentlemen. An invitation to visit him tomorrow and see the magnificent 62-piece service of 1847 Rogers Brothers silver plate, which can be yours for only $59.75. A saving of more than $14 over open stock price. You can get this service in many different patterns, including the sensational first love pattern. You'll be surprised and delighted, too, to learn what easy, convenient payment terms can be arranged. For this is indeed the time to get America's finest silver plate, 1847 Rogers Brothers silver plate, at savings beyond your dreams. And now back to Conrad Daigle, who is leading our stars out in front of the silver curtain so that they meet may meet you in person. And here they are, James Stewart and Jane Bryan. Well, Jimmy and James, suppose you tell us something about yourselves. You, Jane, I understand you just finished Hero for a Day at Warner Brothers. Yes, that's right, Conrad. And you, Jimmy, how are you coming along with your flying? Oh, swell. I've got quite a few hours in the air, and it's a lot of fun. That's why I got a great kick out of playing pilot Rusty Lane. Ever been grounded? Grounded? Uh, well, I uh, just finished Ice Fallers of 1939 from Metro Golden Mare, and I was grounded plenty in those skating scenes. I, uh... <laughs> Had to take the de-icer off my plane and wear it in my pants for two weeks. <laughs> well, maybe this will take your mind off all those spills. You know, we're thinking of having a nice silver medal struck off for you. Well, that's wonderful. For, for piloting? No, for endurance. Endurance? Well, how come? Well, Jimmy, you hold an all-time record for stars who've made silver theater appearances. You've chalked up eight broadcasts. Oh, that's grand, isn't it, Jimmy? Uh, <clears throat> any chance of me piling up a record like that, Conrad? Well, we'd love to have you, Jane. But I won't be satisfied with a silver medal when I do. No? No, I'm going to hold out for a complete set of that lovely first love pattern I've been hearing about. Well, we'll try to do something about that. Now, I'm sorry to say that our time is about up, and I'm afraid right, that we... Just one more thing, Conrad. I want to get in a quick thanks for Johnny Gibson's work as Elmer, my co-pilot in today's show. That guy's terrific. And thanks the rest of the cast for us, too, will you, Conrad? I'll do that gladly. Thanks a million, James Stewart and Jane Bryan. We hope you'll be back soon. <laughs> Next week, Silver Theater presents Loretta Young in another original radio play by Grover Jones and True Borton. Conrad Nagel will direct, and of course, there'll be more original music scored and conducted by Felix Mills. In the meantime, if you want solid silver, you want international sterling. If you want silver plate, you want 1847 Rogers Brothers, both proudly created by International Silver Company. All incidents and characters in today's drama were entirely fictitious. Silver Theater originates at Columbia Square in Hollywood. John Conti speaking. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Chesterton Radio, the true, good, and beautiful at ChestertonRadio.com. For almost two centuries, Americans have enjoyed the valuable privileges of freedom. Now, freedom needs each American to dedicate himself to its preservation. We must not allow our liberties to be endangered by neglect of our duties as citizens. During this year of rededication, join with your fellow Americans in reaffirming the principles on which this country is founded and the safeguarding of those principles. Make it your business to see that federal, state, and local governments are conducted honestly. Help to maintain the good morale of your sons and daughters in the armed forces. Learn the facts about all candidates and issues. Then, vote for the one you believe in. 
Make the most of every minute on your job. Produce as much as you can, and thus increase our military and economic strength. Work for better schools and a better community. Guard your American heritage of freedom. It needs you. You are listening to Chesterton Radio at ChestertonRadio.com. Getting recorded message was selected from random phone calls. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the sounds of suspense, to the fear you can hear, to the terrifying world of the imagination. I'm your guide for a journey up a mysterious mountain. Dead Man's Mountain is what it's called. Going is really no problem. It's coming down that separates the living from the dead. Doctor, a man simply cannot age 40 years in one night. I wish I knew what to tell you, Mr. Johnson. I saw George last evening at dinner. He was 35. This morning, he's close to 80. But how could that happen? He went where he had no business going. Up Dead Man's Mountain. Is there some kind of disease up there? Some germ? Some virus that can age a man? None that is known to science. Then how do you account for it? Probably the Indian legend is correct. Some evil spirit up there hates to be disturbed. mystery drama, Dead Man's Mountain, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan, and stars Alan Hewitt. It is sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll return shortly with Act One. Hi, son. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. Hi, Junior. Kellogg's Special K presents Junior Gives Up. Junior, why aren't you eating your special K? It's your favorite cereal. Oh, just because. Just because why, honey? Just because Darla said some evil things about it. That's just because why. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. Hi, Hi Darla. Darla. Hi, sis. Hi, Junior. Darla, what did you tell Junior about his special K? Daddy, all I told him was that special K is good for him. Yeah, and anything that's good for me never seems to taste good. But, Junior, you already know that special K tastes good. Who do I believe? Darla or my taste buds? Uh, what's that, son? Oh, nothing, Dad. Son, special K is America's favorite high-protein cereal. It's got minerals, vitamins, iron, and all those good, nutritious things. But it got to be so popular over the years because it tastes good, too. You mean it's good for me and tastes good, too. Right, son. Right, Dad. Right, Junior. Right, Mom. Right, Right, indeed. Start your balanced breakfast with Kellogg's Special K. It's nutritious and delicious. Right, Dad. When occasional heartburn or acid indigestion is combined with a gassy, foolish feeling, that's what we call gassed indigestion. Digel is made for gassed indigestion because Digel is different. It does more than plain antacids. Digel reduces excess acid while its patented cymethicone gets rid of trapped gas fast. Use only as directed. Digel for gassed indigestion. No plain antacid can do what Digel can. Was I embarrassed? Even though I used an adhesive on my dentures, they still came loose during dinner. And when I had to be... This denture wearer should change to Cushion Grip, a soft, pliable, thermoplastic adhesive that even hot or cold liquids can't dissolve. That's why Cushion Grip lasts and holds dentures much longer than ordinary powder, paste, or cream adhesives you often must apply two or three times daily. For new long-lasting security, new comfort, change to Cushion Grip. R.J. Johnson sits at his desk. Yes, the R.J. Johnson. The mysterious, the remote R.J. Johnson. 
I better explain that. His ways are mysterious, except when his plans include you. He is remote, except when he wants something from you. Then his presence can become an overwhelming reality. Some say R.J. is the richest man in the world. Some say he's the second, the third, the fourth richest. Does it matter? All we need to know is that on this particular morning, R.J. Johnson sits at his desk, as usual, and is formulating plans to buy or sell what? An industry? A government? Somebody's soul? Parker, I want us to maintain our short position on consolidated industries. It's bleeding down steadily, and we should help depress it a bit, too. No, I'm not afraid of anything like that. They won't get a government contract. We can see to it. Uh, pick up National Computer and Starlight Oil. I want our full concentration on those three. I'll call you back later. Yes, Mrs. Dollard. Come in. Mr. Johnson, George Morrissey is here. And about time. I want hourly reports on Consolidated, National, and Starlight. The see to it that Parker can always reach me. Now, have Morrissey come in. But, sir, about Morrissey... Is there a problem? Well, I... I... You were saying... Perhaps I should have said... Mrs. Dollard, are you all right? Perhaps I should have said... There's a man outside who claims to be George Morrissey. Mrs. Dollard, you know George Morrissey. I... I thought I did. If there's any doubt, check security. I did. Then that settles it. He could never hope to get past the lobby elevators if he weren't George Morrissey. Mr. Johnson, maybe what I'm trying to say is... There's a man out there. And I don't want him to be George Morrissey. Have him come in here. Yes, sir. Mr. Johnson will see you now. Do you see what I mean, Mr. Johnson? Mrs. Dollard, is this your idea of a practical joke? Who is this? Please, please, R.J., don't yell at her. I, I can't stand noise. I, uh... George? Yes, George. You can't be George. Look at me, R.J. Look at me. I can't believe it. Uh, you, you don't want to believe it. What happened to you? Please, please let me... Let me sit down. He walked out of this office three weeks ago. Yes, yes, three weeks ago. He, he was a man of 35, and now... Now, I... I know, I know. I look in the mirror. I could be 75. His hair is all white. He's wrinkled, stooped. And that's not the worst of it. I feel 75. I couldn't even walk without this cane. George, the first thing you have to do is tell me exactly what happened. I I was at Manitou Mountain getting the development deal set, and R.J., listen, we'll have to forget it. Give it up. What are you saying? I'm saying forget it. Look at what happened to me. They said, all the locals, they said, the mountain was haunted. Terrible things would happen to anyone who went up there. Talk sense. Can't you believe your eyes, R.J.? Look at what happened to me. George... Start at the beginning. I... I couldn't get anyone to drive up the mountain road. So I hired a car. I drove it myself. I drove it up the mountain and... Uh... Yes, and? And that's all I remember, R.J. I must have passed out up there. But something did happen. It's... It's like a nightmare. I can't bring it into focus. Just flashes of it. Terrible things. Be specific. What kind of terrible things? Shapes, forms, voices saying I was going to die, that my life was falling away, that it was it was disappearing. What kind of shapes? What sort of forms? I I don't know. What size were they? What color? I, I don't you know. You say voices, what kind? High, low? Uh, Jay, I were they don't men's know. voices? Women? I can't remember. I can't now, pull remember. Pull yourself together. Pull myself together. Look at me. I'm an old man. I've been robbed of half my life. Now, think. How long did you stay on the mountain? I... I don't know. Somehow, I, I managed to get the car turned around. I, I drove back to town. I found a doctor. What's his name? I... I don't know. What 
What did he say? I can't remember. Arche, I came here to warn you. The mountain, it's haunted. It's cursed. Give up the project. Mrs. Dollard, call Dr. Watterson. No. No. Doctor can't help me anymore. But I can help you, R.J. Give it up. Give up the project. Dr. Watterson? Ah, yes, yes. Keep him on fluids, and whatever you do, see that he remains absolutely calm. That was the resident. About George? No change in his condition. Have you checked the local doctor? The one who saw him first. Well, we called him. He reports he treated a man of about 70 for exhaustion. That's all you could get out of him? And that's all he had to say. And what have you got to say, Doctor? We find that George Morrissey has the physical signs of a man in his 70s. But you know very well he is not in his 70s. Chronologically, no. Medically, yes. Is there a disease that could age a man so radically in so short a time? Uh, I would say a man could be ravaged by some psychic or physical attack, but here we have no signs of trauma. His tissues, organs, nervous system, circulatory system, they show the deterioration that could only be caused by aging. Let's cut through all this, Doctor. How did it happen? We don't know. You don't know. Am I supposed to buy this nonsense about a haunted mountain, curses, and all that? I don't have the answer, R.J. Watterson, over the years, I have contributed millions for medical research. I bought this whole hospital for you. So, are you telling me that now, when I need some answers, I'm not going to get anything for my money? I'm telling you that we have no answers at this time. Hmm. Is it possible that George could be faking why should he want to fake? Answer my question. The answer's no. I want to see him. He's very weak. Is it important? I don't make unimportant requests. Well, just for a minute or two at most. And please, don't excite him. I, I won the club championship and I was named third team All-American. George. <laughs> Girls, you should see how the girls would fall all over George, me. George, pay attention. Huh? Oh. Oh, it's, it's you, R.J. Listen. No, 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 George. Don't try to sit up, but I've got to talk to R.J. Listen, R.J., are you listening? I'm listening. Here's what happens to you up there on the mountain. I remember, you see. Now I remember. Yeah, R.J., don't excite me. I please. accept full responsibility. Up there on that mountain, I was told... You will lose that which you value most. Told? You say told? How? By whom? I, I don't know. How can we get anywhere if you keep saying you don't know? Uh, Think. Uh, R.J., I order you from this room. He's going to die soon, anyhow. We have to get that information. R.J., I will call security and have the guards throw you out of here. No, no, doctor. No, leave us alone. This is between R.J. and me. What were you told, George? I, I wasn't really told. It was more like a, a kind of feeling, an idea that, that seemed to, to seep into me. And I realized the most important thing, what mattered most to me, was my body. Talk sense. I'm talking sense, R.J. And I began to lose my body. What do you mean, lose your body? The way you really lose it. To old age. Only, oh God, only I was losing it then and there. And all at once. Is that what you think happened, Morrissey? But look, look, I, I got away from there, you see. I got away just before I would have died. But why? I should have stayed. Look at me. What good am I now? Be calm and practical, George. We have the greatest doctors in the world here. We'll beat this thing. Uh, you can still beat it, R.J. You, you can still beat it. Just don't go near that mountain. Just give up the project. Well, 
You wanted me, Mr. Johnson? As Parker called while I was out. Yes, sir. He reported in. Consolidated stock is still falling. That's good. National computer is rising. And Starlight Oil is doing well with the new government. Tell him to increase our holdings by 10%. Now, cancel the rest of today and all of tomorrow. Yes, sir. Call Chuck Daly. I want him here in three quarters of an hour. Uh, sir. What is it? Well, Chuck's about to leave for Florida. His daughter's getting married this afternoon. Tell him he is to fly me up to the Manitou Mountain area. But, Mr. Johnson... Now, what is it, Mrs. Dollard? You can't go up to Manitou Mountain. Why not? You saw what happened. What did happen? You saw George Morrissey. About George Morrissey. Either he caught a disease... But medical science doesn't know of such a disease. Medical science is constantly being surprised. Obviously, someone does not want me to develop the Manitou Mountain Resort Complex. And perhaps they managed to buy George Morrissey. But I would bet my life on George Morrissey. You must never bet your life on anybody, Mrs. Dollard. The nearest town to Manitou Mountain is Lafayette Center. Reserve a room for me there at the motel. But he is George Morrissey. Fingerprints, dental records. Reserve it under the name R.J. Smith. Mr. Johnson, are you going up there alone? You know perfectly well, Mrs. Dollar, that the way to get something done is to do it yourself. But isn't it dangerous for you to go? Mrs. Dollard, I have complete freedom of action because, as you know very well, practically nobody on the outside has the faintest idea of what I look like. How many days do you plan to spend with us, Mr. Uh, Smith? Well, that all depends. Oh? On what? Uh, do you suppose I could hire a car and driver? Oh, let's see. I have some cards here. Pick out any name. Tell them Doris Evans over at the motel recommended you. Do you mean I need a recommendation to hire a car? Well, it's deer season. Can't expect a man to concentrate on his business. I would think you can if you pay him and he recognizes his obligation. Well, I can see you're a very serious-minded person, Mr. Smith. What brings you up to our um, frivolous part of the world? I intend to do some sightseeing. Sightseeing? Well, I hear you have some very beautiful country. Oh, yes, we do have a lot of very beautiful country up here. Wild, unspoiled... And we aim to keep it that way, too. Uh, tell me, is there a doctor in town? Oh, I hope nothing's wrong. I wouldn't want you to get sick on us while you're here. No, I should just be checked every now and then. Oh, well, we do have Doc Stallings. Does he have office hours now? <laughs> His office hours are when he's not hunting or fishing. But I think he'd give up a chance at a 12-point buck for you. Why? Well, he doesn't get an opportunity like this every day. To do what? To treat the world-famous R.J. Johnson. I see. Uh, how did you know oh, I... Oh, I'm sorry. Really, I, I shouldn't have given it away. After all, if you want to call yourself Mr. Smith, we should indulge that little conceit. But how did you know? Mr. Johnson, the whole town knows you're up here. Why, we've all been waiting for you. <laughs> We've all been waiting. Waiting for what reason? Had they also been waiting for George Morrissey? And George was only R.J. Johnson's hired man. We'll be back shortly with Act Two. For children growing up in homes without books, there's a special emptiness. A deep-down hunger for the world beyond the street corner or playground. A world where they could grow up to become whatever they want to be. The millions of these children will never find out about that world because they'll never know what they can learn in books unless you help. Riff, reading is fundamental, is helping to get millions of books into the hands of these boys and girls. Books they can choose themselves for keeps. And once a child gets into books, there's no stopping him. More than 150 local Riff programs are proving it in communities like yours. Won't you help Riff help the children in your community? Write to Riff Incorporated. That's RIF, care of Smithsonian Institution, Washington, D.C., 20560. Give your head to a friend. Give your heart to your love. What is your code? To contact the sooner the better. Hey, I'm back. How's that cold? Rotten. Get the contact? I got everything. Contact, cold tablets, and this liquid. Oh, no. 
Honey, it's all cold medicine. Well, sure, but it only takes one contact for up to 12 hours, continuous relief from sneezy, drips, congestion. For that, I'd need six of your cold tablets. Two every four hours. Or three ounces of nighttime liquid. One every four hours. Or just one contact. The tiny time pills do it. Well, it's all cold medicine. Those others contain antipyretic analgesics. The liquid, antitussive, and alcohol. They're not in contact. Six or three or one. I choose the one contact. Me too. And I'm the one with the cold. Get it cold. Six or three or one. When you catch a cold, take contact. Only as directed. One of the world's wealthiest men sits in the tiny lobby of a small motel in an out-of-the-way village somewhere in the Adirondacks. And suddenly he feels that all of his money and power somehow seem to be very far away at this anxious moment. You say the whole town's been waiting for me, Mrs. Evans? Yes, we've been waiting. Why? Well, you own us now. I own you. In a manner of speaking. You own all the land that surrounds this village. I would think of myself as more of a neighbor. Well, we don't think your plans for the area will make you a good neighbor. You had your chance to protest against the project at the hearing. And we did. And after the legislature weighed all the pros and cons, they acted in the interests of the entire state, not your narrow provincial prejudices. You really believe that, don't you? I certainly do. Well, we know why certain votes went a certain way. Oh, do you? Suppose you tell me. We know there was bribery and pressure. Really? None of this was found by the special prosecutor's office. Well, I must admit, though, I admire your courage. My courage? To come up here all alone without your thugs. Oh, just a minute, Mrs. Evans. Oh, they have clean fingernails, excellent manners, college degrees. But they help you to steal and cover your tracks. In that sense, they're no better than common thugs. You really believe that, don't you? Now, let me set you straight. I have never done anything illegal. Oh, you can't be serious. No court has ever found me guilty of any crime. Congratulations. But here's what I am guilty of. Success. And this has earned me the envy and the hatred of millions of people. But that's human nature. I understand that. What I don't understand is the attitude of the people in this town. I'm not taking anything from you. I'm going to make every one of you rich. Can't you believe it? Oh, yes. We believe it. Do you have any idea how property values in this town will skyrocket when the development is here? Yes, indeed. Then why is everybody so unhappy? You know, you remind me of my husband. My late husband, that is. In what way? He was an unsuccessful version of you. He also worshipped money. But he didn't know how to make it. Now, what happened to your husband? He went up to what your investment brochure calls Manitou Mountain... Dead Man's Mountain, we called it around here, and it... Well, it killed him. How could the mountain kill him? It's an old Indian legend. Unless your conscience is completely clear, that mountain will kill you. Well, it killed poor Sidney Evans, rest his soul. Killed him? How? He was discovered at the foot of it. He was completely shriveled. Must be an explanation. Doc Stallings never found it. He just wrote it up as death due to causes unknown. Stallings is, after all, only a country doctor. That's right, he is. Tell me, how do your high-powered city doctors explain Mr. Morrissey? Who do you know about Mr. Morrissey? The whole town knows about Mr. Morrissey. Poor Mr. Morrissey, he went up there. Something he had no business doing. I must correct that. He had every business doing it. He was my agent inspecting my property on orders from me. But the fact is, he went up there, and the mountain got him. Have other people met with mysterious results after climbing that mountain? Oh, very few and far between. We may be just country folk up here, but we learn from experience. Are you Dr. Stallings? Well, look who's here. 
They said you'd be out fishing. Uh, well, that's never a bad guess, but it takes two, and the trout won't play. I'd like to talk to you. Sure. I'm willing to pay you for a consultation. Oh, I intend to charge you. Well? Well, what? Well, aren't you going to come up here out of the water? Well, you see, I got my eye out for a certain brown trout. So you just tell me your symptoms, and I'll decide whether I have to examine you. An employee of mine. You treated him recently. George Morrissey. Oh, him. What happened to George Morrissey? Well, I met him at the motel. It was a Thursday night. I go there for dinner whenever Doris Evans serves pot roast. Hey, you're lucky. She's having it tonight. About Mr. Morrissey. Oh, he was a serious kind of fellow. About like you. Same no-nonsense, let's get right down to it attitude. I'm only interested in what happened to Morrissey. What uh, happened? Well, he wanted to hire somebody to drive him up to Dead Man's Mouth. And nobody would do it. That's right. Why? Well, you've been told why by now, I'm sure. I'm asking you why. I'll tell you the same thing. That's impossible. Why is it impossible? Oh, I see what you're thinking. It's all right for the simple-minded hicks up here to swallow that superstitious nonsense, but me, I'm a doctor. A product of a highly sophisticated, specialized education. That's exactly what I'm thinking. Well, think again, because I believe it too. There has to be a reasonable, logical, rational explanation for what happened to George Morrissey. Oh, there is, there is. He offended the spirit of the mountain. Oh, you consider that reasonable, logical, rational? Would you feel better if I said there's something up in that mountain, a virus, a bacillus, a fungus, which somehow causes immediate aging? It would be a more rational explanation. <laughs> You mean more acceptable. I want to know what you believe, and I'll pay you for it. I believe the evidence. If you go up there, you can die. But why? Because a great spirit lives up there, and he values his privacy. That's impossible. I saw George Morrissey at dinner one night, a vigorous, athletic-looking man in his 30s. I saw him again the following evening, a broken old man, half dead. And you explain it with this half-baked legend. Uh, well, how do your city doctors with all their modern facilities explain it? Your Dr. Watterson, a world-famous diagnostician, he called me. He asked me. This thing has to be cleared up. Why? What's wrong with a nice, quiet mystery? If word of this becomes general, it can destroy the entire project. Uh-huh. Is that bad? Millions of people will be deprived of an opportunity to enjoy healthful recreation in a fresh country environment. Ah, but it won't be fresh country, you see. You'll have super highways and smoke and noise and honky-tonk resorts. I'm convinced that you people are up to something. Well, you tell me what. I don't know. But I assure you, I have the resources to find out. Well, if you ever do, let me know. Well, did you find Doc Stallings? My secretary should have called me on the hour. Oh, she did. We served dinner till 9.30, but the best time to eat's around 6. From then on, it's leftovers. I'll have a sandwich sent up to my room. Oh, you're joking. I don't tell jokes. You mean all you want for dinner is a sandwich? Mrs. Evans, food is merely fuel. The body is just a machine, and so my tastes are very simple. Whom do rich men think they impress when they say they have simple tastes? Do you have a wife? I never married. Oh? Well, so far we've eliminated wine and women. I can see by looking at you that the, there isn't too much song. Well, what do you do with all your money? I make it grow. Well, whatever you do, don't go up that mountain. I don't think I need any more advice from anyone around here. I would like to place a call to New York. You go up, up that mountain, and when you come down, you'll be penniless. You have my secretary's number there. Please put it through. Just remember, I told you. It's exactly five minutes past four, Mrs. Dollard. I know that, sir. Why haven't you heard from Parker? I'm expecting a call any moment. Any moment was not his orders. I specifically directed him to report on the hour. Yes, sir. Why is there a delay? I don't know. Well, find out. Mr. Johnson, I'm only human. What did you say, Mrs. Dollard? Mrs. Dollard? 
Operator. Operator. Now, see here, Mrs. Evans. Oh, Mr. Johnson, I was just trying to reach your room. I've been cut off in the middle of a crucial telephone call. Carlotta, the phone company operator, she just told me that we can't get through to New York for a bit. What are you saying? Well, you've seen those signs along the roads. Look out for falling rocks. Well, we just had a pretty good slide on Route 640. But I must talk to New York. A lot of wires are down, but Ed Bailey and his boys will have it fixed before long. Oh, Hi, Doc. Hello, Doris. And why does the celebrated R.J. Johnson look so agitated? Well, he can't make a phone call. Oh, my, my, my. You know, Mr. Johnson, as a physician, I have a prescription that could keep you healthy and happy for years. Doctor, I'm in no mood for your folksy philosophy. I have to make a phone call. Don't you want to hear my prescription? How long will it take to repair the lines? So, maybe an hour. An hour? Maybe less. I would prescribe the following. Chuck it all, Mr. Johnson. Give it up. Settle down here and marry Doris. Oh, I'm not sure I'd want to marry him, Doctor. I'm not out to marry anybody. Oh, why not? What's going on in this town? Are you people crazy? Where's the police station? The, the police station? Well, we, uh, we do have a sheriff. Send for him. What do you want the sheriff for? There has to be some kind of plot. Uh, where can I find the sheriff? Oh, you don't have to find him. He's, he's coming in the door right now. Hi, Elwood. Evening, folks. Ah, a gentleman here wants to see you, Elwood. Yes, sir. Sheriff, I need your help. That's what we're here for, sir. My name is R.J. Johnson. Pleased to meet you. Sheriff, these people are trying to... Uh, these people are trying to... Uh, yes, sir. These people are out to do me harm. Which people? Among others, these two. Yeah, but Doc Stallings here is the greatest guy you'd ever hope to meet. Matter of fact, he takes care of me. And I personally vouch for Doris. She's my sister. A very nice, tidy little town. And the natives are so friendly and obliging. And so concerned with your well-being. But right now, R.J. Johnson feels overwhelmed by their solicitude. As if he is being literally killed with kindness. We'll return shortly with Act Three. Ever see a beer drinker pour his beer real easy down the side of the glass? Maybe you do it yourself. If so, the Budweiser brewmaster thinks you're missing something. Especially if you're a Budweiser drinker. You see, Bud is brewed, so it will kick up a healthy head of foam. Exclusive beechwood aging and natural carbonation make it a lively brew. Well, anyway, pouring Bud plunk down the middle of the glass helps bring out the best in that clean white Budweiser foam and real beer aroma. It also helps you get the full benefit of a taste, smoothness, and drinkability you'll find in no other beer at any price. Remember, brewing beer right does make a difference. Next time, pour that Budweiser right down the middle and see for yourself. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. I'm Art Linkletter, and I'd like to talk about something that everybody loves. Babies. Play School has introduced a group of fascinating baby toys. Play School, a Milton Bradley company has been making toys for generations of preschool children. And their baby toys are just terrific. They're fun and safe. Babies will love the baby action ball. They can grasp it, roll it, shake it, or throw it. The baby mirror of unbreakable stainless steel introduces them to the most important person in the world when they look into the mirror themselves. The play school toddler truck is great for baby to scoot around in. And it even has a miniature telephone for babies' first phone calls. My children are grown up now. But if they were babies, I know what I'd want them to have. The Play School Baby Toys. Your children are going to love making discoveries every day with Play School's new baby toys. And every day is a good day to make a baby happy. Are the people of Lafayette Center the kindly, generous-hearted folks they seem to be? 
Or is this a place of evil where death waits for strangers, especially a wealthy stranger like R.J. Johnson? How are these good people out to harm you, Mr. Johnson? I don't know, Sheriff, but something is going on. And I demand protection until I can get some of my own people up here. Hey, you've got to appreciate my position, Mr. Johnson. There's nothing I can do unless you make a charge. Well, we're only trying to help him, Elwood. You see, I look at this man's face and I hear the tension in his voice and I see his, uh, his color, you know? So I say to him, change your way of life. Settle down up here. Is that harming him? Well, it doesn't seem like it. I recommend a more regular routine. And we both keep warning him, stay away from Dead Man's Mountain. Mr. Johnson? Think about for reasons best known to yourselves, you people are determined to keep strangers at a distance. Oh, we'd only be too happy if more folks would move up here. And so you invented this nonsense about a cursed and haunted mountain. But why? You know why, Sheriff. Because to any man of intelligence and courage, it presents a challenge. But before a man goes up there, you prepare him. Well, gentlemen, you can stay and listen to all this. I've got to serve dinner. By all means, Mrs. Evans. We can continue this discussion at the table. Oh, I thought all you wanted was a sandwich. Oh, no. Tonight, I'm having all the trimmings. Here you are, Mr. Johnson. Thank you. Pot roast, mashed potatoes, peas and carrots. Now, that's a cure for whatever ails you. Uh, hold on. Dr. Stallings, change plates with me, please. Why? It's the same portion. Except I always give you a little bit less, uh, Doctor. Would you mind changing plates, Doctor? No, not if you tell me why. Since I'm going up to the mountain, there could be something in this food. A drug, perhaps. Oh, I like that. <laughs> Very well, Mr. Johnson. Here, have it your way. Uh, you say you're going up the mountain? Yes. After all we told you? I'm going up that mountain to prove that it's just an ordinary piece of undeveloped country real estate. Can you stop him? Why well, would everybody want to stop me? Well, look what it did to your Mr. Morris. Suppose, for the sake of argument, there is something dangerous up there. And it gets me. Isn't that to your interest? Without me, there can't be a development project. Well, we have a more basic interest. We have obligations as human beings. Well... Now, I will need a car. There's a road, I assume. Oh, yes, sir. Leads up to the top. But why go now? At night? Because the word should get around. R.J. Johnson drove up this... this dead man's mountain, as you call it, in the dead of night, and just as calmly drove down again. But, Mr. Johnson, you really... You have something to learn, Mrs. Evans. You think a man becomes rich through trickery, violence, and all manner of illegal, immoral, and unethical acts. I never said that. But you believe it. Tonight, you're going to discover how I became rich. By daring to do what other people consider impossible. It's that simple. I uh, would still advise you to keep away from that mountain. Let's end the little game, Doctor. I have humored all you people long enough. Well, very well. How do you account for George Morrissey? Very simple. George Morrissey is not R.J. Johnson. Oh. Does the spirit of the mountain, going along with the legend, kill everyone whose conscience is not clear? Very well. I'm safe. My conscience is unblemished. Elwood, I still think you should stop him. The sheriff has no right to interfere. I'm merely inspecting my own property. Well, he's right, Doris. A little exercise in morality here. Who would care to accompany me? You look down on me. You are the pillars of virtue. You mean there isn't a clear conscience among the three of you? I'll drive you. Doris. Doris, what are you saying? He's challenged us. But, Doris, you know you can't fight the mountain. Well, we can't let somebody else get killed up there either. Well, what can you do? Well, at the first sign of anything suspicious, I can turn the car around. Mr. Johnson, you've got yourself a driver. And I suggest we leave right now. The moon goes down early around here. Oh, uh, first I have to call New York. But the lines are still down. How do you know? Carlotta will let us know when they're fixed. Maybe I'd better wait. Oh. Don't tell me you're starting to have uh, second thoughts. I have some very important things to check out. Well, we can drive to the top of the mountain and back again in an hour. How do you know? Have you done it before? No. Just a guess. 
And I'm ready if you are. Well? What is it, Mrs. Evans? Well, we're here. We're at the foot of Dead Man's Mountain. And there, you see, on your right, Hmm? is the dirt road that leads upward. How far? Oh, I don't know. Well, what are we waiting for? You won't change your mind, Mr. Johnson? No. I still don't understand why you have to do this. This is another reason why I'm a rich man. I buy stock nobody else believes in. I finance schemes other people think are harebrained. I back men no one else will work with. And I climb mountains everyone else is scared by. I'm climbing this mountain, too. Then you also deserve to be rich. Well, do we go ahead, or do we turn back? One must always go ahead, Mrs. Evans. Then, here goes. How do you feel, Mrs. Evans? All right. I guess. You guess? How do you feel? I don't have to guess. I know. I feel great. It should be interesting. What? Let's assume all you people are right. This mountain is haunted by a great spirit who strikes down all who have guilt. Which one of us do you suppose he'll strike down? Well, I don't have a guilty conscience. I wonder about that. I heard the doctor say you had a weakness for men with problems. Your late husband. Maybe he didn't have problems. Maybe you had the problems. Well, we all have problems. Stop for a moment. What's the matter? I think I... I heard somebody. I haven't heard a sound. Uh, Listen. R.J., I'll have the security guards throw you out of here. It's Watterson. It's Dr. Watterson. What's he doing up here? Who's Dr. Watterson? He's looking after George Morrissey. I'll throw you out of here. Didn't you hear him? There's no one around but you and me. Now that I think of it, that's a strange way for Watterson to talk to me. He would never have the guts to say that unless, unless he knew something. Look, I think we'd better turn no, 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 around. No, 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 I think I'm learning something. Watterson, do you know that Watterson is Parker's son-in-law? Well, who's Parker? My administrative assistant. He executes all my orders. Suppose Consolidated Industries is not going down. Suppose it's starting to go up. Suppose Parker is still holding... Oh, come on, Mr. Johnson. Just just relax, huh? Now, if it's too much for you up here, let's turn back... Tell me, Mrs. Evans, how did you know I'd be here? We we just assumed... No one told you. Who would tell us? A pilot. My pilot. I didn't even know you had one. He may have been put out because I made him fly me here on his daughter's wedding day. Oh? Well, that really wasn't nice. I pay him enough, but he didn't tell you. No. Listen. I don't hear Shut anything. Just listen. There. I'm only human, Mr. Johnson. I'm only human. Why would she answer me like that if she didn't know something? I don't hear a thing, Mr. Johnson. I'm only human. I'm only human. Let me tell you about her. She's quiet. She's almost mousy. But she's ambitious. I can tell. I've made her a rich woman. She's in on it. She's in on it, too. She and Parker and Morrissey. They worked it out. And you're in on it, too. Me? They wanted me out of the way. And so all of you got together. You worked up this phony scheme. Look, we're going to turn back. Answer the phone. What phone? Answer it. Hello. Hello. Mr. Johnson, I have the latest quote on Consolidated. It's going up. It can't go up. It's gone up five points so far. Get Parker. Close it out. Close it out. I can't find Parker. Get him. Get him. Mrs. Dollard. Mrs. Dollard. Who are you talking to? My secretary. She hung up on me. How could she hang up? 
there's no phone. Consolidated is going up. But there's no stock market at night. Mr. Johnson, it's going crazy. National computer is going down. Have Parker sell at once. I can't find Parker. Mrs. Dollard. Mrs. Dollard! She's gone again. Listen to me, Mr. Johnson. Please listen. Do you know how much money I've lost so far? Please, listen. You you have nothing to be afraid of. It's just a legend. Who can be sure it's true? Oh, sure, we we local people push it to scare away developers. I feel weak. As if I lost a lot of blood. Listen. You're R.J. Johnson. You're not to be taken in with this superstitious nonsense. Fight it off. I I, I can't. I'm trying. But all my strength is going. My money is disappearing. Your money isn't your strength. It is. It is. I, I have nothing else. Please answer the phone for me. I can hardly lift the receiver. The rebel government just nationalized Starlight Oil. What? What, is, what? what did you say? Mrs. Dollard. Mrs. Dollard. Mr. Johnson. We're leaving. What? It, it happened. Everything. Everything I was afraid of. Happened. Consolidated. Went up. National went down. And Starlight. Nothing happened. It's all your imagination. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson. Talk to me. Mr. Johnson. <laughs> Doris, I don't know. There isn't a mark or a sign on him. It's as if all the force and vital energy just left his body. Well, maybe it's all for the best. He was in trouble. Trouble? It was on the news. Some of his holdings went haywire for some reason. Three big companies. He's out millions. He may have died just in time. <laughs> the mountain. The mountain. What what about the mountain? It's true. Every word we say about it. It's true. Oh, come on, sis. How can it be true? The mountain killed him. It took away his money. Doris, are you all right? I I don't know. I don't know yet. I I wonder. What did it do to me? What did it do to Doris? Everybody loses what he values most up on Dead Man's Mountain, as the saying goes. Maybe Doris had fallen in love with R.J., and thus the mountain robbed her, too. I'll be back shortly. Who knows how to help you solve your shopping problems? Your better business bureau knows. For heaven's sake, this store won't give me back my $25 for the ice skates. All they would give me is this credit slip, and they don't even have any more skates in my size. Oh, what am I going to do? Madam, not all stores make cash refunds on returns, you know. Who are you? I'm the man from the Better Business Bureau. You know, only some stores will make refunds because it's their policy to do so, not because they're required to do so. Next time, remember, find out about a store's policy on refunds and exchanges before you buy. I guess you're right. Well, you know, it's just another tip from your better business group. Haunted Mountains. Did this one cause certain stocks to go up and down one day recently? It certainly seems no more far-fetched than some of the explanations people have for the market. 
The cast in our exercise in The Extraordinary included Alan Hewitt, Bryna Rayburn, William Redfield, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. The only way to learn how to swim is to jump in the water, right? I simply can't make you understand, can well, I? Well, maybe I can make you understand. Ah, forget it. You want to get that dinner ready? I'm hungry. Yes, yes, I'm going now. Uh, look, uh, why don't you change first? Change? Yeah, yeah, your clothes. Get more comfortable. Yes, I think I'd like to do that, George. I, I won't be long. Take it easy. That's my surprise. That's it. Tell him. Get him out of here. Please, George. Take him away. It's only a dog for Pete's <laughs> sake. He's not going to hurt you. Get it out. George. Please. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time... Pleasant dreams. KRLD's Mystery Theater presents seven thrilling dramas each week. can say for certain how many times we are destined to live. This brief span, this tiny flicker, this feeble shout, can this be all? For all eternity? There must be more to it. Or is there? Our mystery drama, The Angels of Devil's Mountain, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Warren Stevens. It is sponsored in part by... This is the film. It's featured on... Donald K. Farlow drives through the summery Connecticut countryside. Donald K. Farlow, at 41, is scarcely five pounds heavier than he was 20 years ago when he was named All-Ivy League running back. Of course, he has some silver in his hair, which is neither as thick nor as luxuriant as it used to be. His chin seems somewhat heavier, but all in all, time has been kind. At this moment, Donald seems to have a problem. He feels a nagging little pain in the region of his heart. Nothing serious or unbearable, but uh, it persists. And when Donald sees the sign that says motel, he decides to do the sensible thing. Do you have a reservation, Mr... Uh, Farlow. Uh, no, I don't. Well, it, it doesn't matter. Put you up anyhow. These days, nobody's turning away business. How long you plan on staying with us? Oh, I, uh... I don't know. I, I just don't know. Uh, Miss, uh... Miss... Uh, that's Mrs. Collins. My husband, Harry... That is, my late husband, Harry, bought this place, and May I... May I ask you something, Mrs. Collins? Why are you staring at me? Am I staring? Well, I probably the am. The reason I ask is... That's so obvious. Oh, that bad, huh? Well, the, the minute you walked in through the front door and approached the desk, I was all set to say, Hi, how you doing? The, the way you greet someone you know. Oh, do I look like someone you know? Oh, yes, definitely. Who? Oh, I don't know. And yet, your face is so familiar. Well, 
I've never been in this area before. But could you be someone I, I might have seen on the TV? Oh, no. I mean, you're not a star or somebody in a commercial or something like that? No, nothing like that. Or a celebrity? Hardly. I've seen you. I know I've seen you. Well, it'll come to me sooner or later. We'll put you in room 124. That's uh, just around to your right. Uh, uh, oh, you... Thank you. Are you okay, Miss Farr? Uh, <clears throat> yes. Uh, yes, I'm all right. Well, you, you look as if something's bothering you. No, I, uh, I'm fine. I'm just fine. Yeah? Marvin... Uh, you finished at the pool yet? How can I finish when you call me every 15 seconds to ask me something? Marvin, a, a man just checked in, room 124. Now, what I want you to do is go... Go there. Why? Well, just take up an excuse. Say say you want to make sure the air conditioning's okay. What for? Marvin, that man's killing me. What? I mean, I, I'm, I'm just dying. He reminded me of somebody, and I just can't place him. You know something... You've got altogether too much curiosity to run a motel. Marvin, it'll just take you a second or two. Go to his room and see who he reminds you of. Daddy? You seen him? Yeah. Well? I tell you something, Daddy. That, that man is familiar. I mean, he's really familiar. Well, I know, I know, but why? He's a spitting image of... Who? Who? I don't know who, but I've seen him. I, I know him from somewhere. No. You see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I know that guy. Well? He looks the same age as me. We, we might have been in the service together. Maybe he was somebody I knew in Korea. Then why should he look familiar to me? Oh, yeah, yeah. I see what you mean. But I'm positive the... I'm positive the Army's got something to do with it. What do you mean, the Army? Well, I don't know. It's just that I, I look at this guy, and for some reason, I just think of the Army. Well... Maybe he's in the army, and for some reason, his picture's been here in the paper. No, no, I never saw his picture in the paper, but... Hey, now that you say picture, I... I did see it someplace. You sure, Marvin? I'm not sure of nothing. All I know is the guy looks familiar, and I, I just can't place him. Well, take another good look. He's headed toward the desk now. Oh. Well, hello there, Mr. Farlow. Uh, do you... Do you have a doctor nearby? Doctor? Oh, Mr. Farlow, something's wrong. I knew it. Well, it's, uh... I don't think it's serious. Well, if you're sick, you come to the right place. We got Devil's Mount Memorial Hospital here with the finest hospital What's in the What's the matter, Mr. Farlow? I I think perhaps it might be wise for me to check in. It's your heart. Them. It's your heart, isn't it? I can tell by that look on your face. Marvin, you bring that station wagon around to the front. <laughs> I'm happy to be able to tell you, Mr. Farlow, that we can find nothing, but absolutely nothing out of the way. Your cardiogram is completely normal. Ah, that's a relief. Pressure, respiration, heartbeat. We just aren't able to find anything. And yet you have this pain. Yes, Doctor. That's why I stopped here, in this town. Mm -hmm. Originally, I was going to... Tell me, do you have any cardiac history? No, sir, not that I know of. And the pain? Describe the pain. Well, it doesn't seem to be the kind of pain that... Well, that I've been told to associate with a heart attack. Mm -hmm. Just more of a, a stabbing pain, as if well, as if I'd been stabbed. Mm, Doctor. Uh, yes? Uh, Doctor, why are you staring at me? Uh, I wasn't aware that I was. Well, you are? Why, well, you still are. Uh, well, let me tell you something else. Everybody, everybody in this town has been staring at me. Everybody? Yes. Well, who? What do you mean by everybody? Everybody I've met. First, the lady who runs the motel. Dottie Collins. Yes, and, and the fellow who seems to be the handyman. He actually knocked on my door on some pretext just to look at me. Are you sure? And then the, the technician right here, the one who gave me the cardiogram. She kept staring at me. It must be your imagination. Is it? Now, do I imagine that you're staring at me now? Mr. Farlow... Haven't we met before? I couldn't say so. You look so familiar to me. Well, you don't appear at all familiar to I me. I know you from somewhere. Well, this entire town, it seems, knows me from somewhere. But no one can say exactly where. Now, look, 
I've done nothing that would call me to public attention. Certainly not up here. I'm not a famous uh-huh. person. Uh, you, you, you've never been up this way before. I've only been in the state of Connecticut twice. And each time was more than uh, 20 years ago. It was when Pennsylvania played Yale at the bowl. Mm-hmm. Well, was your picture in the local papers at the time? I don't even remember. Now, are you telling me that people would recall a college football game of more than well, two decades ago? In the face of a visiting player? No, Mr. Farlow, I, I'm only trying to create a basis of reality for what seems so mysterious. Well, and that little girl who took my cardiogram, she, she probably wasn't even born at the time. I know, I know. Well, what's the difference whether or not I remind you of someone? Oh, none, really. Well, what does it all have to do with what's wrong with me? Nothing, except... Mr. Farlow, we can't find anything at all that's wrong with you. Well, then, why do I have this pain in my heart? Your heart is absolutely sound. How can you say that? I have a pain here that that increases. It seems to increase in severity. It just keeps getting worse. Uh, Look, Dr. Steinberg, you remember the elderly white-haired gentleman who examined you? As did Dr. Higgins and Dr. Summers. Uh, We... We can call in other specialists, but you won't find better men anywhere. And all of them say that you are normal. But something is wrong. I feel it. Why do I have this terrible pain in my heart? Suppose you answer this. Do you need a heart attack? What? I don't believe I heard that. Do I need a heart attack? Why, why would anyone need a heart attack? It might come in Handy? Handy? Handy for what? A man will sometimes find himself in what might be described as an intolerable situation. He cannot face it. He cannot fight it. And yet, it will not go away. And so he seeks the haven, the protection of a serious illness. Why do you tell this to me? Mr. Farlow, tell me. Are you presently in some sort of intolerable situation? Doctor, I don't see that that is any concern of yours. A physician cannot treat an isolated part of his patient. He must consider the health of the entire human being. And I can find no physical basis for your pain. I've never felt it before. I never even knew what it was to be sick. And then yesterday morning, I was driving along the highway. I passed the sign, the the, the one that said, uh, Welcome to Devil's Mountain. I remember because... I asked myself, what kind of name is that? Devil's Mountain. And then there was this stab of pain, as if if I'd been shot through the heart. And it just won't go away. Well, the only thing I can say for you to do right now is just rest. What is wrong with me, Doctor? I don't know. And what's wrong with all of you in this place? Why do you all stare at me as if I'm someone you know? You don't know me. None of you knows me. Mr. Fowler, could you give me the name of your doctor in Philadelphia? No. But a discussion with a medical man who knows of your... I don't have a doctor in Philadelphia or anywhere else. Well, surely you must have I've never been sick a day in my life. You must have gone in for checkups. Why? I've always been in top shape. Oh, all right. Once again, I must ask you, Mr. Farlow, are you facing a desperate or even a serious problem? And what if I am? That could very well be what's causing the pain in your chest. My problem is that A company I've devoted my life to building up is now... Well, it's going to go under. Why? 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 Well, I'll tell you why. You can't fight City Hall. You can't fight government regulations. You can't fight the new contract demands, tight money. You, You just can't do it, that's all. But nobody wants to understand that. Who doesn't want to understand that? Who? My partners, my son. Could that be why you suddenly developed this pain in your chest? To get out of a fight? But I don't have to justify what I do to anybody. But you've got to do something about this pain. And you will have to help. Try to relax and get some sleep. Hi there, Doc. Hi. Medical Society lunch is in the Yankee room. Yeah. Uh, try the bean soup. Oh, I will. Oh, uh, by the by, that, that fellow we brought over to the hospital yesterday? Yes. He looked familiar to you, too? Yes, he certainly did. I just can't place him. Had me going all day and most of the night. But finally, I knew where I'd seen him before. You did? Mm Mm-hmm. You know what gave it away, finally? That pain in his chest. How could it? Think, Doc, think. Think of that pain. And then you'll know where you've seen him before. Mm Mm-hmm. Come on, Doc. Just think. (laughs) 
And while the doctor is thinking, we shall just steal away for a few seconds so that you can do some thinking, too. True, you don't have all the facts, but you do have enough to make an educated guess. Meanwhile, be inspired by the following words of wisdom, and before you know it, I shall return with Act Two. You see a face in the crowd. It's the face of no one you ever met. And yet, you know that face. But why? Yes, you have seen it before, but where? If only you had a hint, a clue. To the folks in the town of Devil's Mountain, Donald Farlow's is such a face. It's the face of a complete stranger, but why is it so familiar? You say you know where we've all seen Mr. Farlow before, Dottie? Yeah, yeah. It finally came to me. Well, tell me. It was the pain in the chest that did it. Funny. All of us have been looking at that face for years. Where? I can't tell you. I'd have to show you. Let's go. That is... If you're curious enough to miss lunch. I'm curious enough to miss your special bean soup, so you better have the goods. Well, Doc, we're here. Here? Right in here is where you'll find your answer. In the Devil's Mountain Revolutionary War Museum. Come on. Well? You mean by this time you don't know? Oh, you're overdue. You surely should have caught on by now. Well, I don't see anything that would remind me. What's the pride and joy of our memorial museum, Doc? The most valuable thing we got. Wait. That's right. You're looking square at it. That big painting said to be by Charles Wilson Peale. The women. The women of Devil's Mountain. Or the full title. The women of Devil's Mountain tending the wounded on the field of battle. And that fellow, smack in the middle of the picture... Die. It's like the whole picture is built right around it him. It does look like Donald Farlow. Looks like, Doc. It's him. It's one face. That's remarkable. He's lying there. And this woman is holding him in his arms. Oh, no wonder Marvin said this fellow reminded him of the army. It was the Revolutionary Army. You can be so familiar with something, but if you encounter it outside its everyday surroundings... And the pain in the chest. Uh, now, that should have given it away right off. <laughs> He's been shot or stabbed. See, see, see how his hand is, is pressed against his chest? Yes. And how the, how the blood is trickling through and the, the fingers? resemblance, it's, it's uncanny. Resemblance? Doc, it's the same face. Now, look at the hair. It's uh, black. Uh-huh. But with strands of gray in exactly the same places. Well. Well, what? There, there, there's the same dimple on the chin. Uh, it could be coincidence. Doc, it's him. It can't be. Why not? Because this picture was painted some 200 years ago. Everything about the painting, the face, even the... Well, now, look again. There's a birthmark just on the side of his left eye. Dottie, what are you trying to say? If you could even imagine what I'd like to say, you'd decide maybe I'd better be put away. Oh, no. Go on, say it anyhow. Oh, Mr. Farlow is the soldier in that painting. Hmm. How is that possible? Even if that soldier survived his wound, he'd still be dead for more than a century and a half. Well, I don't know how it's possible. I'm just telling you what I think. Oh, look at the face. He's the same soldier. Uh, Are you telling me he's the reincarnation of the soldier in the painting? I don't know anything about all that, and I couldn't care less. All I'm saying is, he's the same soldier. Now, don't ask me how or why. Now, when he drove through here, something came over him, and he... He felt that terrible pain again. Uh, I'm afraid I couldn't accept that diagnosis. Okay. It's your turn. How do you account for it? (sighs) I'm afraid I can't. Hello there. Oh, it's Mrs... Uh, Dottie Collins. You remember me. I I own the motel. Yes. Were you very kind? Well, I thought I'd drop around to see how you feel. I'm afraid I I don't feel any better. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. What did the doctor say? Well, the long and short of it seems to be that the, the pain is psychosomatic. Well, well why, why should that be? Oh. oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to pry. Oh, that's all right. No, it's not all right. I'm sure it's something highly personal. 
And one thing we pride ourselves on around here, we respect the next fellow's privacy. And yet, I feel I can talk to you. I don't know why. I, I'm not the kind of man who talks to strangers about personal things. I don't usually talk to strangers at all. But somehow I feel that we're not strangers. But I know we've, we've never met. Must be something about about this place. I I just can't explain it or understand it. Everybody thinks I look like somebody they know. I have this terrible pain that baffles the doctors. Well, no, it doesn't. They claim I've got it because I'm running away. Well, what are you well, running away from? A fight. You don't look like that kind to me. Well, this, this is a fight I can't win. Why? Because I'm up against... Too much money, too much power. Besides, I, I don't have to fight. You see, I could sell out to this big company and take a job with them. That'd be the smartest thing I could do. Why? Well, I, my own future would be assured. I, I wouldn't have to worry about debts or loans. I could save the jobs of maybe a hundred men in the long run. Besides, I wouldn't have to work so hard. Well, tell me what's wrong with all that. Well, nothing, really. Except that I could no longer call my soul my own. And that's why you've got this pain? Oh, there's a lot of medical jargon surrounding it, but I guess that's what it all boils down to. So how can you get rid of it? Ah, the way I'm going, I'll never get rid of it because, well, I get used to it. After a while, I won't even notice it. So I intend to leave here this afternoon. Go home and sign the agreement. Of course, there could be... Another reason why it hurts? No. The doctors have just about ruled out everything that might... You remember everyone stared at you? As if we all thought we knew you? Yes, and I'd like to know why. Well, it's because we do know you. You what? Everyone in this town. We've known you all our lives. Are you sure you're not all crazy? Yes, I'm sure. All of us who were born here and went to school here. We met you for the very first time when... When we were little kids. I wish I knew what you were talking about. The hero of Devil's Mountain. Look, uh, are you all right? Well, why do you ask? Why do I ask? Uh, do you realize what you're saying? How could I be the hero of whatever it is? Well, I may sound a little bit crazy, but that's only because I'm saying... Okay. I, I admit it sounds strange, but I'm sane. I'm sound. Ask anyone in town about me. Now, just exactly what are you trying to tell me? Can you come with me? Can you leave here? Well, yes, but where are you going to... I want you to meet someone. Who? I want you to meet yourself. Look at him. And here, here's my mirror. Now look at yourself. Look at your own face. Now. Now what do you say? But it's you. The soldier in that painting is you. And the pain you feel is his pain. Your pain. Well, I... I can't prove it. But I don't have to prove it. The things we really know are all past proving anyhow. There couldn't be two faces like that in all the world, in all of eternity. You have to be the same. The women. The women of Devil's Mountain. No... No, they're angels. They're the angels of Devil's Mountain. The angels? That's what I told Mr. Peel. Mr. Charles Wilson Peel. But I suppose he thought angels and devils couldn't go together. Mr. Farlow. Farlow? Who, who is Mr. Farlow? Oh, m m maybe you'd better sit down. They're angels. All of them are angels. You see? You yeah. see? Yeah, I see. Now, now, you just sit there on this bench. And uh, could I get you a glass of water? See? They've come out on the field. But the British artillery is still firing. And, and see? See how I've fallen. I, I've fallen in the fight. I I took a bayonet through the chest. I, but this one, this, this angel, she knelt beside me and she held me in her arms. Mr. Farlow. <laughs> I'm dying. No. No, don't say that. You, you, you'll be all right. But I, I don't regret it. It's, it's so much better to die in battle than to die of shame. Oh, please, try to... I, I must I must tell this to someone. I must. Now, now listen to me. Now listen. At, at first I said, no, never. 
Every day, someone else would march through the village. And it was always the same hey, thing. Hey, 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 hey. Colonel Josiah Hepburn is organizing a trip of light cavalry to fight the British tyrants. All able-bodied men. Cavalry, uh, artillery, infantry. Everybody wanted us to. Wanted us to enlist, to volunteer. Mr. Farlow, I, I think I'd better get you back to the hospital. Hospital? Oh, no. No, no, you don't know what it's like in a hospital, ma'am. The dirt, the screams, the, oh, the poor devils, how, how we die one by one. No, you, you, you just hold me, huh? I'll be all right. You just hold on to me. Drums, I guess. Drums. It's funny. No matter how smart a man is, he, he can't hold out forever against the drums. Please, don't talk. It's because the beat of the drums is, is like the beat of your heart. And sooner or later, that... It becomes the beat of your heart. I held out against the drums. I held out longer than anyone else. I, I held out. Father! Father! Here I am, Jeb. I done it, Pa. I, I went and done it. I see. I see the feather in your hat. I'm going to ride with Hepburn's cavalry. Oh, the British are right. He stuck a feather in his hat and called it macaroni. Now, Pa, you're, you're 17 years old. I'm old enough to fight, sir. But you're too young to die. Now, who's been filling your head with such nonsense? It ain't nonsense, Pa. You're damn right it ain't. It's treason. Uh, I don't recognize the authority of the King of England. Well, now listen. Listen to this bunch of plowboys who are now going to ride their horses instead of following them. Pa, I know you don't hold with... Hold with, with independence, but I wouldn't be so free with with my mouth. No, no, Pa, I, I tend no disrespect. In other words, mouth. That that would be smartest. It's, it's just getting so that a, a man has got to choose. Choose betwixt what? Well, you know, Pa, if you're for the crown, you, you better make plans to leave. If you're for independence, you better enlist. That's the choice? Yes, sir. You gotta choose one or the other. What do you say? What do I say? I say that... Well, I say those words William Shakespeare said. I say the truest words ever spoken. A plague on both your houses. And for some reason, a revolutionary war painting has become painfully alive for Donald K. Philo. Suddenly, he is back there in those troubled and turbulent times. And from what we have just heard, he doesn't seem to be in tune with those times, either. Well, the time has come for us to listen to some sage words of advice. And then I shall return with Act Three. The following thing... ...businessmen who handle everything themselves. Ten phone calls, they've got ten important letters out to any parts of the country. I think it makes your business more efficient. Well, what about the cost? For a few dollars, I can have the mailgram sent and a copy sent to me. The mailgram is definitely a value. It gives me additional time for other work. I've been talking with Harry O'Dell, one of many small businessmen who have discovered the convenience of mailgram. It's easy to send a mailgram. Just call Western Union's toll-free 800 number anytime, day or night. Mailgram. Impact of a telegram at a fraction of the cost. According to Mr. Henry David Thoreau, it is permissible for a man to march to the beat of his own drummer. However, this is never true during wartime. Then everyone must listen to one drummer only, and that is the drummer who sets the beat for the armed forces. Mr. Donald K. Philo has suddenly found himself back in our revolutionary struggle and completely at odds with the popular opinion of the day. Well, Pa, maybe you don't have to enlist. Maybe you're too old. I'm not too old, Jeb. I'm only 40. Well, what I'm trying to say is, Pa, nobody really has the right to expect you to join up. And so if I keep my mouth shut, maybe nobody will notice. Is that it? Well, yes, Pa. Well, I never kept my mouth shut in my whole life. I ain't going to start now either. Pa, you, you, you'd better do something. Are you be threatening me, son? Has this revolutionary nonsense driven the Bible's teachings from your head? Honor thy father, remember? Pa, I'm, I'm only telling you that... The diplomatic thing to do. I'm too old to be a diplomat, Jeb. I'm riding off early in the morning with Hepburn's cavalry. Give me your blessing, sir. I can't. Huh. 
Oh, yes, I could hold my hands over your head and, and bless your mission. But it would be a lie, because I don't believe in it. All right, Pa, I, I understand. I'll do the best I can without it. Good evening, Mrs. Porter. Good evening, sir. Well, may I have a mug of ale? Well, certainly, sir. Didn't know you served red coats here, Abby. He ain't a red cow, he's a sand cow. Yeah, somebody get a rope. That's right. Why doesn't somebody get a rope? There's but one of me and six or eight of you. Those are just about the safest odds, ain't they? Oh, you skulking, cowardly scum. I notice you won't try to hang me one at a time. There ain't going to be no hanging at all. Now, gentlemen, I must ask of all you to behave yourselves. It's my business to dispense hospitality to all who seek it. Here we are neither Yankee nor Tory. Ah, <laughs> remember the proverb. All men are alike in the sight of God and a tavern keeper. <laughs> I won't drink with no tree. Uh, me either. No, I don't. I'm not going to do it. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Porter. Maybe, uh, maybe I shouldn't come in here anymore. Well, why not? I'm driving away your trade. Tavern vagabonds. You don't notice them going off to fight. Not by a long shot. Well, it's not just the town loafers, ma'am. I'm not popular anywhere. No, I guess not. I can't help it. I'm a man who has to speak his mind. Men, I wonder why all of you think it's so important to say what you think. Now, look at us women. We never say a word, and we're happier for it. I only ask to be left in peace. Well, I might recommend you try to go spend some time in New York or Philadelphia. You do? Why? Well, because those are Tory cities. The British still hold them. And your views would be more in keeping with the popular sentiments. I won't be driven away from my land. I'm speaking frankly, sir. Do you know why you ain't been hung or jailed or tarred and feathered and ridden on a rail? Because of your son. Because of Jeb. Because he's a trooper with Hepburn's cavalry. Nobody wants to break that lad's heart. My son has caught the popular madness. Why do you call it madness? Because no better word describes it. This motley collection of... Country bumpkins. Yes, Mistress Porter, that's all we are. Provincials, rustics. That's how the British see us. We're a joke to them. Then they must be laughing with tears in their eyes. We bled them pretty bad at Breed's Hill up in Boston. And look what Ethan Allen and his boys have done. And our own Israel Putnam. Oh, but soon they'll begin to take us seriously. And then the ball will be over. Their invincible fleet will strangle us with a blockade. I must say, sir, you do take a dim view. I take a realistic view. And who needed this war? Hotheads in Boston? Slave owners in Virginia? Oh, now you know there's more to it than that. What more? We could have lived in peace. This nonsense about taxation without representation. The average person doesn't have the right to vote in Great Britain either. And what do we want to vote for anyhow? What, what does it matter what, what scoundrel has chosen to loot the public treasury and misgovern the country? It matters because we have the right to choose him and turn him out. I don't think it's a right worth dying for. It's the principle of the thing. Principles. <laughs> My principle is to be let alone, to live in peace, not to provoke a war which cannot be won. Why do you insist we can't win? Because the odds are against us. Common sense is against us. Reality is against us. The overwhelming weight of men, money, ships, guns, they're all against us. Oh, I agree. Well, then why do you support this insane enterprise? I, I agree that the odds are against us, but I insist we can win. Why? Because we must... Even in the face of yes, all... Yes, even in the face of all your overwhelming odds. And I should like to ask you, sir, why are you opposed to the cause of independence? I told you why. First, I would rather live in peace. Second, we have no chance of obtaining... Are you, are you sure there isn't a third reason? What's that? You're afraid to fight. Madam, I can assure you no man could ever say that to me. Oh, I don't mean that kind of fight. A fight that proves nothing settles nothing. I mean the fight for human freedom. I'm free now. Slavery isn't all bad. There are pleasant forms of it, too. The life we led here was in many ways the life of a slave. We were told what to do, what to raise, what to manufacture, what to buy, what to sell. We were plagued by restrictions, limits, boundaries. Everything was at the pleasure of a king and his tyrannical minister. I could live with it. Well, it takes all kinds. I guess maybe it does. Whoa, whoa there. Good morning, Reverend. Morning. I see you're packed for a journey. 
Yes? I, uh, uh, so... Come in. Rest a while. Have a bite. I can't. Have no time. See, the British are sending a raiding party all through the valley. Here? Our valley? Yeah. Do a little burning and killing. So most of the town's moving out. Heading north to Boston. But why? Well, as they say, we're a hotbed of rebel sentiment here. And we're to be taught a lesson. I don't think you got too much to worry about, though. Why? Why do you say that? Well, you're known as a supporter of the king. But I am not a supporter of the king. I don't support anyone in this madness. And even if that's so, you can't call what folk devoutly believe in madness. And you know how it is in time of war. You're not with us. You're against us. So, we are about to reap the whirlwind. I got to be moving on. As I say, I don't think you're in any danger. They'll sweep through here like savages. They'll, they'll carry off all the livestock. They'll loot and they'll burn the houses and barns. Uh, but not yours. Timmons. A neighbor by the creek, and Sanderson over at the edge of the woods. They're, they're off with Jeb, fighting with Jeb, down south with Hepburn's cavalry. I suppose those are the fortunes of war. These men are my neighbors. I could never face them again. If they return to find the labor of a lifetime destroyed, while everything that belongs to me still flourishes, I, I could never face my own son. It's too late now. They outnumber us, you know. They've always outnumbered us. Reverend, the village of Devil's Mountain will fight. We ain't got no soldiers. We never had soldiers. Who are we, anyhow? We're just farmers and shopkeepers, artisans and clerks. Now, who's our commander-in-chief? He's just a, a planter from Virginia. Reverend, the war is here. in your farms to be gutted, looted, burned to the ground. I intend to march to the South Meadow, take cover at the edge of the woods, and when they come up the road, we can hit them in the flank. We can turn them away. I intend to fight. Now, who's going to follow me? No one, huh? All right, I'll fight alone. Will you let him go on alone? Will you? What kind of men are you? Well, you there with the drums, strike off a march. Suddenly, caught me with it, Bayonet. Here, Parson, let me hold him. What are you ladies doing here? There are wounded men, Reverend. But the British may attack again. Reverend, don't let the men disperse. For, right. Form them up again. Right, I will. And see that they have enough ammunition. I'll try. Don't try to talk. You'll be all right. I'll try to stop the bleeding. Uh, I, I just lie still. Uh, who, who are you? You know who I am. Uh, you must be an angel. Oh, it hurts doesn't it? Oh, it's all right. You must be an angel. What's an angel doing on Devil's Mountain? I'm not afraid to die. You, you won't die. Oh, it's better to die this way. The other way, I, I could have stayed home. And I, I'd have died of shame. You won't die. You, you heal. See? The blood isn't flowing so quickly. Uh, You'll live to fight again. Yes. Yeah. I'll live. I'll fight again. I'll never stop fighting for, for what belongs to me. I'll fight. Never, never, never stop fighting. Whatever they, they have lined up against you, never stop fighting. They won't take away my factory. It's mine. It belongs to me. What am I saying? Are you all right, Mr. Farlow? Ye yes. Yes, I'm all right. Well, you look better. Better than what? Be better than you did before. Excuse me, ma'am. What am I doing here? Well, uh, you, you weren't feeling so good. I wasn't? And, and you stopped off at the Devil's Mountain Motel. 
How does it happen I can't remember any of this? Well, you had a... Well, a... A bad pain in your heart. I don't think I've ever had a bad pain in my life. The doctor would call it empathy, I think. Empathy? For whom? Well, uh, that wounded soldier in the painting. Hey, you know, I, I do think there's a slight resemblance. Well, I guess, uh, I guess I've been working too hard. Huh? I've been quite worried. And what I did was... Well, I must have been tired. I stopped at the motel and just passed out. Are you sure you're all right now? Oh, yes, positive. I have to get back home at once. I've got a lot to do. Funny. I never passed out before. And I don't remember coming here, either. How did I get here? Well, the the doctor thought a little walk might be good therapy. Well, it certainly was. I'm, I'm feeling just great. I'm much obliged to you. <laughs> well, what's funny? Well, it's... It's not funny. See those women in the picture, see? See how they're helping the wounded? Well, you're keeping the tradition alive. You helped me. Yeah, that's a beautiful painting. It's called The Angels of Devil's Mountain Tending the Wounded. Well, why do you say angels? It reads women... Oh, no, no. That's a mistake. It should be angels. <laughs> And he ought to know. Did he recover as the revolutionary soldier and marry Mistress Porter? We don't know. We don't even know if he married Dotty. All we know is the tale we told you. You notice, both ladies were innkeepers. Or were they the same lady? Nothing should stop you from providing a romantic ending if you think you want one. And I shall be back in just a few moments. We're all a little leery of the dark. <laughs> That's why some lonely night, you'll be glad you bought a Delco battery. A Delco quality battery with instant starting power. Delco batteries. Some lonely night, you'll be glad you bought one. SET Automotive Warehouse carries the largest selection of auto parts in the New Jersey area. If you are a jobber or wagon jobber, call Sherry Terstein at 201-567-6270. How long has it been since your car had a tune-up? If it's been too long, it could cost you money. Money for gas now, money for expensive repairs later. Save yourself some money with a tune-up at your Long Island Oldsmobile dealer. The dealer who handles quality AC Delco parts and is known all over the island for service reliability. Drive in soon to your Long Island Oldsmobile network dealer for a tune-up with AC spark plugs and Delco points and condensers. Your line dealer in Rockville Center is John J. Hayes. And in Woodbury, it's town and country. Have you ever been to the races? Why not pick out a lovely fall day and give yourself a half-day vacation at beautiful Belmont Park? You don't have to bet to have a wonderful time at the races. You can relax out on the grass under the trees, eat some fried chicken, corn on the cob, or treat yourself to a luscious banana split. All that plus the most exciting sport in the world, thoroughbred horse racing. First race at 1.30 p.m. at beautiful Belmont Park, every day except Tuesday. That word from the New York Racing Association. celebrating the bicentennial of our great country, and how wonderful it would be if, in addition to donning the clothes and shouting the slogans of our ancestors, we found the heart, the beating heart of their dedication, the soul and the spirit of their devotion. Well, we work a great deal with the spirit on this program, and we can infuse you with it seven times each week. Our cast included Warren Stevens, Anne Seymour, James McCallion, and Barry Kroger. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs> <laughs> 